So welcome to the CCNA Primer. So this is for anyone who's considering taking the CCNA or even if you've started and you've wondered what you've got yourself into. So what is the CCNA? And this is all going to be basic stuff. So uh, hello is in order of guests. My name's Paul Browning. This is me holding a few of the books I've written for uh, various IT exams. And there's a few more. <laughs> Actually, there's loads. There's a few more in the shelf uh, just down here, but we'll go into that later. I actually worked in the police in the UK for 12 years, and then I had enough of that, and I decided to uh, get a career in IT. So I moved into IT in 2000. Uh, this was actually awful timing because that date may um, look familiar to you if you've been around long enough. It's when the IT dot com bubble burst. So unfortunate for me, but uh, I managed to get a job uh, working on Cisco TAC or for Cisco TAC in 2002. And then um, again, unlucky, uh, we all got made redundant, but I started my own uh, IT consulting company then, uh, planning, installing, configuring Cisco routers and switches. Uh, around the same time, I started uh, teaching IT, I was doing uh, classroom courses and I wrote a um, study guide which uh, later turned into a best-selling Amazon book for the CCNA which is in its sixth edition. Actually this is it here. So uh, this is, where's my pen? Yeah, this is CCNA Simplified currently in its sixth edition. So um, that's on Amazon. Now Cisco Systems, uh, if you haven't heard of them, they're another IT uh, hardware and software company. They've been going quite a long time actually. They design, manufacture and sell IT networking equipment. Started in um, 1984. Uh, we think Cisco uh, comes from uh, the word San Francisco and it was just, um, they took the last part of the word. So they're a major force in the IT equipment and market. There are some competitors obviously but they're still a major player. There's a whole bunch of stuff they do so please I recommend go to their website and look at their sales uh, pages and the updates and all their equipment just so you know what they do and um, who you're getting certified with. And here's a quote from the Cisco marketing team, um, if you're interested. Basically, the CCNA is there to improve your skills in the ever-changing ever landscape of IT. Uh, you'll have a broad range. So this is a good thing about the um, CCNA. Say, say, for example, Linux, generally speaking, you'll be supporting small to medium-sized enterprises. And it focuses just on the um, Linux um, commands. For uh, Cisco, you need to know a whole bunch of different things, for example, wireless security, uh, procedures, TCP IP, subnetting, some basic design, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Uh, and one of the new things, which we'll come to later, is network automation and programmability. Uh, so the exam is retooled based upon feedback from all of IT and um, the IT customers that Cisco works with. So the CCNA, you don't need to know anything first. So I know for some certifications like the Linux LPIC2 they force you to take the one first even if you already are at that level and then for the three you need to have passed the two so basically it means you've got to have passed these other exams. You can if you want jump to the Cisco CCMP which is a, an advanced exam and um, I don't recommend you do it even if you know the stuff the CCNA would be a good preparation for you. I only mention that because it's changed. You used to have to take the CCNA first. Exams can be taken at a testing centre or you can do it online. You can be sit any number of times. You can um, check the policy. I didn't look in detail, but you used to have to wait. I think it was um, maybe two weeks between sit-ins and it may uh, depend on what score you get. But um, please check that for yourself. The quick way to get to information for the CCNA is cisco.com forward slash go forward slash CCNA and that, that'll get to all the marketing materials, exam information and syllabus. Now a lot of people say it is, right, I, I'm telling you in my humble opinion the CCNA is not 
for absolute beginners. If you're looking to get your first job in IT, I recommend you do the Network Plus first and then you zoom up to the CCNA. I don't recommend you take Cisco CCT. I think it's um, Cisco Certified Technician. No one's heard of it. I don't think it's going to get you any jobs and um, people won't even know what it means if you put it on your resume. So I recommend you take the Network Plus first, which uh, lays the foundation. We always build our IT career on um, a strong foundation and then we go up to specializations if you want to up here. So um, Network Plus first and then CCNA here is my recommendation. Again, this is just my uh, opinion. Now there used to be a load of certifications here. There used to be CCNA Wireless, Security, um, Collaboration, a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, I can't remember the rest to be honest. I think Data Center. Now you've got the CCNA which is basically routing and switching and some network automation. CyberOps is obviously the security uh, version and then DevNet is your your DevOps stuff. So you can do any of these and then move on to um, the CCMP or as I said you can just skip straight to the CCMP. So there's only at the moment associate level one, two, three options. There is some overlap between these. I won't go into the um, CCMP stuff because um, I just want to talk about CCNA. So the exam code, please note that you take the 20301 I only tell you that because I've had some friends book Cisco exams before and turn up and take the wrong exam. Now, funnily enough, my friend was so clever, he passed the exam that he hadn't studied for, but uh, most of us can't do that. Cisco will tell you on the um, page for the CCNA, you can do it in person, so go to a testing centre, or you can do it online. I've never taken an online exam, so just go through the um, procedures and the documentation you'll need. So I've mentioned you need the A+. Plus. Um, this course will give you a foundation, certainly, and then you can make yeah, your own decision as to where you want to go from there. There's plenty of jobs out there for network engineers. So you do a, this is job serve, it's just one board I looked at. I looked for CCNA. I didn't narrow it down to particular areas, but what you can do is um, full-time, contract, part-time, um, all this kind of stuff. You can put in salary levels, you can put in hourly rates, whatever you want. And uh, Network engineer is the typical kind of job that comes up. And again, this is just um, an example. So they're asking for CCNA or CCMPs. Okay, so what the CCNA did for me, uh, I mentioned before, basically I, I got the CCNA and got onto a help desk. I actually only spent six months there because I kept on studying. I was supposed to stay 12 months, but I got promoted. So then I got a job doing the Cisco network support for the TAC. I um, ran my own IT training company, and then I ended up writing books and um, doing what I'm doing now, which is running on online IT training. I've got loads and loads of case studies on HowToNetwork.com. If you go to the home page, just people that uh, got their first ever jobs or got promotions or pay rises from having passed the CCNA so it definitely does work. Alright and there's some graphics I put in for some reason. So using your qualification at the start you can look for junior network support. I have um, people mentioning doing unpaid um, intern work. Don't do that. Don't look for any unpaid work. Even um, if you get some experience on your resume you must look for paid work so you can recoup your time and effort you've put in and there's paid jobs out there. So find some big companies that uh, will hopefully coach you and mentor you through to more advanced roles. Don't undersell yourself again, as I said, don't work for free. Avoid um, like cabling jobs or something that's got nothing to do with using your skills. You can also freelance. When I passed my CCNA, I was configuring, um, this is the icon for routers, I was configuring Cisco switches as well. And um, you can definitely do that once you've passed your CCNA for small businesses. To get uh, jobs, I've got a um, how to get your first IT job uh, course and how to network. But in brief, you can network with friends, pass them your business cards, um, get them to pass it to their bosses and colleagues and anyone who works for large companies. You can network on Facebook, LinkedIn um, and so on. All right, so that's just the gentle introduction. I'll see you on the next lesson.
So welcome to the uh, lesson on the CCNA exam formats. We're going to go into what the exam actually looks like. You book it at Pearson View. They, I think they sometimes change their domain or you can get it via VUE.com. But the easiest way is just Google uh, Pearson View. You'll need to set up an account and that will follow you for the lifetime of you taking any IT exams. It tells you what you've got. You can uh, send credentials to employers with a secure link and find out when you need to recertify. Cost varies. It's around $300 to take the CCNA, um, certainly in America. Uh, check the policies with Pearson View. You should be able to cancel up to 48 hours before you take the exam if there's any problems. Now, I sent you the link before. You basically need to download the Cisco CCNA syllabus. You can do it as a PDF. Uh, I do it and then I transfer it into a spreadsheet. And these are the main headings that you're going to be tested on. And if you're interested, it's the weight that they give to these topics. But you need to know them anyway, so I wouldn't really worry too much about that. So these can change over time, so please do check before you take the exam. Print out the PDF and you can make notes on it, obviously. Now, this is really important, and I see so many people uh, fall foul of this. So you, you must bear this in mind. So this is the exam description from the Cisco website. And uh, the following topics are general guidelines for the content likely to be included. Other related topics may also appear. Um, may change at any time without notice. Alright, so you've seen the syllabus with 1 down to 6. These are stuff that um, you could definitely expect to be tested on. And then we add on other things because they've basically said we can ask you any questions on any on anything now it's obviously going to be IT related stuff now I'm not going to tell you what extra stuff they've slipped in but uh, for example frame relay isn't mentioned in the syllabus but you could be tested on that and I say it because they include WAN in one of their syllabus items also for example and I'm not saying you get in this EIGRP and uh, because they cover routing protocols so what they're going to say is under the um, umbrella of um, what we've got in the syllabus these kind of things could be asked so um, the only thing I can tell you is that um, I took the exam I passed but then I went back and I actually had to add um, some extra bits to my book CCNA simplified and um, CCNA in 60 days. I'm not going to say any more than that, but um, that's what I had to do. So just be careful when people go on forums tell you that you don't need to study other things. Um, but but um, I do my best to help you every way I can without um, breaking any rules. If you go to the exam testing centre, please do read before you go. The booking confirmation will tell you you need to take two forms of ID, one with a photo, so it's going to be your passport or driver license usually. Take your booking confirmation. Now you don't have to take this, but I actually turned up to the testing centre once and they had no idea I was coming. Something went wrong, but I'd actually printed out my confirmation with the date and the time of my... Uh, oh, the other handy thing actually that you need is your testing ID sorry test ID and um, if they forget it or there's a problem you'll have that with you so um, I was telling you anyway that I took they weren't expecting me to come but um, because I had my booking confirmation I proved I'd booked it and so they um, I had to wait an hour but they downloaded the test and I could take it please get there at least 15 minutes early uh, the other thing is this is just a personal uh, tip um, right, if you go to the toilet, it still counts as your as your countdown. So um, I'll, I'll go into more detail in a minute. You've got 120 minutes for the exam. You need all of this time. If you spend five minutes um, in the toilet because uh, you've had too much coffee or, or something else, then um, you're obviously going to increase your chances of failing. You are given a tiny whiteboard. This is pretty bad, actually. You're given an A4 size piece of whiteboard, uh, maybe a tissue and a felt pen 
nothing else. Now, people's experience differ, but you weren't. Uh, I wasn't allowed a glass of water. You're definitely not allowed uh, a calculator. No way. So you need to do all your um, stuff in your head that you need to work out. At the end of the exam, on the screen, you'll have the uh, pass or fail. It will tell you your score also, for example, 908 or whatever. Your score will be out of 1,000. So you'll be told your score. You'll be given your score. And um, you'll obviously know if you passed or failed. Now the certificate used to come, used to get a nice little card saying CCNA. Now um, if you want that kind of stuff you have to pay for it. Considering the fact you paid $300 I think it's very unfair but I don't make the rules. You'll get 102 questions approximately. You might get smack on more or less. 120 minutes to take the exam. You might get all theory. Don't presume that you will because remember what I just told you. Cisco said they can change it any time. You used to have um, say three times labs where you can figure uh, routers and switches and that kind of stuff. Now the new iteration of the exam people haven't been getting this but that doesn't mean you won't. So you must have um, you must have lab time. The other thing is the questions presume that you've configured these commands because it will ask you the output for show whatever, show interfaces or debug, um, um, serial whatever, serial interface one. So you do need to do the labs in order to answer the questions. You can't go back so there's no back button, you can't mark them, I think in Microsoft you can. If some questions pop up and look weird just bear in mind that some aren't marked or they're just testing questions from a, a bank of new questions. Also some are weighted differently so don't worry too much some are going to be given more points than the others you'll never know what they are so don't worry. These are the type of questions you get something nice and easy so you get the question and you've got this multiple choice which port does Talnet use and obviously one of these is right. You can often, what I find is you can often exclude, if you are not, if you can't remember you can say well it definitely isn't that because that's FTP, you remember that's TFTP, you remember that's DNS and say you can't remember out of these two what it is, at least you've increased your chances significantly as to um, which one of the two. There's a multiple choice, so which are examples of distance vector protocols, so it's normally going to be two or more correct answers. Now how they score this, whether you get half, well you probably won't get half a mark, but whether you get one plus one or you just get one if you get it all right, you'll never know, so don't worry about it. So this is where there's more than one answer. There's drag and drop, so you'll take uh, whatever this answer is and you will drag it up to uh, what you think is the correct box and then you'll drag the next one up to the correct box and um, so on. Fill in the blank, so show IP interface, whatever, and there'll be some um, outputs here or possibly, I don't think it's in the latest exam, you have to type what the command is. don't think that happens but um, I have seen it in the past. So it'll either show underneath and you tick or you'll have to type. Simulations, uh, I've mentioned this before, they haven't um, been testing for the new exam but this could be added at any point. So basically you'll have a um, topology, you'll click, there'll be a little picture of a PC here and the PC will have a console connection to something and you will click on it and start configuring the devices. You could have access to all of them or just one or two of them. You've got to configure whatever they tell you to configure, do a test, for example, um, ping from here, but then make sure that that ping doesn't work, or you could issue a show command, show IP route, whatever. 
So a test let, this is around five questions. You'll have a diagram with various outputs or um, something like this. And it will basically say, um, you know, you'll have these questions you've got to answer as you go through. A simlet is a part of a simulation, so it's got very limited functionality. You've got limited access to devices, and for example, you'll have this device which has got a console cable, and you'll have show commands that you have to look at and then answer the questions as to where the traffic would go. Uh, I've already mentioned this, Cisco can add anything else to the exam, you won't get any notice. Again, just prepare well. The other thing is, I see a lot of people, they pass or fail and they go into a forum and say, oh, what's the answer to this uh, question? And they'll put a question that was in the exam. So if Cisco see you doing that and you've passed, you could be uh, stripped of your CCNA. Or if you fail, they could just stop you from retaking them. So don't post actual questions. They're also copyright. All right, so that's all for now. I'll see you on the next presentation. So I wanted to cover how to prepare. I've actually got a second lesson on this that just looks at this from a different perspective. But um, it's in preparation so important, I just wanted to do it in two different ways. So the exam's part theory, part practicals. Remember what I said earlier? You could have a practical or you could have questions basically based on a practical. So as I said, you show commands, uh, debugs. If you haven't done lots and lots of hands-on labs then you're going to fail the exam because they presume you have. Depending on how smart you are, how much free time you have, uh, how much experience you have, it's going to be between two to six months of study and I'm recommending two hours per day. Now I know it sounds a lot but um, the Nielsen ratings are saying that people are watching five plus hours of TV per day. Um, you can guess people are doing two plus hours of um, surfing the web. So um, it's possible to fit it in. So a few things that you definitely need. Uh, well, you could actually study for free. You could just surf Wikipedia and articles, but it would just take forever to dig out the good stuff and the bad stuff and the old stuff. So get a study guide. Obviously, because I'm putting this together, I've put down um, two of the ones I've written which is CCNA Simplified and Cisco CCNA in 60 Days. They're two different books. That's hardcore for 60 days, where basically you'll study every day for two days. That's slower, but they've both got different content anyway. It talks about the same stuff, but in a different way. So um, there's obviously Cisco Press and some of the guides out there. Um, on Kindle, look to spend between ten and sixty dollars. I recommend you get two. Your main one, so I'll just write it up here because mine are here. Your main one, which you sort of use for ninety percent of your studies, and then if something doesn't quite seem clear or you want a different perspective, you dip into the other book as a reference. You must have an exam engine. So I know there's other ones out there. This is a um, one of the questions from um, howtonetwork.com. I, I can't see a way of you passing the exam without taking lots and lots of practice exams. Put your knowledge to the test. Uh, use it as a study tool. You must do this daily. So if you're doing um, 60 day studying and we get down to here, day 55, and your exam's here, People start doing practice exams here. Well, I guarantee no matter how much hard work you've done, you're only going to be getting 50%. So this is where everyone starts to panic. Panic stations. No, this is what you do. You go up to day one and you take practice exams. You've got two choices. If you can find exams based on the chapter, for example, CCNA Simplified has got an exam for every chapter, then do that. Otherwise, just take exams. Even if you haven't studied that yet, 
just take an exam and then just do your best to answer the NAT questions. It doesn't matter. You must be doing this every day. Um, come uh, to before you take the exam, you must be getting over ninety-five percent because um, in the exam you could be nervous and just miss a mark or two. So you need to be getting more than enough. You must have access to Cisco equipment, so a home network. eBay actually sells racks just like this. Cisco simulators, I'm not sure who does these now. Uh, I won't mention any names, but it's basically somebody has coded their own version of a router and switch, but only limited commands. So um, don't don't use them. An emulator uh, emulates the Cisco environment and it actually runs the iOS. So it runs the software that runs on Cisco routers and switches. I think I mentioned remote racks later. You must have access to a lab book. Um, I think mine was the first one ever to market. It's on version 4 now. I might be one or two on Amazon as well. I think Cisco might have some sort of lab book, but I, I haven't um, looked at it or any of the others. So have a look, but you must have a lab book so you get lots of hands-on practice. All right, uh, your study plan. So what I recommend you do is a the syllabus is in PDF, so this is a pain really. So you get a PDF, but then you basically cut and paste it into a spreadsheet. So you get your main heading here, and then each heading has a subheading, and within that you'll have um, from A, B, C, D, and etc. You'll have uh, subtopics. So you put this all in so you can see, you can map out what you want to study every day. So this will be days uh, one to three, then you'll do a review day. This is how I do it anyway. Then days five to six, and then a review day. And this is how you um, go go through your studying. Every topic needs to be labbed up. So Packet Tracer, which I'll go to coming to later, uh, has got some access points. It's got some servers. This is a theory. So you can't lab up that because it's a design concept. Uh, connections you can definitely put together on your equipment. When you finally mastered it, you'll tick off the uh, topic. I'll come into that um, in more detail actually in a bit. In more detail, so you've got the syllabus, you've transferred it to a XLS format. So I put mine into Google Sheets and then you have two columns. One for your theory knowledge and one for your hands-on. Now some of it won't be applicable, like I said, if it's the OSI model, then you can just put a not applicable. And um, what you do is you score it out of 10. So between 1 and 10. Rubbish is here, and then experts, obviously not CCIE level, but expert for CCNA. And you have to keep working on these topics until you get it to a 9 at the very least. So keep working. And it goes to six, seven, eight, nine, and so on. And eventually, you'll tick off. You'll get this to nine or ten, and then you'll stop studying that. You can review it later, and then eventually, you'll just have well, eventually, you'll have zero topics because you'll have mastered everything. All right. If you can find a study buddy, post on a forum or um, a Reddit group or something like that, and find a study buddy or somebody local to you. Must find somebody highly motivated. There's nothing worse than trying to drag someone over the finish line who isn't interested. All right, there's obviously Zooms and Skypes and that kind of thing. Get a cram guide. Uh, there's a free one with my books you can download. I recommend you write your own. So every day you just add a few notes to your cram guide, your main commands and show, show outputs and port numbers. Read it onto an MP3 on your home PC and then listen to it as you travel around or do whatever you do. Oh, sorry, the last thing is you must be able to write out the entire cram guide from memory before you take the exam. All right, and this is what we do. So theory, you'll read your book or watch your videos. You make a few notes. You do um, labs configuring the iOS. Take some practice exams, so whatever um, you want to tick. Do a review, and then it's back round and round and round and round. This goes round and round and round, again for maybe 60 days to um, 90 days. 
So how you apply this, say for example access list, you read your theory book about access lists, you make a few notes, for example um, the syntax, you, you, you write out what the syntax is for access lists and then you hop on to a router or two routers and you do some of the syntax so you can have a PC here and a PC here and what you want to do is have a ping work and then you want to write an access list that blocks a ping. So take your lessons away, what did you uh, learn, what broke, again make more notes and then take an access list exam if you have access to um, one for that topic. And then you start at the top and work down again and again for each subject. You must have a date to work to, so I recommend um, you book the exam for day 60 or 90 and remember you can move that exam date if you give them enough notice. Alright, so that's all for now, I'll see you on the next lesson. building a CCNA home lab. Really important part of the preparation for your exam. It used to be you could just read a book. Maybe back in 1999, 2000, it was all theory. They had, Cisco had no way of testing you actually on your hands-on skills. However, this is changed now and at least 50% of your exam marks are going to be related to some way of configuring either with the full labs or simlets or testlets, the kind of practical stuff I mentioned earlier. So testing your hands-on skills. Your current options are you GNS3, which you can Google that term, rent remote rack time, which is live Cisco equipment, build your own home lab, which a lot of people do, or buy a router simulator, or use packet tracer. A GNS3 is a free network emulator. It's a program that will run, I think it runs best on uh, Linux to be honest, although just check the documentation yourself. Quite resource uh, hungry also, but basically it will run a in network environment of routers, uh, but the only problem is you need to add your own Cisco iOS code. So you need to get legally hold of some sort of version of Cisco iOS that runs on the routers. Now, uh, to buy it, it cost a few thousand dollars. Uh, the other way to get it, there's obviously illegal copies around on the web, but you, I don't recommend it. A, it's illegal, and B, a lot of people hide viruses inside the zipped copies of Cisco iOS, so you've got to be really careful. You can get hold of a copy if you have a router. You can use the Cisco iOS for home use. Um, Cisco, I'm sure, won't mind you doing that, as long as you don't share it. I do have a virtual machine version of GNS3 which is on howtonetwork.com. You can uh, go there and download a free virtual machine that will run the GNS3 program for you. You can rent remote rack time which is live Cisco equipment by the hour. Uh, Cisco systems have got some sort of live rack. It's actually a, vir a virtual rack. It runs off their servers but it's actual Cisco code. If you go to howtonetwork.com, the rack, the live rack, there's two racks actually, is free to all members. Uh, ine.com, they have a lot of racks. They are a bit high level racks. They're for Cisco CCIEs. Nothing to stop you using it. You'll obviously have to pay for it, and it's a far more equipment than you would need for the CCNA, but it is another option. There's other CCIE rack rental companies out there. There was one that used to do CCNA and CCMP racks. However, they appear to have closed down. There are people that give access free to their home rack of Cisco equipment. As you can imagine, they nearly always booked out though. Uh, build a home rack. Uh, there's kits on eBay. So if you, if you really are not sure what you want to buy or you just want to buy everything together, then there's companies out there that will put together Cisco CCNA home labs for you. That includes the operating system, and the cables and the power and all the equipment. 
you need 2950 or preferably a 2960 model switch because this is what's tested in this ECNA, the 2960. To be honest, most router models will do the job. You do need at least Cisco iOS 12.2 or higher. Now you are tested on version 15 in the exam, but really that version doesn't do anything or very little that anything from 12.2 onwards does. There's a few little things missing, but I don't think there's anything that's going to make or break your exam attempt. Um, consider getting a mini rack to actually hold the equipment in. This is a frame that you can screw your routers and switches into. The router simulator, there used to be a few of these available. It's just software that runs on your PC and it's a um, pretend version of code. It kind of lets you configure some of the commands, but it doesn't really work very well. It doesn't use Cisco IOS, very limited commands. In my uh, professional opinion, it is not suitable for the CCNA. There are some companies out there, SemSim that offers a router simulator, Boson.com offer one as well for CCNA and CCMP. Really don't think it's suitable at all, to be honest. Uh, Packet Tracer is a uh, free program, but it's only available to Cisco Academy students. So you need to be going to a Cisco Academy somewhere in your locality. You get a login, a username and a password to get onto the Cisco Academy support website where you can download the software. There are uh, cloned, well not cloned copies, there are bootleg copies going around on the internet if you search for Packet Tracer. However, as I said before, um, uh, that's obviously illegal. Pretty close to real equipment. It does 95% of everything you will need your switches and routers to do. Doesn't quite act in the same way, but it does for CCNA level certainly. I don't really think it's that good for CCMP or beyond, but it will do the job. And you can create quite complex topologies just dragging and dropping icons of Cisco routers and switches. There's a whole other bunch of functions it does there. It's not the full Cisco iOS, as you'll see when you come to do some live labs. It doesn't have all the show commands and doesn't do everything you need, but it does almost everything you need. This is a kind of uh, topology you will you'd be looking for to do the CCNA. This covers all of your switching and your hot standby routing protocols, your switch security, frame relay, that absolutely everything you can get away with two switches if you wish really you do need three preferably four routers because you're going to have one in the middle as a frame relay switch so there's the models on the right and the kind of equipment you would be looking to to get your hands on this is the topology from howtonetwork.com live racks by the way cards and cables you need the one access cards this is your wide area network card you need a, I'll cover this later in the labs, you need a DTE to DCE cable which you can search for on eBay or if you buy a home rack all put together for you then uh, it will come with the necessary cables. Ethernet cables, a console cable which plugs into the port on your routers and switches so you can configure them. This is your WIC 1T card that slots into your router. Often you'll buy a router with one already installed it but it just screws in. Just make sure the power's off when you screw it in. This is your console cable, in, the Nilia was blue. Your DTE to DCE cable, so this will connect your WIC cards together on two different routers. This is the rack I mentioned earlier. Uh, eBay, check eBay for CCNA racks. There's, there's some really big ones or just some little baby ones. Have a search for Dan Track who actually make racks. Make sure you get all the brackets you need because you need a bracket to connect the router or the switch to the side of the rack and you'll also need the right size screws. Just bear in mind that different types of um, Cisco router and switches have different size holes in them. It's a little bit annoying to be honest. So you need different brackets and different screws. Also consider getting an access server. You can do a Google search for Cisco Access Servers 2509 and 2511 and there's some sample configurations you'll find. This enables you to connect to multiple devices without having to plug the console cable in and out repeatedly because it's a bit of a pain. 
Okay, so that's the end of the lecture. I'll see you on the next one. I just wanted to discuss preparation materials. I know I mentioned them briefly earlier, but I just wanted to give this a dedicated space. So these are the kind of things you're uh, looking for. You obviously, at the bare minimum, need a study guide. I prefer printed, personally. I mentioned get two before, so uh, you can maybe do um, one printed, and then if you get a deal on one, on their Kindle that would be ideal um, so that is a non-negotiable you must have a study guard I, I can't see how you're going to get through without that a lab access so this could be um, your own lab that you bought uh, GNS3 uh, packet tracers pretty good it'll get you through most of the exam lab book again Personally, I think that's a non-negotiable. You need to do lots and lots of labs. Obviously, you can make your own up, and a lot of books have got them. Um, this book has got about, um, I think it's got about 45 labs. It's got loads of mini labs and then some big labs. Now, videos, obviously, uh, this is an option. If you're the type of person that, um, there's different types of learning. There's kinesthetic, which is hands-on, auditory, which is probably less applicable and then um, visual. So if you're a visual learner that you, and you prefer someone to show you how things are done and then do it yourself, then videos might be a, a good way forward. The other thing is exams. Again, this is another non-negotiable which I mentioned earlier on. All right, study guides. So it must match the current exam number. I mentioned that at the start, what the exam number is. Check to make sure it's got lots of feedback. Must have labs and solutions. I think, I, uh, I did read it briefly, but I can't remember. I don't think the Cisco Press has got labs. It might have a few command snippets, but not full labs. But um, check for yourself. Look for downloadable extras. So the bonuses are the kind of things you're looking for are exams, crams, um, extra video showing you how to configure lots of cool things. So make sure that um, your book comes with that and there's no hidden things like you've got to pay for. Uh, look for forum support if you can. And obviously it's going to be written in an understandable way. I'm not going to mention um, names because it'll sound like sour grapes. But uh, the truth of it is some are just written in a very difficult to digest way. So you've got to, um, I think it, Amazon lets you read the first 5 or 10% of every book. So make sure you read it and, 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 and can understand what they're saying. All right, so get your lab access. Uh, Home Rack will set you back at about $200. You could get them off eBay. Bear in mind that you spend 200 and then uh, when you finish, finished, you can sell it for 200 if you finish finished studying. Remote Rack Access, there's different websites. I know, for example, INE, pretty sure they still have it. They have online rack access, but the only problem is it's CCIE racks. I don't think they've got CCNA racks. GNS is free, but you need the code. You need an iOS code. You can obviously download it from various websites. Officially, Cisco won't, won't give you a copy. Right, Packet Tracer is a free download, so do a Google search for Cisco Packet Tracer. It's now free, it used to be just for Academy members only. It only covers around 90% of what you need. I'm talking about um, iOS commands and features. So um, you might be able to scrape through, but I do recommend you use this for a lot of study and then back it up with something that actually runs Cisco code. The other 10% of the time. Lab guide I've mentioned must hit all the major syllabus topics and have solutions so you can look at um, what you've configured and see if you did it right and it must cover all of the different syllabus items. All right and as I said um, version 4 of my books on Amazon. Video training <clears throat> excuse me that's um, not essential it's a nice to have if you've got the money 
Um, the good thing is, um, I used to run classroom courses, but at the end of the classroom course, <laughs> everyone went home. They can still email me, but when, you, when you're actually watching the video, you can go back and watch it many times over. And then normally they've got forum um, under the, in fact, under here, I keep losing my pen, under the me me members menu, there's a, a forum as well. All right, so make sure you get loads of goodies with whatever video training you get. Uh, the, I know there's courses on Udemy. There's uh, HowToNetwork.com is my website. That's twenty dollars a month. INE. I don't know if they've got any deals. That's nine uh, ninety nine. Plural site forty nine. I haven't checked actually, so check for yourself. CBT Nuggets um, CBT Nuggets was ninety nine dollars a month. I'm not sure if that's more or less now. So have a look. If you're on a budget, uh, get some used books off um, Kindle, or oh, sorry, buy it on Kindle, buy a used printed book, or eBay as well. Students pass exams, just like they do at university, and then sell their books. Get some used lab books. Sometimes you can find coupons for Udemy courses. A GNS3 if you can't afford your own um, racks. If you've got a bit more money, and then buy the books, buy your lab guides, get access to remote racks, which could be free, depending on the website. Get some video training. If you're only doing the CCNA, and I don't know why, but if you're only doing the CCNA, you only need three months access anyway, roughly. If you've got a fair bit more money, then obviously you do all the other stuff, add in the video training, and... Um, whatever else you want the sky's the limit as they say what I don't recommend it is buying too much so you would like I said two books one lamb guide a home rack I don't recommend getting multiple video training courses because you've got to watch a three-hour lecture on rip on that website and then a three-hour lecture telling you exactly the same thing probably on the other site and so on and like I said some people buy five plus books it's going to take you from three months to you know six to nine months to pass so don't go overboard um, just a very quick pitch if you've got time there's a coupon underneath in the description to get you a one dollar access to howtonetwork.com we've got the CCNA if you go to court if you click on the courses link actually we've got 35 courses full CCNA CCMP that was done by a CCIE call um, CCI instructor I've got extra subnet in IPv6 training, which is in the, the syllabus, thousands and thousands of CCNA exam questions. I've got a coaching program to get you through for motivation as well. Forum, loads of labs on video with solutions. Oh, and sorry, the live Cisco racks are on 24-7. If you go to racks here, you'll um, see the racks. So that's just a quick pitch from my website. Uh, thanks for listening. I'll see you on the next lesson. After the CCNA, so there's a lot of choices, and a lot, of, a lot of people I find they do the CCNA, and they pass the exam, and they talk themselves out of actually doing anything with it, and they run off to take another certification. Now, IT obviously is a lifelong commitment to learning and qualifying in new areas and improving current areas and recertifying, but. Um, you know, just think about what you want to do with your career. You can keep on the Cisco track, move to another vendor certificate, go for a specialization, or move into the project management um, arena. There's, there's obviously other areas as well, such as virtualization or whatever. There's too many to go into. But consider, uh, do you enjoy studying Cisco? Did you find it fun, or did it was it a grind? If it's something you're not really enjoying, then obviously consider and what you what route you want to be if you want to go down technical or move into design or project management or technical project management what did you like do you feel it was all worth the effort was there a particular part you enjoyed the most wireless has gone now but there is still some security there's a reference to voice but very little some quality of service stuff but think about what it is you enjoyed um, the most out of all the parts of the syllabus and then let's look at your career Network support and design you could go into. You could even do project management. There's plenty of qualifications that are linked to um, 
te the technical side or not if you've had enough of that technical sales going into management also help desk is obviously pretty easy to get into with the ccna qualification and even it trainer i didn't consider becoming a trainer it kind of happened by accident and i um i really found i really enjoyed it so core networking career if you just want to stay into networking then obviously you've got the ccna ccmp and ccie routing and switching there's a whole bunch of other qualifications if you just want to get good at everything you know to a reasonable level you can consider virtualization projects microsoft cisco and other vendors and specializations i don't cover them all here because there's far too many but from routing once you've got a good foundation i recommend doing ccna and ccmp you can go to voice security wireless service provider data center and a whole bunch of other careers so don't don't wait i started uh, talking about this at the beginning don't wait 12 to 18 months to start applying for jobs start applying straight away and you're going to start getting some feedback you're obviously going to get a few disappointments and people not reply in but you should also be getting feedback and looking at um you're getting something positive out of the qualification don't fall for the wish list jobs so if you ever go onto the internet or see a job advertisement most of them are put up by hr people who don't understand the it function so they put in every possible vendor and qualification going and obviously that's just not um you're not going to get any candidates that can do everything to expert level so don't sell yourself short cisco say when you pass the ccna you can support a small to medium sized network so it's not me it's not you saying it cisco said you've reached that um, level of capability and you've proved it by passing the exam don't launch into another certificate straight away. Take a couple of days off or so and think about what it is you want to do with your career and where you want to go with your qualifications. And don't let them go to waste. So kind of suggested path, um, this is what I recommend. Do the CCNA, the CCMP, and then you can look to specialise. You don't have to do the CCIE next because that's uh, 18 months to two years or more of hard, hard study for five hours a day. You can look to specialise from there because you've built a really strong foundation. Moonlighting, this is what I started doing. Consider freelance work on the side. Look at elance.com or guru.com for the kind of freelance stuff available. And as long as it matches your skill set. Look for weekend or evening jobs. I did both when I started uh, running my IT consultancy while I still had a full-time job. Also find some teaching work if you can. There's plenty of academies out there for Cisco and other vendors and universities that are looking for people who've passed exams. So I hope that's given you a few ideas. Thanks for listening. Okay, welcome to our lab connecting to our router I've mentioned in the video you need your console cable and the USB converter cable which you plug the console cable into your console port and the USB cable into your laptop or PC I recommend you use putty for your terminal program which you can download from putty.org and then however you access it if you open device manager once you've plugged your console cable in and any installed any drivers and then you should be able to go to COM and LTP ports and see which port the driver has allocated which COM port. When you've done that, if you go to your putty that you've installed, run, you've got a few different options here. We're not going to be Telnet in, our login, or SSH in. So we'll click on serial and just delete the number one and replace it with the number seven in my case, which is the one I was allocated. So there's no config on this router and in fact the setting was 0x2142 so what that means is the router is going to boot and ignore the configuration. You need to press the enter key a few times to make sure you do get a prompt. Make sure the router is turned on. I'm just going to go to my settings from the menu, just right click the menu and go to appearance. 10 points a little small for me. 
so I like to bold and go to 14 you can change the background colors as well if you wish and then we can have a, a better view of our screen here so about the router greater than prompt which is user mode I've pressed question mark and you can see all the commands you have available enables the command that we normally use at this prompt I've got the more sign at the bottom and I just press the space bar which gave me access to the next uh, next set of commands or outputs on the screen so just hit show and then question mark if you use question mark it gives you all of the available commands you have ninety five percent of all the available available commands you won't actually see now I was looking for the show um, run or show start which you can't see because enable mode is quite a restricted version instead of typing enable I can type EM hit the question mark and it will fill out the rest of the command for you or tell you what's available so for E I've got four commands if I type EN and then press the tab it will fill in the command for me because there's only one available command that starts with the letters E and N. So I've typed EN for short, pressed enter and now I'm in privilege mode and you can see the greater than arrow has been replaced by the pound key. Now I've issued the show V and you can see there's several commands available. Now I type show version which is the full command but the router's pretty smart and if there's only one available command that you have the first few letters available then you can just press uh, enter for those uh, letters showing. Show version is a really handy command it shows you your iOS, your exact flash image that you have installed on the router or switch. The last reload type is just underneath that. It's telling me I've got a cryptographic image on this router K9 means it's a secure image. I press the space bar which shows me the rest of the screen. Just scrolls over to the next amount of output. How much DRAM I have installed. How many fast ethernets. My serial interfaces. Got a one VPN module. How much DRAM. Oh, sorry, the DRAM configuration. How much non-volatile RAM and then how much flash I've got installed. You can see the serial number of the chassis if you ever get asked to send that if you need a Cisco support case or whatever. Configuration register you can see is 0x2142 so every time the router boots it will boot and ignore the startup config. Show IP interface brief is a very useful command. You can shorten it. Show IP int brie is a shortened version of that command and it'll tell you how many interfaces you have on here. If it's up or down and what the IP address is. It won't show you the subnet mask and other information such as interface resets or errors you can see that it's unassigned at the moment there's nothing actually being configured on this router so this is why everything's blank just issue a few show commands now show clock will show you the current clock settings on the router show and then space question mark a lot more show commands available in privilege mode because you've gone past the very basic user mode you can pr keep pressing space bar obviously to scroll through all the commands if you've had enough just hit the letter Q and it will come out of the scroll and go back to where you were before you enter the show command I'm just going to show you a couple of different commands show process is CPU you sometimes ask to uh, send that to Cisco if 
your router's running low and they can tell what's taken up CPU processing time. Show memory, space question mark. I'll just have a look at the summary. Have a play with these commands when you're logged into your own router. Show Diag's a troubleshooting command you may be asked to enter. Just tells you how many slots you have, MAC addresses, what the state of the, the slots and modules are that you have on your router. I'll just press Q to come out of that again. I don't want to see all the different outputs. Show history shows you the last 10 commands that have been entered. Handy if somebody else has been using the device. You can actually increase the size of the buffer, the history buffer. Okay, show interfaces serial 0 slash 0 slash 0. You have a look on your router on the show IP interface brief to see what your available interfaces are. You can see mine's administratively down. Maximum trans transmission units, the bandwidth on the interface, the encapsulation type. Also see interface resets, resets which indicate uh, there could be an issue. DCD down means there's no carrier detect. You can't detect a, a signal on the interface. I don't actually have anything plugged into this one, which is why. Show controllers command is very useful for the serial. It tells you if there's a cable attached and what type of cable it is, like DTE, DCE cable. Very useful for troubleshooting at home and in the actual exam. Next I'll add the config. Now you do configure space terminal longhand or conf space t. Short, uh, for the shortened version there's really nothing, nothing to be gained by doing all the long commands to be honest. So now you can see we're in router config mode. This is where we can start doing our configuration commands. I'm going to change the host name of the router from router to R1 and you can see now it's dropped into R1 where it previously said router. I can type exit now and it will drop me back one mode. So whatever mode you're in, it will drop you to the previous mode. I can also hold, hold down the control key and press Z. That will drop me back down to privilege mode. So I can drop down a mode each time with exit or all the way back down. I've typed line space question mark and it showed me the different types of line available. Main ones are VTY and console that you'll be concerned with. VTY is for Telnet sessions, terminal sessions. Console is what I've got my cable plugged into. I'm going to use the command logging synchronous. That basically that stops any informational messages from interrupting while I'm typing. It can get really annoying. So it will wait until I finish typing uh, to show me the, the informational message, which is interface up, interface down, things like that. Exits drop me down one mode. And then exit is dropped me back down into privilege. I could have just held down control and Z. DIR flash and I use the tab key. Press the tab and it will finish off the command for you. And you can see what iOS version I have actually installed on the flash. You can have other um, files inside flash. Next was the show run. Short for show running dash config. Show startup or show start shows you the startup configuration of which I have none on this router. And that's the end of the welcome lab. Thanks for watching. Common network devices. So we're going to look at a few different devices. Obviously there are hundreds, possibly even thousands of different types of advice. 
device that are available for you to add to your network. There's some vendors offer some real specialist pieces of equipment that uh, most of us won't have heard of or have no use of. And then you've obviously got vendors such as IBM and Hewlett Packard and Riverstone and a whole bunch of others who have a, a wide range of equipment. Uh, Juniper is another um, large company. So we're not going to cover everything here, but we're going to cover some very uh, commonly used pieces of equipment. And as we go through the course, we look at other specialised devices, for example, under the security um, notes. We've got a few presentations on security. So routers, these work at layer three of the OSI. We'll cover what the OSI is in another presentation. So there, there will be some cross-referencing between what you see now and it'll make more sense as you go um, further on in the course. Switches, uh, layer two and above. So layer three is concerned with the network address. And for TCP IP, this is the IP address, which I'm sure you've heard of. Switches operate at layer two and above. Layer two addressing is your MAC address. Hubs rarely used now, to be honest, because switches are so uh, inexpensive. Hubs work at layer one, so really you can think of them as taking a signal from a network cable, boosting it if it needs to be boosted, and then passing it um, along. It's got no intelligence whatsoever. Now, there are some Visio icons if you use Microsoft Visio, which um, a lot of people do to create network diagrams, um, topology diagrams showing us what, our, what their network looks like. These are the three common ones, um, a router, a switch and a hub. Do uh, do a Google search for Cisco Visio icons or PowerPoint icons if you want to create your own diagrams. Network term terminology, a domain is a specific part of the network. Bandwidth is the amount of data that a certain link can carry in X milliseconds, which is shortened to MSEC. Unicast is a data sent to one device. A multicast packet is data sent to a group of devices. And a broadcast is data sent to all devices. A collision de uh, domain purely means that all devices are sharing the same bandwidth. A broadcast domain is devices are receiving the same broadcast message. And we can actually cut devices into different broadcast domains with a router, which we'll cover later. Classic layer one device is a network interface card which slots into our servers or our PC. This connects us to the network. And you can see most are standardized for RJ45 connections, which is the connector you see on the right hand side. Many are actually built into the motherboard. So if they do uh, become faulty for whatever reason, you can't pull them out and swap them out. You'd probably have to put another card in. They have burned in MAC addresses. You can see to the left of the port, the RJ45 port, is an old-fashioned port called a BNC connector, which, to be honest, is very rarely used nowadays. So that um, picture is probably a little bit old. A wireless network card. You can have an internal or, or an external antenna. It can be integrated or dedicated, the same as the uh, NIC we saw previously. Layer 1 hub. This is a picture of a Netgear hub. Basically, it just allows you to plug your servers, your PC, a router, or even a switch into the ports, and, it, and all devices are sharing the same bandwidth. No intelligence whatsoever. So there's no circuit built in here to enable storage of uh, which devices are connected where. There's no tables. So every time a device is plugged into one and wants to go out to a device connected to port number seven, every other device connected to every other port but receive a copy of the frame also. So this is an example of four devices plugged into a um, hub. You can see a packet has gone from PC1. Its um, recipient is PC3. However, PCs 2 and 4 have to receive the frame on the network, process it, look at it to see if they're the intended recipient, and then discard it. So you can see it's not very efficient at all. MAC addresses are physical, they're known as burned in addresses as well, BIAs. It's a 48 bit address. It uses a hex numbering system, 16 hexadecimal bits. Now, an address is actually broken down into 48 bits. 
binary bits. The first 24 bits are the OUI, the Organizational Unique ID. So this is what the manufacturer is given. It's their number. The second 24 bits are unique. They have to be unique because each MAC address uh, on the network, in fact all over the internet, should be unique. Layer 2 switches, they send frames to the relevant device only. They're known for breaking your local area network into smaller versions of the local area networks. Now each port on a switch is known as a collision domain. What that means is if there's a collision on the wire for whatever reason, that collided frame will not go any further than the port that the device is plugged into. On a hub, if there's a collision uh, with frames on the wire, every single device on the network receives um, the collision. It can handle multiple flows or conversations across the network. And it's intelligent. They have built-in circuits or at the very least software that enables them to build a map of which MAC address is connected to which port. So fill in the MAC address table. You can see on the left PC1, which has got all the A's MAC address, is trying to find, uh, send a, it's sending a packet through the switch. Its uh, recipient is PC3. When PC3 replies, the switch will build a table of which device and MAC address all the A's is connected to and all the C's. And this will carry on until the switch has built a table of every device it's connected to. Collision of broadcast domains, again using the same diagram, you can see every port on that switch is its own collision domain. However, switches do not filter broadcast uh, traffic. So if there's a broadcast on this particular part of the network, this segment, every device connected to every switch port will receive a copy of this broadcast frame. There's a trick question in the exam. Switches increase the number of collision domains, and this is a good thing. Layer 3 addressing is known to most networks now as IP addressing. There were there other standards and vendors available, however they've all become obsolete now. Now the Layer 2 addresses give no network information or the location of the node. All they do is give an address. So the network address is made up of the network part and the node part. You can see we've got networks 192.168.10. whatever in the bottom left. And this uh, designates the 192.168.10 designates the network, and then the next number designates the host on the network. I've done it with IP version 6 on the right. Routers only consider the network portion of the address and then they pass the packet onwards. Now, if the address is not in the routing table for the router, the packet is discarded. This is an advantage of having a router because if they forwarded broadcasts, it would bring the your network and the internet to a halt. We're going to go into more detail when we cover IP addressing and subnetting. But an IP4 address is a 32 binary bits or 4 octets, which is 8 bits. Each octet is separated by a dot. Now, the routers don't care about the dots. They just read ones and zeros, but us as human beings find it easier to read numbers with spaces in the middle. So this long number here in binary becomes this number and then it finally becomes this number so we can actually read it. IP version 6 addressing. The uh, IP version 4, I'm going to cover this in more detail later. IP version 4 ran out of available addresses quite some time ago actually. So IP version 6 is designed to tackle that problem among others. The address is 128 bits long. They're written in hex. They're 16 bits separated by colons. So here's an example of an IP version 6 address. Uh, layer 3 routers. They examine the IP address and make forward decisions for packets. They block multicast and broadcast by default. You can change that behaviour, although it's not recommended you do unless you've had professional advice. Uh, routing. The idea of routing is choosing the best path for traffic. This is the routing part. Sending the traffic is known as switching. So routing is just the algorithms, the mathematics that the routers used in order to work out the best path to take to the destination. And you can see the routers underneath here in the diagram are building a table of networks, how far away these networks are. In this metric, it looks like we're using hop count. A hop is a, another layer three device. 
and it's building which interfaces to go via. Uh, the router encapsulated packet with the correct um, header for the media type. For example, if you're going from the sender to receiver, the packet would be encapsulated for Ethernet, for wide area network and for local area networks. Then it would get to the router, it would change that for a wide area network header so you can go across your serial link. You can learn the best path from the administrator or from another router if you're using a routing protocol. All right, so we've just scratched the surface here. We'll be going into all these concepts in more detail as we go further into the course. cables and connectors. You need to have a good working knowledge of these if we want to be a, a, a network engineer and have meaningful conversations with our vendors and our colleagues and also know what to look for when we're in the comms room you know, looking at our network equipment. So fibre media we'll start with uses pulses of light to pass signals. So one of the advantages and certainly one of the questions you could be asked more more a network plus -y question than Cisco, I suppose, but hacking, you've got in a secure environment and you want to minimize a person tapping into a signal because they can put devices onto the cable if it's um, got metal inside it and actually pick up the signal passing on the cable, which we don't want in secure environments. So hard to hack into the signal if it's uh, fiber media. High speeds, more than 10 gigabits per second. Works over long distances as well, up to 100 kilometers. Immune to interference on the cable. So because there isn't a signal passing along a small strand of metal cable, it's got to be immune to interference from cellular devices, radio, or airwaves and microwaves. Can operate on multi-mode or single mode. Multi-mode fiber. The light beams travel across multiple paths. Used over shorter distances and certainly under two kilometers. It's less expensive than single mode and it uses LED technologies. I have seen uh, fiber questions actually in the Cisco exams. I kind of think it's a bit unfair because it's not really a cable in exam, it's a Cisco exam, but sometimes they'll pop in a list of different cable types and ask you which ones are for fiber and other types of cabling questions. Single mode fiber, the, fi the uh, light follows a direct path. If you saw on the, our last diagram, the light is bouncing in between the walls of the cable. Long distances, so up to 100 kilometers, it uses laser beams. It's more expensive though, that's the negative or the drawback. Copper media, which is still in wide use today. Coaxial or twisted pair. Coaxial cable, you will rarely see this nowadays, rarely see it. Uh, certainly on networks, you will see it on cable uh, devices for cable TV. So it's a thick copper conductor and it runs through the middle of the cable. Called uh, 10 base 5, which is thick net. 10 megabits per second, base is for baseband of 5, is short for 500 meters. I, very, I doubt very much if we'd be asked about this, but I just because it's a primer course, I wanted to cover it. 10 base 2 is. Um, Thin net, same specifications, but it only works up to 200 meters. As I said, rarely used, so I doubt if you'll see it. Twisted pair uses four pairs of twisted wires. Full color is twisted with a part of that color, but white. So blue, and then the other cables, blue and white, brown, brown and white, and so on. It can be unshielded twisted pair or shielded twisted pair. Shielding uh, gives you a more reliable cable and less prone to interference, but it costs a lot more. These are the common categories you'll see. If anything, I suppose you should really remember what speed um, of data transfer can they support up to. You may never actually get those speeds, but these are the manufacturer's specifications. And shielded twisted pair. So we've got a straight through cable. The specifications are regulated by the TIA-EIA. 
uh, specification is given the number 568A. So this type of cable will connect your PC or server to your switch and it's a quite a common cable. And you'll hear people say if you've got a straight cable, if you're in the server room. A crossover cable basically eliminates the need to have a switch. It crosses over certain ports or pins on the switch, uh, which is uh, what happens inside a switch among other things and allows you co to connect a PC to a PC or a PC directly to a router without using a switch. Common, common exam question this is. You can see pin 1 on one side goes to pin 3 on the other and pin 2 goes to pin 6. Two different cable types or specifications of 568A and 568B. I, I really doubt if they're going to ask you what colours go where. That would be a little bit too much to expect. You'll be seeing a lot of rollover cables as a Cisco engineer. A rollover cable is also known as a console cable or a flat cable. Sometimes people call it a flat cable. Nearly always blue, light blue coloured, and you can see it's got a DB9 connector and an RJ45. It connects into the router or switch in the console port, which on the right hand diagram has always got a blue circle around it, light blue, to match the colour of the cable. And this is where you will directly connect into your device, your router or switch, and do some initial configurations, especially if you first bought it new out of the box or even on eBay. Fibre connectors, there's several to choose from, so check your documentation. And these are the specifications of, I won't say yeah, you'll get in the exam, but I've seen exam type questions asking you. They give you a big list of specifications and two of them will be from this range here, ST, SC, LC. So uh, worth remembering for uh, exams. So these are the connectors that you'll f will terminate your fibre cables. And you can see there's many different forms depending on um, your vendor manufacturing specifications. All right, copper connectors you'll be seeing a lot more of. Most common is RJ45, registered jack number 45. Eight pins and eight wires inside the cable, and as you know, inside the cable they're twisted into pairs. There's an RJ11, which I'm sure you've seen if you've got a broadband modem at home. You'll also see this type of uh, connector going into your phone socket. Four pins and two wires used. There's a lot of different permutations for this, so I don't really want to go into those. BNC, again, this is for your thick net and thin net. Uh, pretty much obsolete, to be honest, but I just wanted you to see a picture of it, if uh, nothing else. The DB9 is a serial connection. It's pretty rare to find. You used to have them on PCs all the time, and some laptops don't really get them anymore. Used for, um, I say models there, it's actually printer, modem, printer and industrial devices. Then I'll say model. If you're going to connect a cable like a console cable which has got a DB9 end you now need to buy a DB9 to USB converter. When you've got the converter cable a lot of the time you will need to use the drivers with it. These can be a bit flaky. Sometimes the drivers are actually loaded with the cable. So there's your console cable and there's the uh, the DB9 to USB converter and um, you can buy them on, on eBay. Okay, so that's just some cables in brief. Thanks for watching. The OSI model. What is the OSI model? I used to detest learning about the OSI model when I first learned, I was learning about networking. It seemed to be everywhere, it was covered in all the books, but I never understood the point of it because you couldn't apply it to anything. But as I went through my networking career as a help desk and then a network engineer, and then eventually teaching, what I found was it really helps to put the entire internet work infrastructure into some sort of order in our heads so we can have a conversation with another engineer in person or on the phone or even via email or whatever and we can actually start speaking in a um, clearer way and get to our point a lot quicker and also when we come to troubleshooting as you'll see as we go through the other labs and lectures 
it just helps us really do things a lot quicker because we can segment the problem down and we can discount different parts of um, the network. So it's a conceptual model. You can't actually see it. You can't point to it. You can't see um, what's happening in, in, in certain layers. You can actually look at something, for example, a network sniffer, and you can look at the outputs and identify which layers, but you can't physically see the RSI. And it describes how information moves in our network from A to B. A could be across our local area network or from one end of the world to the other. It was actually developed by the ISO in 1984. So it's broken into seven distinct layers and each layer has its own function or job to perform. The other thing is each layer can only communicate with the layers it is directly next to. So layer one can only communicate with layer two, layer seven can only communicate with layer six, layer six with layer seven and five and so on. Contrary to some books, the OSI starts at layer seven at the top and then works its way down to layer one. If you number it any other way, um, A it's wrong and B it's going to cause confusion. All engineers use the OSI from network designers to engineers and uh, vendor manufacturers as well. It applies to network software and hardware including cables. So concepts, each layer as I said speaks to its um, neighbour only. Data in each layer is actually referred to a different term don't get too hung up on this because we generally all we nearly always talk about data as packets and even though we're talking about a layer 2 switch which deals with frames technically generally in a conversation we will all just talk about packets so don't some people get a little bit um, anally retentive about that and there is there's no need really the higher level the higher the level is the closer it comes to the end user Lower levels gets closer to actually pulses of data on the wire in the form of electrical signals. So encapsulation, as data is passed down, each layer adds a header. As the data is passed up, when it gets to the destination, each relevant layer removes its um, specific header and or trailer. This is referred to as encapsulation and decapsulation. So why do we use it? So you and I and all other engineers can use a common framework. So you can buy Hewlett Packard switches and they will work with Cisco switches if they're both designed to work at the same OSI layer. You can focus on one layer specifically and ignore the others. Say for example you're designing a hub or a switch or a firewall of some sort, you will be um, concentrated on the specific layer that that device works at. Very useful for troubleshooting also. And you'll be doing a lot of that as a network engineer, I'm sure. So they start at the top and work our way down. Layer 7, application layer, is closest to us, the end user. For example, sending emails and surfing the internet uses application layer services. The protocols used depend on the information being sent. For example, POP3 is used for email, SNMT, simple mail transfer protocol, FTP is for transferring files. And Talnet is to use to remotely connect to a device. Now we'll be covering all of these protocols and ports later on. Presentation layer or presentation layer if you're British. It makes uh, data understandable to layer 7. Here we're dealing with the formatting, compression and character formats. For generally speaking it's ASCII which is how our characters are um, formatted. So sending emails and surfing the web, we can take care of um, the presentation and you can also uh, associate it with videos. Audio and video compression here is MPEG, AVI formats. I think that's supposed to say JPEG, sorry. Interfaces are directly with the application layer and session layer. So I said that earlier, it only, each layer only speaks to the layers it's uh, borders with. Layer five session layer, this establishes sessions or dialogues between devices. It terminates sessions and manages them. So this is a communication between devices. It tracks conversations using port numbers. It ensures end devices are available. Moving on to the transport layer. This breaks data into segments. Remember I said data is called something different at each layer. 
So data is data, 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 and then we, we chop it into segments for the transport layer. Ensures data arrives in the correct sequence. For data integrity, layer 4 uses both TCP and UDP. For flow control, error check-in, not detection or correction, that's taken care elsewhere. Data retransmission and sequencing and reliability. Layer 3 is a network layer. This identifies the network path for our routing. It sends data, which is known as packet switching. Logical addressing, which is nearly always IP addressing. Data is referred to as packets here, as packets here. And the routing protocols actually send the packets. The routing protocols, which we'll come to later, these find routes and build tables, like a directory of which networks are where. Routers operate at layer 3. Data link layer 2 defines the format of data, encapsulates it based upon the media type, for example, Ethernet or PPP or frame relay. It offers reliable transmission of data. Physical addressing happens here, which is nearly always our MAC addresses. Subdivided into LLC and MAC sublayers, so it's actually broken down into two smaller layers, and you can see these represented here on this diagram. You may get asked which one is the top and which one is the lower layer. Layer 1. So this is the physical medium used for transport of the data. It specifies data rates and cable pin types. Here's some specifications that you may have seen. I've certainly covered them in earlier presentations and I'll be covering Ethernet in more detail later. It covers the voltage required for the signal to go on the line, bits on the wire. Uh, that's all for the OSI. I will be referring to it in more, more detail as we go into later presentations. TCP model. The OSI versus the TCP model. The OSI is a reference model and was created by the ISO, as I said earlier. The TCP model was created by the IETF or the Inter Internet Engineering Task Force. Now, depending on which book you read, some will say the um, Cisco is left behind or leaving behind the OSI model from the TCP model but you'll read otherwise in other books and other references online. So hard to say really, I see both referred to uh, quite a lot, so you kind of need to know both really. Uh, the TCP model is actually used for proper network communications though, so if anything you could say it's more practical or used more practically. So you can see how the TCP uh, model maps to the OSI model. And again, depending on which book you read, the TCP model will have four layers or five layers, which adds even more confusion. So some models will say it's four layers and put the data link physical down into one layer called network access. So Cisco tend to um, treat it as a five layer model. So that's what we'll do. Application, transport, internet, data link and physical. Application layer maps to the application, session and presentation OSI layers. Various protocols used at this layer. So we've got email services, HTTP for web browsing, FTP used to transfer files, which we'll cover this later, SNMP used to manage networks, DHCP used to assign IP addresses information to devices, and Telnet I've mentioned earlier as well. Transport layer is TCP is a connection oriented reliable data transfer. It's used when reliability is required, such as FTP, which is used to transfer fairly large files across a network. UDP is a reliable connectionless data transfer. It's certainly got less overhead than TCP and it's used for less important things, protocols such as trivial file transfer protocol, which is normally used for quite small files, for example, a router config. Port numbers identifies the traffic type, this is over 65,000 in total. Numbers 0 to 1023 are known as well-known ports, which are used for common applications. Here's a few examples. 
which we'll be going through again as we go through the course. The three-way handshake, and you may well have heard before, it's how uh, a session is actually set up before data is transferred. A SYN packet is sent from uh, the host to the destination. The destination then sends a SYN and ACK packet back. And then finally there's an ACK packet sent back before um, the TCP window size negotiation takes place. This is all happening before the data is actually transferred. You can actually, if you know to do any sniffing with a packet capture software such as Wireshark, see all of this happening. And I've highlighted it there in the uh, red box in the graphic at the bottom. TCP IP internet layer, it maps to layer 3 network layer for the OSI model. It includes IP, which is a connectionless protocol used for IP version 4 and 6. It includes ICMP, which is a message reporting service. And you may have heard of ping. Ping sits inside ICMP. The network access layer comprised of the data link and physical layers. ARP is used here. It requests the MAC address of a host when it knows the IP address. Here's a, just a case study of a FTP session, the FTP client contacting the FTP server. We won't, don't need to worry about the application layer for this example. So we've got a client, you see the IP address and the MAC address going to the FTP server, and you can see the MAC address and the IP. The Wireshark packet capture is at the bottom. Line one is for the physical, the frame. Line two is the data link information. Line three is internet, IP version four. Then we have the transport layer and then the application layer. The physical layer, you can see the packet signaling and bits on the wire. Five, six, seven bits in total if you look. Packet analysis, the data link. You can see the destination MAC address, the source MAC address. Ethernet frame. The internet layer. This is the IP information and layer 3. The IP information and layer 3 overhead. You'll also see a time to live field inside there, which we'll talk about later. Source and destination IP. And then the transport layer. It's a TCP in this instance. We can see a random high port number, which is a source port, but the destination port number, so it gets received on the critical port, is FTP, which is port 21. Sequence numbers, window size, flags and checksums. And then finally we get to the application layer, which is going to be a file. In this case, it looks like comptia.txt. OK, so that's just an overview of TCP. I will see you in the next lecture. Okay, welcome to the presentation on TCP ports and protocols. Really important this because a lot of network engineers and IT people kind of miss it off. They understand that there are ports and protocols out there and kind of maybe have an understanding of some of them, such as DHCP and ARP and stuff, but um, well worth digging into and certainly reading some books on TCP IP, which you can search for on Amazon. We're going to look for a look at TCP IP port numbers, common protocols, a bit on DNS. Um, we're going to look at some other things as well, actually, which I didn't put on that list. So port number, these are assigned to protocols and services. And I mentioned in a previous lecture that there's over 65,000. And it allows users and devices to identify a specific application. So what you normally get is some sort of IP address communication and then a port number attached so the services can identify um, w which has been accessed. So well-known port numbers, um, non-ephemeral, they don't change below anything below 1024. 
and temporary port numbers above uh, number 1024 these are ephemeral they can change so port numbers are not protocol numbers so protocols uh, include TCP UDP ICMP IGMP you can call them services as well I suppose but they're not actually um, protocol uh, they're not actually port numbers so it doesn't specify what service has been used just how the data is transferred application layer protocols these include HTTP and the secure version email services file transfer trivial file transfer protocol SIP RTP uh, a quick look at HTTP which is one of our favorites I'm sure used for connecting to web browsers so websites listen on port 80 for requests a traffic flow takes place this is for all services or ports a traffic flow is the source IP address and port and destination port and IP so you'll often hear of uh, flows being monitored on devices and um, this is what a flow is source port and address and destination port and IP so application layer HTTP 80 the source port is actually a, a random high port number uh, but the web service is listening on port 80 uses transport layer so it's TCP internet layer IP the layer 2 frame type usually Ethernet eventually by the time it reaches the web server and layer 1 the bits are sent by the actual client here's a packet capture from Wireshark by the looks of it and you can see the destination port is HTTP which is port 80 the source port is a random high port number and you can see the host is cisco.com HTTPS secure version which you normally see when you're uh, joining a website or trying to get a transaction monetary transaction of some sort encrypts the connection between the client and server uses transport layer security and secure sockets layer and most browsers insert the actual HTTP part for you on the request and for HTTPS they'll obviously add the S onto that and here's a packet capture you can see the source port a random high port and destination port double four three Email protocols, common protocols for sending and receiving emails. SMTP, port 25. Post office protocol is port 110. Internet message access protocol or IMAP uh, uses TCP port 143. And you see the difference between um, IMAP and SMTP and POP3. So SMTP pushes or sends emails between servers and offers security. FTP uses TCP ports 21 and 20. You can see in the diagram that it's FTP control and FTP data. We use FTP generally for large files and certainly to transport across the internet or larger networks. We usually have some sort of FTP client software such as FileZilla. A session request goes out on port 21 and then data transferred on port 20. And we can see a packet capture here of our FTP. There's a file at the very bottom called comptia.txt. TFTP uses UDP port 69. I've referred to it before, but it's uh, for sending less important files, usually. Uh, as Cisco engineers it will be backing up the startup config of routers or downloading configuration files no authentication so not suitable for production networks where you've got sensitive data management protocols these include DNS, DHCP, Telnet, SSSH, Network Time Protocol, RDP, SNMP Simple Network Management Protocol, ICMP and IGMP. We'll cover some of these. I'm not sure if we're covering all of them actually, but DNS um, is a lookup. So we're matching an IP address of a server to a name. This happens obviously quite quickly, but 
when we're typing in our domain names there obviously has to be a map or a an entry so it actually knows which server we're connecting to we obviously find names easier to remember than IP addresses Clients are configured with the uh, IP address of the DNS server. It uses UDP port 53. Eventually, if there's no response, then it will revert to TCP. But initially, the first few requests at least are done using UDP. Uh, for zone transfers between DNS servers, which I think we talk about later, it uses TCP. And here's a packet capture. And we can see we've got a query, source port uh, 53, and then a reply coming back, matching a um, domain name to an IP address. DNS servers. So it's a collection of servers hierarchically organized. A distributed database composed of multiple DNS servers. We obviously don't just have one. We've got the root server, which I'm sorry I misspelled. Then we have TLD servers, then down below that are authority, authoritative servers, and then resolving servers. So a client request onto cisco.com is sent to a resolving server first. If there's no entry on the resolving server, then that request is then sent to the root server. And the root sends to the .com TLD server. So I think I've got uh, an image coming up here. The resolving server eventually caches the answer. So here we have the um, hierarchical organization here. The root server at the top, obviously, and then we have TLD. Different servers for the .coms, .orgs, .edus, and all of the um, appendages that we could have, for example, .nets and so on. And then we go down to the authoritative servers under each of the um, names. Uh, DNS records, you'll see, I'm sure you've heard about these before and certainly if you've got your own server that you're hosting somewhere, you'll have to be familiar with this. AAA servers, a standard IP version 4 address. 4As is for IP version 6 addresses and uh, you can actually store IP version 4 in them as well. C names, can canonical name, additional names associated to the hosts. The MX record is for mail exchange. The NS record is the name server to designate the internal DNS servers. PTRs, points of records, are the reverse of DNS entries. So we can see a next a DHCP. Uh, I think I'd, I'd talk about this in more detail in another presentation actually. But DHCP process using UDP port 67 and 68. Used by host to obtain the IP address, uh, DNS server gateway and a whole bunch of other IP information. It actually replaced an older Boots P protocol, which you may have heard of if you've been in IT any time. So you can see what the server listens on and the client, uh, the port the client uses. Client requests information. Server sends an offer. The client accepts that offer and then the server acknowledges. So this is the process in more detail. Um, L2 destination address is a broadcast address. This is all of the ones filled in on each of the fields. The layer 3 destination is UDP port 67. Source is UDP 68. You see this, the DHCP server sends a offer once it's received that uh, packet. The client accepts the offer with the DHCP request packet. And th there has to be a confirmation that that uh, IP address information has been accepted. You may have seen uh, a API PA used by Windows before. This is if no uh, response has been received. Remote access protocols, and I've got a packet capture for Telnet here, allows us to remotely connect to devices over the uh, network. Gives us command line access. All traffic is sent in clear text for Telnet, so not really recommended for production networks. Secure shell encrypts the data before sending. We also have NTP, Network Time Protocol, UDP port 123. 
cover I think I'll cover this uh, in more detail in another presentation also but basically it's used to synchronize time across the network devices periodically poll the NTP server there's free ones on the internet if you need to um, use them RDP remote desktop protocol allows users to remotely connect and manage a computer used a lot in help desk environments or for people that are troubleshooting remotely they can request RDP access SNMP simple network management protocol uses UDP uh, cover this in more detail later as well it's used to share management information between devices and servers the SNMP server is usually a dedicated workstation or server that sits um, somewhere on, on with the network team on somebody's desk. The latest version is SNMP version 3 which offers the latest security and encryption. Again I'll cover this later. ICMP is given protocol number 1. ICMP is used for uh, messaging services. Main function is to send echo requests which we'll recognize as ping packets. And we can see a capture here. ICMP protocol 1 and it's an echo ping request. So it's polling devices to check on connectivity. IGMP is protocol number two, internet to group management protocol, used for multicast mainly. So I'd say vast majority of engineers, network engineers don't actually uh, have any interaction with it, unless it's used on your network for whatever reason. Allows these uh, users to subscribe and connect from the stream. Has to be enabled. Uh, going into network protocols now and again we're going to be covering a lot of these in more detail uh, later we've got TCP, UDP and ARP TCP is protocol number six and we know it provides a connection oriented tran uh, transmission where we get ACKs and SYN and SYNAC um, bits it ensures the path is reliable every packet has to be acknowledged uh, FTP uses the TCP for, uh, there's lots of other services as well. UDP is less reliable but more streamlined. Uh, an example is TFTP. ARP, Address Resolution Protocol, allows hosts to learn the layer 2 address. They already know the layer 3 address, so don't get caught out in the exam. We already know the IP address, but um, in order for the packet to be sent across the network, we need to have a layer 2 mapping for this. The host broadcast ARP requests onto the cable and the switch forwards it out of all ports. A destination host sends ARP reply with its layer 2 address so the, that part of the field uh, the packet can be um, populated. Alright, you can check your ARP cache on your PC if you've got Windows with ARP minus A. Proxy ARP is important to know about. It allows routers to be available to hosts on the network. So the host sends an ARP request for another host, and the router replies, um, and it fills it, it fills the field with its own MAC address instead. Hosts will have the same gateway MAC for multiple IP addresses. As the packet travels across the network, only the MAC address changes, not the IP address. So here's an example here, host A is wants to send a uh, packet across the network and you can see it's, uh, it wants to get to host C. Um, I, I should have named it host D, so apologies for that. 4.4.4.4. The router replies saying put the field in as destination my MAC address and we'll for the moment map that to 4.4.4.4 okay so that, that packet can now be sent and it's accepted by the router and the router eventually will process it and send it out of its uh, interface and it will change the destination MAC address to all the D's source MAC address for it, um, its own Ethernet interface so this basically allows the frame to be sent across the network without having to change the source and des destination IP address. Okay, so that's the end of the presentation. We'll be covering a lot of these in more detail later. Thanks for listening.
So we'll look at LAN technologies, local area networks, some different LAN types and properties, and again these will be covered in different lectures, covering different aspects also. CSMA CD, CSMA CA, broadcasting collision day, uh, domain is pretty important to know. Uh, bonding interfaces, we might actually look at that another time. Uh, speed and distance. Uh, Ethernet standards. So these are actually set by the IEEE and the name uh, normally reflects a technology. So 10 base T, 10 is the um, speed, 10 megabits per second. Base is baseband signaling, so it, um, it uses a single frequency. And T is the media type, such as twisted pair or FX for fibre. Not always easy, not always that easy to understand um, what each one means. Uh, so a 10 base T is a ca category 3 cable, works up to a distance of 100 uh, metres. And probably not really um, easy to buy anymore because uh, the Cat5 cable is so inexpensive. 100 base T is fast Ethernet, Cat5 cable and up to 100 metres. 100 base FX works on two strands of fibre cable. A thousand base T can work over Cat5, 5V or Cat6 cables. It uses all four pairs of the UTP cable. I'll be coming, uh, covering, I have covered uh, UTP I think in an earlier lecture. 100 base X fiber for 1 gig. Uh, 10 base, uh, 10 G base standards. 10 G base SRs are short range 80 to 300 meters. 10G base LR has long range single mode fiber up to 25 kilometers. 10G base ER is extended range up to 40 kilometers. You've got 10G over WAN, 10G base SW, different standards here, I'm just for your information. Integrates the local area network with the wide area network using the same fiber and connectors. 10 G base T allows 10 gig over copper cables. Cat6 works up to 55 meters. Cat6A up to 100. CSMA CD is something uh, sort of seems to hang around in exams. I know it could well be covered. It's one of the subjects that you need to know for the CCNA exam. No longer really used on networks as such. Carrier sense means the device is listening. Um, on the wire for a signal. Multiple access is more than one device can communicate. Collision detection means two signals could collide on the wire and it detects when this happens. So CSMA CD is required with hubs which work at half duplex. It can either send or receive but not at the same time. Not switches which work at full duplex. Uh, just be familiar with this um, system here, the flow chart, what happens at the start, assembles a frame, there's another frame transmitting, also what happens if there's a collision. A collision recovery, recovery algorithm runs and it goes back to attempting to send a frame again. CSMACA is actually used on wireless networks where the end device can't detect a signal. It's carrier sense multiple access with collision avoidance. And here's the uh, flow for the CSMACA. Duplex settings you need to uh, know about. Half duplex is when an interface can only send or receive, but just not at the same time. Full duplex, it can send and receive at the same time because it's using different wires. Both sides must agree. So if you've got one side set for half duplex and the other one for full duplex, then you're going to have problems sending traffic. Cisco devices, duplex and speed settings are all often left at auto and you can see interface fast ethernet 0 slash 1 and you can see the settings if I type duplex space question mark I can choose from auto, full or half. Speed I can choose from 10, 100 or auto. Obviously if you've got different interfaces you could have higher speeds. Collisions versus broadcast domains. How far will the frame travel? Well, each port on the switch, I've told you earlier, is considered a collision domain. 
Ports on a hub do not create collision domains. Routers do not forward broadcast traffic. Switches do forward broadcast traffic. Now switches increase the number of collision domains. I've told you this before, but it's just a little question that people can get caught out on. More collision domains are better. So here's a collision domain, um, a broadcast domain is all devices because the switch will forward broadcast, but each port on the switch is a collision domain. Each port on the router is a broadcast domain because by default routers will not forward broadcasts. And finally here's putting some routers together, switches, hubs, and you can see on the top is a bridge. And a bridge is basically, you can consider it to be the same thing as a switch, although it tends to work in software rather than hardware. So um, count how many you can see, work it out for yourself to confirm my working out of how many broadcast and collision domains we have. Uh, LAN switches. LAN switches move frames between network devices. They learn the MAC address of connected devices and they forward or filter frames based upon the MAC address. Broadcast frames are forwarded out of all interfaces. As are frames with an unknown destination, i.e. not in the MAC table. Uh, switches use spanning tree to prevent loops, uh, which I'll look at later in, an, in a switching presentation. So frame forwarding, you can see we have uh, different devices here. Host is sending out uh, a frame. Destination is C, source is A, and it's forwarded out of uh, fast ethernet 0 slash 3. And it's filtered so it doesn't go out of fast ethernet 0 slash 2. Now you can see uh, we've got an interface and just for your information you can see the switch has got more than one MAC address associated with an interface. So this will tell you when you're logging into a device whether or not that interface is going to be a trunk or possibly it's connected to um, a hub which is probably less likely to be honest. Frame switching options are cut through. A switch must read the um, MAC address only and then it forwards the frame. So if there's errors in the frame, the switch won't know about it. Store and forward, the entire frame is checked for errors. A fragment free, the first, only the first 64 bytes of the frame is checked for errors. Cisco switches um, check on the model and documentation, but they generally now default to store and forward. Okay, that's the end of the presentation. Thanks for listening. Network topologies. So design considerations. This is from a CCDA guide, Cisco Certified Design Associate, actually, which talks more about the design, network design, and the Cisco design model. There's a, a bunch of considerations to uh, bear in mind when we're looking at designing a network. And really, it's between optimum, what exactly you want it to do, and cost because almost every project has a ceiling of cost. So that's to be some sort of compromise. Design sub-projects, your technology choices, the, the physical design the network is going to uh, have, addressing the scheme, including any network address translation we're going to be using. We'll be talking about that later. Routing selection and design, any quality of service, which will, uh, which is referred to as QOS, which is voice and video and how that's going to affect our design. Security design, are you going to have re um, people remotely connecting from home or mobile workers or they're all going to be uh, internal to the organization. Any multicast, which is your streaming video, uh, provisioning for IP version 6, which is happening right now. Networks are uh, using both IP version 4 and IP version 6. Point to point is a common WAN topology which you'll come across especially when you're doing hands-on labs. Just a direct link between two devices. Obviously primarily used in wide area networking. Point to multipoint, you've got several devices connecting into one interface on a router. 
used in wireless networks, obviously, although um, the, the end devices can't directly communicate. They have to go through the wireless access point. Our ring topology was quite popular a couple of decades ago with a technology known as token ring, which is now obsolete. In ring topologies, all nodes connect to the ring. If there's a link between uh, the nodes and it breaks, then there's still a path because it can go in the opposite direction. So rarely used in LANs now, if used for a WAN, you generally need to have dual rings in case one of the rings goes down. Employed in metropolitan access networks. Star topology, used in most modern networks, all nodes connect to a central device. The central device passes data between the nodes. Generally used in Ethernet networks, so you could you probably have a switch actually in the middle of all of these devices. Bus is rarely used nowadays in modern networks. It, you've uh, seen the thick net and the thin, thin net cables in earlier presentations. This is what uh, the topology they used. Obviously, a break on the cable brings the entire network down. One specific technology is characterized by redundancies. What happens if one of the interfaces or connection goes down? For hub and spoke, you've got the hub in the middle, which is normally the headquarters office, and then the spoke is the smaller offices or the branch offices. And you work, can work out how many connections you need with the number n times n minus 1 divided by 2. Full mesh is when all devices are connect, connected to every other device, which will obviously cost you a lot of money, potentially. Partial mesh is when um, there's a connection between many of the devices, but they're not all directly connected to each other. Client server is a local area network topology. You can have a client server or peer-to-peer. -peer. Obviously, client server, all the different devices, the clients connect to a server. Whereas peer-to-peer, -peer, there's no single device in charge. Network appliances. We're just going to look at a few to be honest. There's many others, but I'll sort of touch upon them in different parts of the presentations in different areas. So um, I just wanted to look at a few here load balancers, proxy servers, content filters, VPN concentrators. So a load balancer, usually present in large environments with multiple servers. I uh, supported them when I was at BT for a while they distribute the load from uh, from users to multiple servers this is going to be transparent to the user so they probably would think they're just connecting to one web server for example when they could well be connecting to multiple web servers also provides to fault tolerance so obviously depending on how many servers you're balancing across if one goes down then you wouldn't notice there may be a, um, a longer lag so you may notice a slight, slightly longer delay, but um, the service would still be available. Load balancing algorithms, uh, round robin, so each server takes a turn. Weighted, so different servers take on different loads. Least connection, so if a particular server is quieter for whatever reason, it will um, be served more requests. Weighted least connection, same as least but with weights assigned. Uh, load balancers are deployed in router mode, bridge mode, or one or two armed mode. So proxy server is put in between the user and the server. Uh, intercepts a request from the client going forward. It offers caching, so it speeds up web serving, URL filtering, content scanning. A lot of the time it's used to see which uh, sites uh, employees are visiting. It can also obviously be used in evidence against you so be careful a content filter uh, filters traffic based upon um, let's go back again from information inside the packet ensures corporate privacy and confidentiality can also prevent viewing inappropriate content 
you can have antivirus and anti-malware on it. Also very useful for scanning incoming emails for viruses. There's firewalls, um, well, we'll cover these later but they don't. Uh, the generic firewall doesn't scan for viruses. Can filter by URL, can fil filter by category also. Uh, lastly, VPN concentrators. We talk about these later on in um, the security section, I think. They they maintain virtual private connections. A virtual private network, sorry. Initiate and end VPN tunnels. If you don't if you don't know what this uh, means at the moment, we do cover it later in the security section. Does all the necessary encryption and decryption can be hardware or software? Establishing a VPN tunnel. So this is a secure way of remote users to connect into the corporate network usually and access resources. Dedicated hardware or software. And once the connection is established, the user can access all the resources. Uh, used for home workers or um, mobile workers, for example, sales teams and stuff. All data is encrypted. Okay, that's the end of the presentation. Thanks for listening. Inside a Cisco router, or if you live in the UK, a router. So you need a good working knowledge of the router components, both exterior and then interior. Now, it's unlikely in any exam they would actually show you a picture of the circuit board and you'd have to point to which bits are where. However, if you have a router at home or at work and the memory needs upgrading, then at some point you may need to open up the cover and expose some of the modules on the on the inside. So just it's good to have an appreciation of what you actually do have working on the inside. Obviously sometimes things break as well such as fans or memory and you may or may not have a support contract with Cisco. Should check the documentation. Every device that Cisco uh, sells or used to sell has uh, documentation. It's, the easiest way to find it is if you just type in into Google Cisco and then the model number and then you could um, finish off the search zone with documentation. So remove uh, screws if you're actually going to open up the housing and um, there's little slots that you can put a screwdriver in and you can just gently prise it away and the um, cover comes away from the actual chassis. Wick slots for your wide area networking cards. This all varies and it can be a bit confusing sometimes but it depends if your um, router has a fixed configuration i.e. you can't add any modules to it or it's modular which means you've got open slots on it and you can buy different modules and put them into different parts. So here's a router, I think it's an 1841 I have and you can see I have a slot here it's got a cover on it, a dust cover, which very easily unscrews and then you can slot in the different card types. You just need to check again the documentation because some will accept voice cards, others will only accept wide area networking cards or fast ethernet cards. So check the documentation. Here's the same router with a filled slot. This is slot zero. So you know that the uh, serial interface when you're configuring it will probably be called something like um, interface serial zero slash zero and the one on the left could be either zero slash one or one slash zero. All right, external interfaces, these are actually uh, connected onto the motherboard and you can see the fast ethernet, we've got fast, fast ethernet zero slash zero and zero slash one. A console port, which we'll look into another time also. This is for our direct connection to do some initial configuration and troubleshooting. Auxiliary port for modem connections and a USB where we can put a USB stick to store a copy of the iOS. We can even boot up from the USB port if we wish and we can back up any files we wish to. Power obviously depends what country you're in. This is from an Australian router. 
can see a sticker, a white sticker to the right with the serial number for the uh, device on here. Flash memory, again it depends, it can be internal, external or a bit of both. This has got a 64 uh, meg PCMCIA card that you can slot in. If you want to release it you press the black button on the left of it and it will uh, release it. And I've issued a show version on the router and it's told me I've got uh, almost 63 megabyte of flash. Uh, DIR flash colon and press enter and it will give you a directory of which files you have on your flash memory and how much memory it's taking. You can have you can back up um, your running config for example onto your flash memory if you wish and you can have one more than one version of iOS on your flash as long as there's room for it. Internally we've got some dynamic RAM, DRAM which is a card I think I upgraded whatever this router came with, I think it came with 128 and I upgraded it to 256. Stores running configuration. The iOS, depending on the model, is expanded so it's uh, com compressed and it's expanded from flash memory into your DRAM. I wish you to show version again and you can say we've got the uh, DRAM here, there's obviously some on the circuit board because it looks like um, 358 plus uh, 34 meg in total. The router splits it, it uses some for uh, buffering packets and other memory functions. You can change the values, however I wouldn't do so without um, getting advice off Cisco. Motherboard's got various chips um, soldered onto it and the capacitors and stuff. You've got boot ROM the CPU for doing the computations, non-volatile RAM, there's a battery uh, on my motherboard here so yeah, it doesn't lose the configurations. And here's the different components you'd be expected to know about, where it's stored, you've got bootstrap memory, and mini iOS, RAM, ROM, flash, so just uh, take a note of it and um, you should be expected to know what all of these do, certainly for the exam. Again, this is just an output for my show uh, version. You can see how much NVRAM I have and the flash memory again. This is the uh, ROM system bootstrapped and what the version of code is on it. Um, I've never actually upgraded the ROM system bootstrap, but I presume it's something you can do if you need to. Show version gives you some other useful information, how long the router has been up, when it returned, um, why it was last booted, for example here it was a power on, last reload was a, just a normal reload, and the system image file. Serial number, if you need to know it, especially if you're quoting a, a support contract to Cisco, it's actually on the device. If you can't if you can't physically get access to the device, if it's in a, another location, you can issue the show version, and it will show you the chassis number. Or you can issue a show diag command. That will give you a lot more information about all the modules that are connected as well. And sometimes you'll be asked to provide that. Router booting process. Just get familiar with it. The router powers on. It runs the um, something called a bootstrap program, which is ROM on ROM monitor. This runs a uh, power on self test to check for interfaces and memory. The bootstrap program checks the configuration register value. This is something that you can configure as the administrator. That tells the router to boot up and look for a configuration file. So every time it reloads, it uh, pulls up the configuration. Or it can be told to skip the configuration file. Say, for example, if you've forgotten your password. Finds the iOS and loads it into RAM memory. The iOS attempts to load the configuration file. I've issued the boot system question mark and you can see that you can tell the router to boot up from flash memory, from FTP or TFTP. As the router boots you will see some messages similar to this. This is the system bootstrap. Next, as long as that works it will locate the iOS and extract it into DRAM. Loads the iOS onto the router as the next step and then it looks like there's no configuration file here so it's asking do you want to enter initial configuration mode. 
you'd always type no at this point and then configure it yourself. That's the end of the lecture. Thanks for listening. So welcome to our ARP, Talnet and Ping Lab. What I've done, I've set up two routers in GNS3. I've just connected the fast ethernet 0 slash 0 to the fast ethernet 0 slash 0. Router 1 and router 2. I'm going to add an IP address to this side on router 1. We'll go more into the how we get the IP address and subnet mask in a lab, a future lab. But this will be 1.1 and this is 1.2 this side. So I just need to start the routers. You can see the green light turns on and I'll open up a console window. Okay, so we've got router one and router two. So this is router one. And we can see that by the command prompt here. So I'll do the um, show IP in interface brief, int brief for short. And you can see we've got fast ethernet 0 slash 0 and 0 slash 1. Haven't added any other devices. I'm going to maximize this screen actually. All right. So this router one has got no IP address on. Uh, show ARP. So there's no ARP entries. We don't have any IP address to MAC addresses mapped. So we need to go to conf T. So we've got to configure something. And the next thing we need to do is configure our interface. So I can do interface or Sorry, INTF, and then if I do question mark, I actually know what I've got, which is interface fast ethernet 0 slash 0. You can see we've dropped into config IF mode. I want to add IP, I'll just type ADD, which is short for address, if I hit tab. And I'm going to uh, use uh, my numeric keypad on my PC, it doesn't matter. If you've got a laptop, just use the top numbers. 192.168.1.1. I need to add a subnet mask, which is explained in an, another video later on. You just copy along with me. This is 30 bits, a 30 bit mask, 30 binary bits. The next thing I need to do is open the interface for traffic. And I'll do that by typing the no shut, which is short for no shut down. Now, you see we've got an informational message here, change to up, change to up. Now it might go down in a moment because it's, it needs to it sends out keep alive, but if there's no keep alive seen from the other side of the connection, then it usually brings it down. Now I'm not going to do any more configuration on this, this router here, so I can type control and Z. And you can see I'm back at the router prompt. Go over to router 2, and it's the same deal. Just going to add another IP address. Comp T, INT, F0, slash 0. IP address 1.2 this time. We can't, we can't use the same IP address twice. No, shut it. Oops, I typed exit, I should have just typed control and Z, but it doesn't matter too much. Alright, so back onto router 1. What I'm going to do now is ping. Now I can just type the IP address in. There is an extended ping you can use, which I won't bother here. And I'm going to type the IP address 1.2. Now normally the first ping will fail. The reason is it has to do an ARP lookup. 
it has to work out where the MAC address is associated with this IP address. So this is often why the first ping fails. However, if I press the up arrow now, just to repeat the command, you can keep doing that actually, I'll press the down arrow, you, all five ping packets uh, work. This one is 80%, this one's 100%. Now if your ping doesn't work, you've made a mistake with your IP address or your interfaces aren't connected properly. So if I used to show ARP now, all right, it's got my MAC address here, and it's got my mapping for the 192.168.1.2, and this is the MAC address. This is the age of the ARP entry here. So that's the ARP part of the lab. Got the same thing going on on router 2. So we've covered ping, we've covered ARP. The next thing I want to do is telnet. I'd like to be able to telnet from router 1 to router 2. So conf t, I need to enable telnet in order for it to work. Line vty is our telnet line. 0 will be our first number. So this is how many telnet lines we've got. Depending on the device you've got, it will be 0 to 4 or 0 to 15. On GNS3, you've got uh, 903 for some reason. So I'll just press line V2I, 0 space, um, space 903. Right, I've got a couple of choices here. I can put a password under the VTY line or I could tell it to look for a local username and password. So I'll put password password Cisco. I always like to keep it to Cisco because if I ever forget a password I'll know it's going to be Cisco. So password Cisco and then I need to say login to enable somebody to log in. All right, so I need to go back onto router one now, and I need to telnet to the IP address 192.168.1.2, and it should say password. It doesn't ask me for a username. I'll type Cisco, which doesn't show as I type, and I'm in on router two. Now, how do I get out of router two? I can obviously configure it if I wish. There's no enable password set. So I can't go into enable mode, but that's not the point of this lab. I'm going to hold down control shift and the number six, let go and press the X key. Control and shift and six all down together, press the X key, after, let go and then press the X key after that. Now if I pressed um, enter now, we would resume the connection, which is something I don't want. It's just a bit annoying that is, so control shift six and X. This time I'm going to enable Talnet on this router. But I'm going to do it with the username and password. Username pool password Cisco line VTY zero space 903. Yours might be different if it's a live device. Login local. What that says is look for a username and password on the local list here. Exit. In fact, control and Z together. All right, so router two, I'm going to go tell net 1.1 is the device. What's the username? Paul, password, Cisco, and I'm in on router one. So that's demonstrated your ARP, Talnet and Ping. That's the end of the lab. Thanks for watching.
VLANs and drugs. We'll be doing some labs on this as we go through the course, so don't worry um, if it doesn't sink in straight away. A VLAN is a virtual local area network, so it's not something you can see by physically looking at the network. You'd have to look at the configuration of the switches. It defines a broadcast domain in the layer 2 network. So uh, just the same as uh, a local area network using a switch, the switch will forward broadcasts. However, if you have two VLANs on a switch, for example, the one on the top right diagram there, the broadcast will stop as far as the VLAN. Reason is you need a layer 3 device, which is normally a router, in order to um, send information from one network to another. So a virtual local area network, for all intents and purposes, it follows the same rule as a, um, a normal network or subnet. So uh, you can separate broadcast domains even though it's on the same physical switch by configuring a layer 2. Uh, a VLAN is a logical division of switch ports. So if you had 20 switch ports physically on the switch, you could in theory have 20 different um, devices each in its own VLAN. You need a router to pass packets between VLANs. Some switches actually come with a, uh, a routing module that you can insert, uh, which is a bit beyond CCNA level, to be honest, but, uh, just for your own information. So VLANs can span multiple physical switches. So we've got switch 1, 2 and 3 here, and you can see we've got a couple of different VLANs configured. Best to have all hosts in the same VLAN on the same subnet. That's all really I wanted to say on that particular subject, but it's just the best um, idea. Uh, no need for a router to, to communicate if all the devices are all, all on the same VLAN. Some of the benefits, or why would you bother? The logical separation just gives you better security. Helps uh, with the broadcast issues if you do have one. Better utilisation of your bandwidth. A VLAN marking, obviously there has to be some way if you're chopping your network into VLANs for the VLAN to identify itself. Uh, vendors use different approaches, for example Cisco created ISL into Switch Link, which is a proprietary for Cisco devices. They've actually moved away from ISL now, though many of their switches still support it, and they moved on to IEEE standard 802.1Q, called frame tagging. Frame tagging inserts a 32-bit tag field into the original frame. So a concept of a native VLAN is something you should be familiar with as a Cisco engineer. Uh, a native VLAN on uh, Cisco devices certainly is uh, all allocated to uh, VLAN 1. By default, all devices in a VLAN will be assigned to VLAN 1 unless you configure um, them to be in a different VLAN. So traffic on a VLAN, uh, on, that, on the native VLAN, is not tagged. It's not given the 802.1Q tagging. What uh, The reason is it, uh, we have it is it allows a switch to communicate with a device that doesn't understand 802.1Q. It is a security risk, which we'll cover later on. VLAN membership. So you can assign VLAN uh, devices or ports to a VLAN statically as a network administrator. It can be dynamic based upon device MAC address. Switch ports are assigned to VLANs and then devices plug into the physical ports. Access ports connect to network hosts. Network hosts connect to access ports. It works both way around that sentence. If you want to connect to another switch and you're using multiple VLANs, then these um, connections are known as trunk ports. So trunk ports uh, will connect uh, more than one VLAN, which is uh, connecting more than one VLAN together. So a special port type carries data from multiple VLANs. It can use ISL, although that's pretty much been depreciated now, so you shouldn't be looking at it for the Cisco exams at least. Frame tagging is transparent to end hosts, so the tag is attached by the switch, sent to another switch, and before it reaches the end host, the tag is actually removed. Trunk port modes, we can manually set the interface to trunk with the command switch port mode trunk. 
Trunk modes include on, which is manually set the interface to trunk. Off, you can tell it to never become a trunk. Auto, silently wait for a request to become a trunk. Desirable, which means actively seek to become a trunk. Or no, negotiate. You'll cover these commands in detail when you come to do the CCNA. I probably won't be doing um, covering these commands and how to configure them for the primer. Configuring a VLAN, you need to manually add the ports to VLANs and you need to set your ports to trunk. So here's a configuration. I've just done one side because the configuration is the same for both switches. Uh, I've created VLAN 5 in config mode by typing VLAN 5. Uh, I've given it a name called RND. So you can name your VLANs. It probably makes it easy for you to manage. Interface fast ethernet 0 slash 1. I've created switch port access VLAN 5. So this is telling the port that it's a switch port layer 2 and it and the device is uh, belongs to VLAN 5 that's connected to it. I've gone on to my fast ethernet 0 slash 15 switch port trunk encapsulation dot 1q to tell it what encapsulation to use. That won't work on a 2960 switch because 2960 will only recognize dot 1q and I've told it to become a trunk port. OK, so you'll be labbing some of this up later on, uh, but for now, that's the end. Thanks for listening. Spanning Tree Protocol so what is spanning tree? It's defined by the IEEE 802.1D standard and basically it allows switches to communicate in order to prevent loops on our switch network. It runs a mathematical algorithm. It, run, um, it finds out and blocks which ports would be the possible causes of layer 2 loops. Basically a loop will occur on our switch network when there's more than one path for a frame to take um, and this could cause obviously confusion as I'll illustrate in a moment. So it's a real simple uh, illustration here with our diagram. So switch 1 for example will receive a frame on its fast ethernet 0 slash 1 and it will flood it out of its next interface fast ethernet 0 slash 2 and remember if there's 24 interfaces then it would be flooding them out of all 24. Now switch 2 would receive this um, and it, the address would be for host A and it would be firstly received by switch A, switch 1 and recognize that host A was connected to fast ethernet 0 slash 1. Unfortunately that address would come out of the bottom of switch 1, go around and reach the bottom of switch 2. Switch 2 then thinks that uh, it knows the way to get to host A and the direction to go is through fast ethernet 0 slash 1 it will send that out of fast ethernet uh, sorry fast ethernet 0 slash 2 and it will send that out of 0 slash 1 now we have a problem in that the ports on the switch all think that they can reach, reach host A uh, when that isn't in fact the case now there's no time to live field in layer 2 frames so that would go round and round around the network until every single switch thinks it knows how to get to host A and it would bring your network to a grinding halt. So there's a mathematical um, algorithm was created and it's based on two key components. The bridge ID. For bridge ID you can basically read switch ID, it's the same thing. And the path cost. So these are contained inside the frame. The bridge ID is an 8 byte field consisting of the bridge priority and the MAC address, uh, the base MAC address of the switch. The default bridge priority is 32768 and then this is added to the MAC address. Now I've issued a show version on a switch and it showed the base MAC address among other information and each one will be different. So the path cost is used to calculate the proximity to neighbor switches. 
the higher the bandwidth, the lower the default port cost. So we can see the 10 gigabit connection here has got the lowest port cost allocated to it. So there's a four step path selection process. So the lowest root bridge ID, the lowest path cost to the root bridge, the lowest sender bridge ID, and the lowest port ID, and it will go through these four steps until it makes a decision. This all happens after the exchange of bridge protocol data units, which are called BPDUs. So let's have a look at our diagram. We have three switches here, and just to keep things simple, we've given them the MAC addresses of all A's, all B's, and all C's. They're all connected, so we could possibly have a loop here unless something is done to close down one or more of the ports. So there's a root bridge election, firstly. Then there's root port selection. Then there's a designated port selection. The bridge uh, with the lowest bridge ID is selected as the root. And remember, it's a combination between the priority and the MAC address. In this case, the lowest MAC address is going to be the one with all of the A's because that's a lower number in hexadecimal. So root port is the port closest to the root bridge. Now the root bridge will not have any root ports because it is the root bridge so its ports will all be known as designated ports. You can see switch 2 and 3 has elected its closest port to the uh, root bridge as fast ethernet 0 slash 1. Every bridge except the root bridge must elect the root ports and uh, each interface adds a cost. So as, it goes, as the frame goes through different interfaces the cost is added. You can see fast ethernet 0 slash 1 is 19. As it gets to fast ethernet 0 slash 2, uh, that port cost is added again and 19 plus 19, cost have been 19 each, uh, comes up as 38. So fast ethernet 0 slash 1 wins. The designated port election, a designated port sends and receives traffic on the segment to the root bridge. Only one designated port per segment. You can see there's a segment at the bottom here, fast ethernet 0 slash 2 on switch 2 and 3. The tie goes to the lowest root bridge ID, lowest root path cost, lowest sender bridge ID and lowest port ID. And you can see on switch 2 and 3 the lowest out of the two would be the switch with the number MAC address BB, BB and so on. The port states for STP can only be one of the five following. It's forwarding, it's learning, it's listening, blocking, or disabled. All right, so we've covered a fair bit there. I only wanted to give you a taste of STP, and um, there could be a lab on this. I haven't decided yet. Obviously, you'll be digging into a lot more detail when you actually come to do the CCNA. But thanks for listening. Cisco 2960 switch. This is actually tested in the CCNA exam at the moment. Obviously check the syllabus. This is the, the model that's suitable for the CCNA exam. Obviously Cisco have a large range of Cisco switches available from small office models to large enterprise networks. Just a couple of things you really need to bear in mind. Please do go through the documentation on cisco.com website for the 20, 2960. There's a system LED which can be off green and amber. And now each LED can have different colours and it can also flash. So each, you could say, for example, have three colours, green, amber, red. This is just an example. And then each of those modes could actually have a mode where it's um, on, off or flashing. So you, this is why you, you need to read the documentation. The um, redundancy, redundant power supply LED, if there's one attached, some have one and some don't. There's a port status LED, there's a port duplex mode LED, port speed, uh, power over ethernet if supported, for example for IP phones, there's a port LED, uh, LED. Uh, this will tell you if a cable is attached, if the port's blocked or if the port is sending traffic and it will be blinking quite rapidly uh, 
on and off screen. There's a mode button on the on the bottom, it's an actual physical button that you press, and that cycles through different modes. And again, you can read through the documentation on cisco.com to see uh, how that works. Various models, you've got 8 to 248 fast Ethernet ports, obviously a console port, there's a USB port available, uplink ports for connecting to other switches. Some have a uh, PoE ports for voice tele telephony and some are stackable which means you can actually connect multiple switches together and they act as if they are one single switch. Quality of service um, can prioritize traffic for voice and video and they support up to 4000 VLANs. Again you can get all this from the sales and product documentation. There's some dual purpose ports. Cisco um, Cisco have something called SFP modules, small form, pluggable, I think it stands for. Uh, ports come in, uh, can be 10, 100 or 1000, RJ45 or SFP. Uh, <clears throat> just a quick look at the rear of the 2960. You've got the fan exhaust, redundant power supply and AC power. And it, obviously it's different depending on which countries you have. That's the end. Thanks for watching. Alright, welcome to our switching lab. What I've got here is Packet Tracer, just to do a lab with this really. I'm going to use the 2960 switch and I'm going to do some configuration on it. I think what I'll do actually is add a router over here. Click on the cables, straight through cable. Fast Ethernet 0 slash 0 and Fast Ethernet 0 slash 1. Alright, so that's the switch connected to the router. Now I'll just click on the switch. Maximise the screen. Alright, so just go through a little bit of configuration really. Switch are in uh, user mode as you can see. Enable mode to get us to an enable. I could have just typed EN. I won't do anything now. I'm in enable mode. Show version. It's a bit of information, really. You can see your software version, how many interfaces you have, gigabit and fast Ethernet, your base MAC address, which is used to determine the MAC address for the switch in any spanning tree. Your model of switch 2960 24T. You can look on the Cisco website for more information. Uh, the main things really you've got a configuration register on the switch, which we won't look at at the moment. So, of course, it's running Cisco iOS. You can do most of the commands you can on a Cisco router, however, this is a layer 2 switch so it's designed it's going to have other commands in it that a router won't and vice versa so first thing is a conf t host name and i'll call it sw1 for switch one and you can see the host name's changed i'll just exit out of this i'll just do a show vlan brief what this is going to do is tell me what our vlan numbers are if it's active, you can actually shut a VLAN down. And which interface is allocated to VLAN 1? By default, all interfaces on the switch are in VLAN 1, which we don't really want. It's a security issue, and most switches have VLANs other than VLAN 1 for different devices to connect to. So let's firstly add a default gateway. This is where our IP traffic will go. Uh, IP, DEF, and then I've hit tab, because it's basically because it's quicker. Default dash gateway is the 
command. This is where to send any IP traffic. 1.1.192.168.1.1. Now that isn't actually attached anywhere at the moment. So we'll need to configure that on the router. The next thing I'm going to do is put some interfaces into different VLANs. So say VLAN 2. If I press VLAN 2 and press enter it will create VLAN 2 and it will also go to config-vlan2. Now I can actually add an IP address to the VLAN if I wish. Sorry, I need to type interface. Oh, there's one thing I, I want to explain actually while I'm here. If I'm in the wrong mode I can type out the command but it won't auto-complete it for me. It's expecting some VLAN related configuration, so I need to drop out of VLAN. And then if I type interface, it will finish it off for me. Interface VLAN 2. And I'm in config IF mode and I'm configuring uh, the VLAN interface. So I can put many commands on this, including one I do want 192.168.1.2. Two five five dot two five five dot two five five dot zero. I also have to add the no shut, no shut down, or just no shut to bring that VLAN interface up. So I want to. Uh, you've got a VLAN, but you actually need to put interfaces into a VLAN or assign them. So I'm going to go interface fast zero slash one. Now normally you'd have to add the switch port command to tell it to be a layer 2 interface but they, they're all layer 2 interfaces by default. So switch port I put switch port mode access let me just delete that and I'll show you the options you have. Access interface dynamic so let, the, let it try and set itself as what it's going to be or trunk. I'm going to hard set it to access. I need to assign it to a VLAN so switch port access VLAN and then whatever VLAN I want it to be in. I want it to be in VLAN 2 and for good measure I will add the no shut command here to bring it up. What I'm going to do now is just configure sorry I'm going to configure I find it. Our oh, router. I don't want to put an IP address on this. ConfT interface, it's fast 0 slash 0, I believe. The one that we're connected to with our switch. This is 1.1. I'm going to now shut it. So, what I want to be able to do is connect from the router to the switch. The switch has got a default gateway to send any traffic to our fast Ethernet interface. And what I'm going to do next is ping 192.168.1.2. So this is our VLAN 2 interface. First ping shouldn't work. Need to do an ARP lookup. Bear in mind sometimes the interface doesn't come up straight away. Also it can take 30 seconds for it to come up between the router and the switch. There we go. So first ping failed due to an ARP lookup, the other pings worked. If I want, if I, no, I was going to do show you some of the commands, but I won't do that at the moment, just to avoid the confusion. All right, so I'll come out of the 
VLAN 2 here uh, the interface what I'm going to do is show you something else interface this this might or may not work depending on the version of our code you have on your switch interface range or print question mark I want fast and I'm going to save myself a lot of time and effort by adding a configuration to a range of interfaces rather than just one at a time say I've got 20 interfaces I need to add so a fast ethernet 0 slash 2 to 10 and this is a little bit fiddly sometimes because sometimes you need to put a space in I've found between the interfaces or a dash it's accepted that fine but just bear it in mind you have to use the question mark um, I'm going to set them all to switch port mode access switch port access VLAN 10 so this will also create the VLAN 10 so VLAN does not exist creating VLAN 10 so it's creating it for me I could do a number of things if I want I could shut the in I could shut them all down so they're not open for traffic or no shut them okay show VLAN brief and now we can see we've got our default VLAN and we've got these interfaces up oh, we've got VLAN 2 which we created fast ethernet 0 slash 1 and we've got all these other interfaces the other thing I wanted to do VLAN 2 is give them a name so I'm not actually ideally I'd be in the config mode to create uh, to name a VLAN but what I can do is just even though I'm in config VLAN mode I can go to VLAN 10 from here and now I'm configuring VLAN 10 HR for human resources so something else I wanted to uh, show you is the do command and this means I can issue a command that doesn't belong here a privilege command even though I'm in a configuration mode do show VLAN brief and I can see it's much better for me now it says it's in VLAN 2 it's given me the name of the VLANs I wanted to do a lab covering um, trunking and some more VLANs. Now, obviously, I'm using Packet Tracer here. If you've got a home lab, all you do is just get your two switches and cable them up, copying the cable in I've got here, or do your own cabling. So I'm just going to use a PC image, PC over here. So what I want to do is just connect the switches. Um, together and also have a switch either side and again I'm just doing this for convenience to be honest it's fine if you've got your own equipment at home fast ethernet 0 slash 1 to 0 slash 1 is connecting my switches together with a crossover cable and then I'm going to connect 0 slash 2 on this switch to the fast ethernet and 0 slash 2 on this switch to the fast ethernet now PCs I'll add an IP address one dot one I'll add the default gateway just in case of one dot two so that's all I need to worry about at the moment on that PC and the same on this side is needs a different IP address obviously in the same subnet
I'll have 1.1 as the default gateway, just so I know it's sending any IP traffic out that way. So I've got two switches. What I want to do is uh, put these interfaces in a different VLAN. So PC1, PC0, this side are in a different VLAN, and then connect uh, to a trunk link across the switch. So I'll just go over to the switch on the left first. Enable comp t host name and I'll call it switch one. Now my fast Ethernet zero slash two was connected and I want to create a VLAN two. So interface fast zero slash two switch port mode access. It should probably have done it by default, but I personally want to hard code it as an access. switch for access VLAN 2. So let's put that interface into VLAN 2. The next thing I want to do, if I just type, if we go to exit, I want to do show interface trunk to see if I've got any trunk interfaces. I don't have one showing at the moment, so trunk interface is one that can carry multiple VLANs. So comp t interface fast ethernet 0 slash 1 switch port mode trunk you see the interface has come up here probably not a lot going to happen at the moment because I need to configure the other side so let me go to switch 2 the interface has come up 2 and 1 because it's seen keep alive from the other side Host name switch to interface class zero slash one. I'm going to shorten the command switch port mode access, switch port access VLAN two. No shirt, I think it's up already actually. And interface fast zero slash one switch port mode trunk. Let's reset that, it went down and up quickly. Show interface trunk. Okay. So fast ethernet is a trunk mode. Trunk mode is on, which basically means I've manually configured it to be on as a trunk. Encapsulation type 802.1Q, which is all you get on a 2960 switch. You don't get ISO, which is the other type. The native VLAN is one, which I don't really want to have, but I'll just leave it there for now. So that's trunking. VLANs allowed on trunk are 1 to 1005. VLANs allowed, and in active management um, domain, VLAN 1 is always there, and VLAN 2 we've created. All right, so that's our trunk up. I'll just issue a show VLAN brief. And you can see VLAN 2 is active. Right, I don't have an interface in VLAN 2 for some reason. I thought I'd put that into VLAN 2. I'll put the wrong interface into VLAN 2. That's right, it should be fast Ethernet 0 slash 2. But that's okay. Comp T, interface fast 0 slash 2. Switch port mode access. Switch port access VLAN 2. No shirt. And then I'll, I should have pressed, oh, that's okay. So I pressed end there. So show VLAN brief. And we can see our fast ethernet is in 0 slash 2. I'm just going to check that on switch 1. Show VLAN brief. And we've got fast ethernet 0 slash 2. All right, so I want to go back. It's a bit harder when you've got a home lab because you've got to connect your PCs in and stuff, or at least connect a router here with an Ethernet interface. So in theory, I should be able to ping from PC0 here to PC1, and it's going across uh, VLAN 2 here and VLAN 2 here. Now, first ping might not work.
bit my art minus a no no up entries ping 192.168.1.2 and it's got a reply there straight away which is good news so uh, it said for and receive for and then if I just press the up arrow twice we've actually got an ARP entry here as well for R1.2 so that's proved off the ping, it's proved off the VLAN and our trunk links working real straightforward lab, very simple obviously you can add more hosts and complexity to it as you go along IP addressing. We're going to have a, this is really just a brief overview of IP version 4 because we're going to be looking at other aspects of it uh, shortly in other presentations. So types of IP address, a unicast is a single device so traffic is destined for a, a one unique machine. Multicast address, a group of devices is identified in that address. And then a broadcast address is all, all hosts on the network. It can be just a handful or it could be a, a large number of thousands. IP version 4 addressing, it consists of 32 binary bits. We group these binary bits into four sets of eight. The reason why we do that is it makes, us easier, makes it easier for us to see. Cisco devices don't actually add any um, decimals or anything. They just see it as a string of ones and zeros. So converting binary to decimal. We basically start off with the number one and then we move left eight times because we're for IP version four we use octets, which is a set of eight characters. One, two, four, eight, sixteen, and we keep doubling it until we get to 128. Then if you want to create a number, you just add a one into whichever column to give you the number that you want to get. So here we've got a ones in the one, two, eight, the sixteen, the four, the two, and the one column. And all we need to do is add those numbers together, and it will tell us what our final number is. In this instance, it's one hundred and fifty-one. So if we added a one in each of these columns and added the numbers together, it would give us two hundred and fifty-five. Address classes. This is kind of it for historical purposes only. Addresses initially, because it wasn't seen that there was going to be any shortage, they were allocated based upon the size of your organisation. Class D is reserved for multicast and E is experimental use only, so you, you would be using it to be honest. So this is all five classes of address and it, they start off with leading bits which we'll come back to later. But in order for the network equipment to identify what class it is, certain leading bits are reserved. For class A it's 0, for class B it's 1, 0, and for class C it's 1, 1, 0, and those bits can't be changed. We have a size of the network portion, which um, again we'll, we'll come to this later when we look at subnetting. The network part of the 32 bits is 8 for class A, it's 16 for class B, and for class C it's 24, and that leaves us with the, the rest, uh, the remainder is for the hosts. You, you can also see how many networks these uh, net, these addresses give us and how many addresses we can have per um, per network. All right, IP version 4 address types. So public addresses, these have to be paid for and you can use them over the internet. You normally buy them from your ISP or you're allocated by your ISP. Private addresses are free and can be used internally they are not routable on the internet. You're not allowed to use them on the internet. And you can see the range of addresses down here. Uh, you should remember all of these, so do make a note of them. I've issued an IP config on um, my Windows 7 PC here. And you can see I've actually got a private address in use here for my Ethernet adapter. And then I've got a VMware adapter which uses a different range, but it's still a private IP address 192.168. So you'll see this quite commonly on your home routers if you look at your network settings. 
special range of IP address. There's 127 in the range is used for loopback uh, addressing. More specifically, 127.0.0.1, you would ping to test the TCP IP stack on your machine. Microsoft has its own special range for AP IPA, which is basically if the device cannot uh, receive an IP address via DHCP and there isn't a manual address added. Again, it's worth just remembering that range of addresses. And here's an example here on my um, IP, IP config command. Classless IP addressing allows you to make smaller networks for major ones, which we'll come to in more detail later. Smaller networks carved out of our main network are called subnetworks or subnets for short. Subnet maps are used with uh, network addresses. If we have a binary zero on our subnet mask, as you can see underneath here, that indicates that it's a host bit. If it's a one, it indicates it's a network bit. Now, you don't, you never used to, but now you have to use a subnet mask when you use an IP address. This is part of the address conservation plan. Even if you're not subnetting, you still have to use the subnet mask. So class A, the default mask is 255 and all the zeros. Class B is 255.255 and then class C is three lots of 255. You can see our network and our host portions of the uh, octets in the table there. So some examples, 192.168.100.2, you can see dot two is the host. For a 10 network, the host will be the last three numbers. And then we've got a class B address here and the 101.55 is the host number. All right, so this is just a gentle introduction. We'll be doing a fair bit more of this as we go through the other IP addressing lectures. Easy subnetting. So we're going to cover some subnetting basics with a view to just laying a foundation. So if you choose to go on to the CCNA later on, you've got an understanding of just some of the concepts and it'll make your learning subnetting probably a lot faster. So I just wanted to touch, CI, touch on CIDR, classless interdomain routing. Most of the protocols and ports and services we're we're going to be learning about or originate from RFCs, which stands for Request for Comments. These are documents submitted by network engineers proposing how certain technologies work and protocols and services um, within TCP IP. Um, this is why TCP IP has become the dominant force in internetworking because people continue to um, contribute to it and it's all free. So CIDR is based upon the concept of variable length subnet masks. This means you take the standard subnet mask that you normally assign for class A, B and C and you can actually manipulate it to um, feature more, more digits. Also you can change the subnet mask representation to a number and the number represents the number of network bits used as we shall see. So here we've got 255, which is obviously 8 binary bits, 255.255 is 16 binary bits, and then we've got 24, so class A, B, and C. So CIDR lets you steal bits, and the more bits you steal, obviously the bigger the number is in the slash part. Subnet masks allow us to determine the network bits of the address versus the host bits. If we turn a binary bit on, it signals a network bit. If we leave the binary bit turned off, and it signals the host bit. So here's a summary of what we've covered so far in this and uh, earlier lecture. We've got class A, class B and class C and you can see which bits are allocated for the network and which for the hosts. So when uh, IP addressing was first uh, devised there was no such thing as home computers. They were so expensive that only large um, companies used them. So Class A, B and C were uh, devised. The Class A addresses were given out to large organisations, but the problem is there was only 128 possible networks. 
because of the way the addressing worked. And each network would have up to 16 million hosts, which is just a ridiculously large amount for a local area network. Class B was better, but not much better. 16,000 networks, but each had 65,000 plus hosts per network address. And Class C, there was 2 million uh, possible networks, and each with 256 hosts. Now, some of these numbers are going to change slightly when I bring in some rules for subnetting. But you can see underneath here the start addresses, the end addresses, and what the addresses are used for. So here's one of the first rules of subnetting. You can't alter the fixed bits which are used to identify the network. Class A has to be a zero on the first bit of the first octet. For class B, one and zero, and class C, one, one, zero. Those three bits cannot change. So that affects what numbers we can use for the network. So you can see the start and finish numbers in the right two columns. And I've put it in binary and into uh, decimal also. Subnet and rule, you can't use the network address. So the network address designates the network. So for this reason, it can't be applied to a host or an interface. And you can't use the broadcast address. The broadcast address is all the binary bits for the host turned on, which designates that it's a broadcast packet. So you can see examples of addresses we can't use on the left. And I've marked in red uh, the part uh, the part that can't be used. All right, so available hosts and networks. So because we're reserving bits to identify what the number is, it leaves us less usable bits. So for class A, you've got seven usable bits in the first octet because one bit has been used, reserved. For class B, you've got 14, and for class C, you've got 21. Now we use the powers to work out um, the numbers because it's just an easy way of converting the binary into a usable number. So seven possible network bits, we use the powers. Two to the power of seven, which is two times seven, and um, two times two, seven times. That gives us 126 possible networks. We've taken two away because we can't use zero and we can't use one, two, seven. For uh, class B, it's two to the power of 14. 14 available bits gives us 16,384. And then for class C, it's 2 to the power of 21, which is uh, 2,097152. You can see the possible host bits, and I've taken away 2, because you're not allowed to use the subnet address, the network address, and you're not allowed to use the broadcast address. Here's an example, 192.168.1.0 network. First usable address, I just add a 1, then I keep counting up, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, all the way up to 254. 255 is the broadcast address, so I can't use that. And here's some of the addresses we can't use, which I've, I've mentioned um, for class A. That's just an example. So what is subnetting? Basically, it's using host bits to carve out some more networks. These networks are called mini networks, subnetworks, or just subnets. Obviously, the more bits you steal, the more subnets you have, and conversely, the less hosts you have because you're stealing host bits. All right, so here's an example, network bits and host bits on the end, and you can actually borrow up to eight host bits for a Class C uh, network address. I've stolen, for example, two, two host bits. That leaves me in purple six bits remaining for hosts and two bits I can use for subnets. Now if I was going to do it the longhand way, I'd write it all out in binary. So the possible values when you've got two binary digits are 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0 and 1, 1. So we've got four possible values and to in the next column on the right under decimal values you can see the possible values for the subnet. So it's going up in increments of 64. And then finally the binary column, because it's um, the last two um, bits left out of eight binary bits, it's in the 128 and the 64 column. So here's an example of the subnets available, and it's 192.168.1.0, .64, .128 and .192. 
uh, subnets available I've actually worked it out a, a bit more now so I've actually shown you what hosts are available and the broadcast address for each subnet you can work out the broadcast address by going to the next subnet and um, taking one away so the next subnet for is a uh, dot 192.168.1.64 take one away from the 64 and you get 63 and so on for the other subnets all right so working out subnets 2 to the power of 2 is 4 or 2 times 2 working out host per subnet is 2 to the power of 6 and we take 2 away one for the subnet address and one for the broadcast so each host has got 62 hosts in and we've got four available subnets so the subnet in secrets chart will make things a lot easier it's something I came up when I was uh, teaching subnetting we start off with the number one and then we double it and we keep doubling it eight times that gives us our octet for our subnet and then we go back through those numbers but add them together so 128 we add 64 gives us 192 we add 32 gives us 224 and we keep doing that until we add all these numbers together which should come to 255 which is eight binary bits with all the bits turned on now there is a lower section to the chart this is for working out how many hosts and subnets we have and how many hosts per subnet so you just take the number two and double it now I've put minus two in red that's for when we come to work out the host we always take two away so for working out which subnet a host is in and for working out how many subnets on host per subnet now uh, the topping the top ticks reveal the increment and then along the left the ticks are a little bit off sorry I should be ticking 128 and 192 we can see that stealing two bits gives us a mask of 192 because we've, we've ticked across two so we have to tick down the left hand column two So example, uh, 192.168.100.0, our mask is 224 at the end, so it looks like we've stolen three bits if you use the subnet in chart. If you tick across the top, you'll see the increment. So we've stolen three bits, gives us a subnet increment of 32, and we're allowed to start off at zero. If, we, if we're working out subnet bits, we have to start off with the left and we have to tick across the right. It has to be contiguous. All right, so we can tick across three places to reveal the subnet. Tick down three places. Tick across to work out the subnet increment. So here we go. 192.168.100.0 and we're, we go up in increments of 32 all the way up to the actual subnet address we have which was 224 and then I've also worked out the first host, the last host and the broadcast for you okay always uh, when you're in the exam always focus on the octet which has been subnetted otherwise you could take hours to solve the problem so some examples if it's uh, or oh, this is some CIDR example sorry slash 20 gives you 240 slash 11 224 and uh, slash 26 192 alright so typically you'll be asked to find a host in the subnet not work out all of the subnets just depends what kind of exam you're taking so for example 172.16.100.100 you're being asked to work out which subnet it's in if it's got a slash 20 mask well we normally have a slash 16 for a class B and we've got slash 20 so that means we've stolen four bits so tick down four that will give you the subnet mask increment in full and we tick across the top four places which gives us uh, the increment for the subnet so it's going up in increments of 16 and we're subnetting on the third octet not the fourth octet it's a class B address yeah so 0 0 16 0 32 dot 0 you would actually go all the way up to 240 but we just there's no point because we can find the answer quite quickly and just from the question and looking at the subnets you can work out that host 100 dot 100 is in the dot 96 dot 0 subnet 
and I've done all the working out for you. I recommend you do this for yourself also just to confirm you've understood it. So this was just a, an introduction to subnetting. I just wanted to explain the concepts to you. Please follow uh, through my examples and do the working out for yourself and then it will start uh, making sense. IPv version 6 addressing. So we had a few problems as I'm sure you've imagined so far with IP version 4 addressing. Designed before we had mobile devices and certainly before the home PC was really uh, invented as such. There were computers but just weren't affordable for the average person and there was no internet. So it supports 4 billion addresses but there's over 10 billion people online today. So no longer fit for the purpose. Workarounds that kind of plugged a, a hole in the bucket but didn't actually fix the problem long term were NAT, CIDR and private IP addressing. And no built in security so this all had to be built around IP version 4. Obviously we've got latency on mobile devices as well because our mobile devices tend to use private IP addressing which requires to be translated. So a lot of RFCs for IP version 6, RFC 2460 is just one of them. It's a 128-bit address space, so very large. It supports hierarchical addressing, which we've covered in, um, in brief, in how to make our network addressing more efficient, and auto configuration. So the devices self-configure them, themselves with IP addresses. Every house can have its own unique address. You've got no NAT. And hosts can have more than one address. Uh, built in security, there's dedicated routing protocols created in order to support IP version 6. Support from pretty much everyone, really. So, available addresses uh, 340 undecillion addresses. So, a lot of zeros there. Basically, you've got more addresses per person than hairs on your head if you've got hair that is. So a lot of addresses per person so we're not going to run out in certainly our lifetimes and probably a long way down the future. The address format is 128 bits as I mentioned it's represented by eight groups of 16 separated by colons. Now it's actually notated in hexadecimal because to do it in binary would take a long time. So here's an example. The, each um, part there separated by the colon is actually 16 bits. Shortening IP version 6 addresses, because they're so long we can actually, if we follow the rules, shorten them. So if we've got an all, gr all zero group within one of the um, within one of the sets of colons, we can actually just put two colons. We're only allowed to do that once per address. We can also omit leading zeros, so you can see we've got 2001, 43AA, and then we've got four sets of uh, two, two sets of four zeros, and further along we've got 0031. So I've applied the first rule here, so for the two sets of zeros I've just applied the double colons, that tells the device that it's all zeros contained in that section. And then we've got further along, I've taken away some of the leading zeros out of the four that were there. And then finally, I've taken away the leading zeros from the 31. Now, you obviously do that all in one go. I just did it in three different sections just to illustrate uh, different the different means available. But I could have just written the bottom out of the three addresses to shorten it if I was applying it to an interface. Here's some IP version 6 address types. Just have a read through, just be familiar with them, what the names are. Um, obviously there's no big exam associated with this primer, so you, you're not going to be tested on any of this. So it's just uh, good for you to know. There's no broadcast in IP version 6. Uh, there is a loopback address if you want to do apply it for testing. It's double colon uh, 1 slash 128. Link local addresses, I've actually issued a, a IP config here. 
Link local addresses are only significant to nodes on a single link, so it's just a connection between um, a point-to-point -point link on a network. Routers can forward packets using the link local address. These can be configured manually or automatically. The global unicast address, this is how the IPv6 address is actually broken up if you uh, wanted to know. The registry, the ISP prefix, the site prefix, the subnet prefix, and then finally the last half of it is your interface ID. Alright, IP version 6 mechanisms, you've got ICMP version 6, which is does the same job as um, ICMP for version 4, but also a bit more added. Navy Discovery, which replaces ARP. Name Resolution, the quadruple A record returns IP version 6 addresses based upon names. New version of DHCP, you've got IP version 6 security, and then the routing protocols, examples of which are RIP, NG. ERGRP for IP version 6 and version 3 of OSPF. For There won't be a button switched one day on the internet and all of a sudden we're all using IP version 6. There's going to be a transition period. Now this is going to take a while, so meanwhile we have to have a few mechanisms for allowing IP version 4 to coexist with version 6. So the static tunnels, including GRE, which you can research on your own if you wish, generic routing encapsulation. IP version 6 over IP, that includes automatic tunnels. There's 624, which embeds the IP version 4 address into an IP version 6. Something called ISATAP, Intrasite Automatic Tunnel Addressing Protocol. You would need to know what these um, are, i.e. the names for the CCNA exam. I don't really think you'd need to know how they work in any detail. That's a bit too much. More like CCMP stuff, that. Uh, hexadecimal. Just be familiar with the hexadecimal numbering system. The characters go from 0 to 9 and then A, B, C, D, E, F. And they get that gets you 16 um, characters in total in order to make the I um, make the numbers the device numbers and I've also put the numbers in binary so write these out uh, so you're all familiar with those numbers comparing the two uh, this ex obviously expands the IP address I IP space from 32 to 128 bits we've got hexadecimal number in no NAT there's a fixed header 40 bits so it doesn't slide in size so it's improved switching because the header is always going to be the same size you do have auto configuration as well, which is very handy to have. Security I've mentioned uses neighbor discovery instead of ARP. I've mentioned the uh, quadruple A records as well, and we've got different routing protocols. So really, this is just a general introduction. I just want you to have an appreciation of some of the terms and concepts. And obviously, you'll go into a lot more detail if you do the CCNA. Planning IP addressing. I just wanted to talk about this because it's not really discussed in the CCNA. I will cover later uh, what is discussed in as much as uh, route summarization. We've already talked about VLSM, but this is a part of the uh, CCDA, the Cisco Certified Design Associate course. And I just wanted to introduce this because it's very useful to see. A little bit of the design process and just some of the thoughts behind it. Now, I'm not so I'm not going to say you're going to be able to design a, a network addressing scheme and architecture after watching this because there's only a few slides. But I just wanted to give you a little taste because design is such an interesting career available and uh, quite an interesting aspect and quite a re rewarding career uh, for for people to consider. And a lot of, a lot of people don't consider it. So just got a little diagram here, some uh, major headquarters, a couple of big regional offices, a backup system running through ISDN, and then we've got uh, some home users uh, connecting through a cable uh, connection. So you could summarize it into a main location, a couple of regional, and four branch stroke home office locations. 
So uh, we looked at step one there, which is really looking at how many networks you have, which we've totaled here. How big is, uh, is each network? Think about how many devices are going to need addressing. You'll look at the network design plan in order to get the answer to that question. The final decision as to where the company is going in terms of growth and infrastructure will be obviously down to the company management. Step three, uh, look at the addressing needs for each location. You're going to have to work out which devices will need static IP addresses, i.e. these addresses are not going to change and you don't want them to change. Which addresses can you uh, leave to be uh, assigned by DHCP? Which areas will use private and public addresses? What classes of address are we going to be used? And this all, all depends on your internal policies and how you want to allocate your addresses. And planning for growth because most companies do grow. I know there's probably a lot of redundancies going on, certainly if you read the papers, but the idea is companies do grow as they become more successful. So you've got to factor in growth as well. And repeat the process for each location. So here's a kind of an idea based upon the, the diagram that you can see in the top right there. How many different router interfaces, switches, computers, phones and um, capacity for growth. And these are just numbers I've come up with from our CCDA study guide. So 2740 IP addresses including 20% for growth. Assigning them, you normally put the first host address for the subnet on the router interface. And this normally becomes the gateway, so all traffic on that subnet would go through this gateway and the address would be dot one. Now I've just put a real basic example here, so please don't use this as my suggestion of how you should address networks, but I wanted to make it easy to illustrate the point. You can see for the left subnet, um, 172.16.2.0, a couple of hosts on there. It's just uh, it's just an example of a couple of hosts on that subnet. There'll be a lot more, but they all lead to dot one, which is on the router interface. The point-to-point -point link for 172.16.1.0. There's just two IP addresses, so you probably never would use a slash 24 mask. You would generally use a slash 30 on a point-to-point -point link, so because you only need two hosts. And then going down, you can see we've either got a dot one or a dot one and dot two for the sub, uh, the IP addresses for our router interfaces. Private or public, your servers for web, email, DNS, and FTP, you may well want routable addresses if they're going to be required to be accessed over the internet, and quite 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 enough often are to be honest. Cost implications, if money's a factor, if you're a small business. Will you be using network address translation? A hierarchical addressing involves summarizing address summarization techniques and it helps you scale your network, helps reduce traffic. The, the less routes you, you're advertising over your network, obviously the less traffic you have passing. And it helps with stability. So if, you're, if you have a group of routes being advertised out of a certain router, um, just as one route, a summarized route, then if one if one is experiencing stability issues it won't cause a problem. So the idea is aggregating lots of networks into a single address when possible. So here's an example again from the CCDA guide you can see uh, the network is subnetted down into slash 16 slash 24s and slash 30 going to our users and all the way at the top we're actually only advertising a 10 slash 8 address. So this is made our, firstly you can see the addressing is hierarchical. We're using a very carefully thought out and carefully planned scheme so we can correctly allocate addresses without wasting them and without having too much network update traffic going across the network. Scalable, uh, again this is for the CCDA, I really find it fascinating so it's something for you to bear in mind. There's a Cisco CCDA simplified book on Amazon if you want to have a look. I think it's about $10 on uh, Kindle. Hierarchical addressing. So you must use continuous blocks. When, when you're planning out your addressing, sequentially number your network addresses. So here's an example, uh, 192.168, uh, sorry, 192.100.168, 169, 170. 
and you will allocate each of these addresses in numbers for a certain portions of your network that would allow you to sum summarize it now I've written the addresses out in binary and you can see the long string of numbers we've got 8, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21 um, places, 21 bits are in common so this lets you advertise a summarized address out of the router interface rather than advertising 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 you're just advertising one summary route this is the theory behind hierarchical addressing and summarization all right so I hope you enjoyed that little taster and it give you something to think about and again it's um, design is a quite an interesting career to look into if it's something that uh, you find interesting Route summarization. This is going to be a, a, a little taste out of route summarization. It will take a while longer to go through lots of examples, but I just wanted to give you an overview really. So, route summarization you can see on this example network here, you've got a lot of routers on the left, which are routers internal to your network, and then you've got one router which is external facing going out to the ISP or internet or whatever. Now you can see on the left you've got 192.168.1 all the way up to 255 so you've got 255 networks imagine advertising all of those out to the internet or imagine if you had even more networks so the principle behind route summarization is to make your addressing efficient enough that you can send out a summary address more routing tables equal more memory required more CPU cycles more bandwidth used, it's all bad news really for your network. So if you could summarize hundreds of routes into a handful, that would be a good thing. I'm sure you agree. Here we've got 255 routes summarized down to one. And the principle is anything in this example that starts with 192.168 is going to go through that exterior facing router anyway. So why bother sending out 255 routes? So this is kind of CCNA stuff, but also a bit, a bit of CCDA stuff. But they could ask you to summarize networks in the CCNA exam. This is an example of a bad idea. You've got your 192.168.1 networks all the way up to 255. You're sending out a summary route, but for a, a very uh, silly reason, you've put a, you've used that addressing scheme on, um, or part of that addressing scheme on another network on a different side of your ISP. Or your own um, your own network if you've got a large corporate network bad idea you've used a, a non-contiguous set of addresses and uh, just taken one of the addresses and used the other side you could have used a different addressing set you could have used a 10 address a 172 address or whatever matches your need but just don't do that so you need to carefully plan and prepare uh, your address allocation And it'll have a potential growth. Maybe this office that's sitting on the side here was added as a last minute acquisition or as an emergency, but still bad, bad when it comes to addressing. Alright, so to how how to summarize. Count how many bits match. This is the, the secret if there is a secret. So I've put all the matching bits in red. And you can see there's 21 matching bits. Our lowest subnet is 192.166.16.0. So we could advertise 192.168.16.0 slash 21 and this would match all of the subnets that are sitting behind whichever router we're using to advertise uh, this summary address. So final example, we've got uh, four satellite routers sending, they've got different networks off those routers for different subnets or whatever. And each of those routers is uh, sending a summary address to the um, hub router, the spoke route, four spoke routers and a hub router. In turn, that hub uh, router is sending a summarized address for all of those networks out to the internet. Again, just a small example, just to give you an idea of the concept, so you could get your head around the principles. I'm not necessarily expecting you to be able to work it all out based on um, 
just a short presentation. So there you go. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next lecture. Routing concepts. So we're getting to some more meatier stuff now. The function of routers, we looked at switches, but the function of routing is to examine a packet's destination and it, uh, determine the path, the best path usually to take. Sometimes there's more than one available path. Once this has happened, the router chooses the interface to send the traffic out of. This is the difference between routing and switching. As far as a router is concerned, it, the routing is determining the path and then switching the packet is referred to as switching. The routers learn about other networks. They'll either be directly attached, so the router knows that it's attached because it has an IP address configured on that interface. It can learn routes from other routers, this is dynamic routing, or you as the network administrator can manually add a route. So the router basically builds tables. It stores paths to the destinations networks in routing tables. Different types of networks, connected, static, dynamic, or a combination of all of these. A few examples of dynamic router protocols are RIP, EIGRP, OSPF, and BGP, which is mainly used for internet service providers. So the routing table information includes how the route was learned, who it learned the route from, which is handy for us to know for troubleshooting, the interface the network can be reached via, the metric. Now this varies depending on the protocol. Each protocol has a different way of assigning a cost or a weight and it uses these algorithms to work out the best path to take. Here's a hop count example. We've got router A and router B. For router A, it's got zero hops as the metric because the two networks are attached, the 192 and the 10 network. But if it needs to get to the 10.10.20 network, it needs to travel one hop. In this particular example, it looks like RIP, Routing Information Protocol, is using hop and hop count is each router or router. Static routing uh, here. You can manually add, or it is manually added by the network administrator. The, the good or bad thing, depending on how you look at it, is it's never removed from the routing table. So even if the network goes down, for example, on the far right, the 172.31 network, even if that goes down, your router one will continue sending traffic to that network. You can use it in conjunction with dynamic routing also. Dynamic routing protocols, there's interior gateway inside your domain. There's autonomous systems is a term you need to be familiar with. These uh, are a group of routers that are under your administrative control. And if you've got a large network, you may be responsible for 10 or 20 and another department for another 10 or 20. Exterior gateway protocols route between different autonomous systems. Examples of dynamic routing protocols interior gateway are OSPF, EIGRP and RIP version 2. For IP version 6 we've got OSPF v3, RIPNG and EIGRP for IP version 6. Types of interior gateway, there's distance vector and link state and this is to do with the algorithm that they follow in order to compute the best routes. You also have a, a mix uh, known as a hybrid a routing protocol and it takes a bit a bit of each. Distance vector is known as routing by route rumor. So it learns about routes from neighbor routers, not directly from that particular network. The entire routing table is sent periodically. It can be slow to com converge and a convergence is when all devices agree on what the topology looks like. Pretty bandwidth um, intensive generally recommended for smaller networks. Again, it all comes down to what you want to achieve and the design. A link state a network, devices exchange information about the state of their links, and a link is a connection between two ends. Each device builds an independent map of the entire network. So what this means is 
the router does not rely on a map for, from a particular router. Each device sends all of its link information and link updates to every other device on the network and it does a computation using the shortest path first algorithm or SPF. There's no fixed timers here and if a route changes out of 100 routes if one changes only that one update is sent so that's pretty efficient. A couple of examples here OSPF and ISIS. Hybrid protocols uh, this is, uh, I told you, a mixture of distance vector and link state. The example is EIGRP. Uses a bit of both. Exterior routing protocols, these run between autonomous systems. Most common example you'll come across is BGP. Typically used from ISP to ISP. Just something you need to be familiar with, and ad the administrative distance. This is the weight given, or the believability, for a certain route. These are given numbers from 0, I think the highest number is 255 which means that route isn't believed at all, it's ignored. The best value is the lowest, so connected. Next is static, pointing at IP address. So this is something that you would have configured as the administrator. It's worth remembering the ones I've put down here in this chart. Uh, metrics, each protocol is different. So there's hops for example, there's bandwidth uh, divided by cost, so SPF, bandwidth and delay is EIGRP. Uh, BGP uses path vectors. Uh, protocol mechanisms, these are a few things to deal with issues based upon uh, routing protocols. Invalidation timers, this marks the route as unreachable if it's inactive. There's a hop cap limit which is handy if uh, the, the route doesn't actually exist. It actually expires after 15 hops. This applies for RIP. Triggered updates. If there's an important update, it allows it to be sent before uh, an update is due to be sent. The hold down timer means routes are not updated for a certain period of time, normally um, measured in seconds. Route poisoning is there to mark a, a route as unreachable. So the example of RIP, it would mark it as 16 hops away. Split horizon prevents a route leaving an interface it was learned on. This actually makes sense. If, you, if an interface has learned about a 10 network, it wouldn't then go and advertise that network out because it doesn't actually own that network. It wouldn't advertise it out of the same interface, that is. It would advertise it out of other interfaces. Poison reverse, a split horizon advertises a route as unreachable and then asynchronous updates. This is staggering updates, so you don't have two devices releasing an update at exactly the same time, meaning that they clash. All right, so this is just a little introduction uh, to give you a, a just a, a foundational knowledge about the routing protocols. Routing protocols. We're just going to have a general high level overview of the different types of protocols you'll encounter and some of the features. RIP version 1 has actually been removed from the CCNA syllabus but it's really handy to A read about and B just do some real simple configuration labs with it just so we get some confidence and understanding about routing protocols. It's class full. What class full means is it doesn't recognize variable length subnet masking so if you try to add a network with a subnet mask that isn't the default, class A, B or C, RIP version 1 wouldn't recognize it. It would just advertise the default subnet mask. It doesn't send the subnet mask information with routing updates and that's an important note to bear in mind. And the reason is when it was invented there was no such thing as VLSM. It broadcasts all updates, so it's pretty... Uh, bandwidth intensive. Modern protocols actually multicast them. There's no authentication built in and there's a limit of 15 hops and a hop is a router in this particular instance. I've issued a common uh, show command on the router for routing protocols. 
show IP protocols, you can see it's a RIP. It gives you all the different timers if you want to know what they are. It's send in version 1. And you can see there's two networks here. A 10 network and a 192.168.5 network. RIP version 2 was uh, an enhancement to version 1. It's class less which means it does send some mask information. So we can use VLSM. It's got some authentication built in. It's MD5 authentication. It sends multicast updates, so it's more efficient. Automatically summarizes networks at class 4 boundaries. What this means is, as in the diagram, if you've got a 10 network on the far left and a 10 network on the far right, it will automatically summarize it down from, say, for example, slash 16 or 20, whatever you've got, down to 8. You can disable that behavior, and if you've got a network design like this, which is quite a bad idea actually, disc discontinuous subnets, um, you need to do it, otherwise it's going to cause you routing problems. EIGRP, so what I mentioned before, it uses a bit of distance vector and elements of link state. It only works on Cisco routers. It's classless. Uh, so it does recognize VLSM and it automatically summarizes major networks also. In order to do calculations, it uses what's known as dual diffusing update algorithm. It puts the best route, which it calls the successor route, in the routing table. The second and third and fourth, if you have that many routes, are called feasible successors. They're put in something called the topology table. If the successor route drops off the routing table, it's very quickly replaced in the topology to air table by the feasible successor. And so on. You can also uh, do load balancing um, with the RGRP, which is really handy if you've got some high bandwidth links and some lower bandwidth links, but you want to share the traffic so you're not saturate, saturating one particular link. Uh, it's called variance. You actually use the variance command with the RGRP to achieve this. For example, if you use variance 2, it would permit traffic over two times the lower um, capacity path. OSPF, Open Standard Protocol, Classless. It uses, uh, always struggle to pronounce this, Distra, I think it is, the SPF algorithm. That's a name after the person who invented it. The cost is determined by the bandwidth of the link. It does support authentication. OSPF, uh, the cost formula is reference bandwidth divided by the link bandwidth. You can read more about this when you go into CCNA and CCMP. It does recognize the type of uh, network it's on and you can also configure uh, for your best uh, requirements uh, by uh, manually configure what type of network you're on. If it's a broadcast network, in order to save bandwidth, a designated router is elected. This is the master for all of the routing updates and it's uh, signified as the DR. You can see it in the diagram there, actually. You can also have a backup designated router. You don't have to, but this is a backup to the DR in case that router goes down. Router links are all put into areas for OSPF, and this controls what updates are sent inside and outside of the area. The rule is all routers must directly connect to the backbone area, and that area is known as area zero. Different routers have different roles because OSPF is dis designed to scale into fairly large, or very large networks actually. So the backbone router has at least one link in area zero. So it's, it's given the term backbone router. An internal router has all links inside one area. An area border router positioned between multiple areas. The ASBR which is short for Autonomous System Boundary Router, it connects OSPF area to a non-OSPF area, for example, EIGRP. Virtual link. Say, for example, your company buys out another company and they're running OSPF. A virtual link allows you to bridge between uh, non-bridge um, across area zeros, backbone areas, with a non area zero area. So you can see it illustrated in the diagram here. Really, as I said earlier, all areas should directly connect to area zero. So what you could have in this diagram is area zero to connected to area 100 and then area zero, one, two, three, whatever. 
but area zero will uh, feature a virtual link and it will turn all the updates through it. All right, just I'm very briefly going to touch on LSAs, link state advertisements, just so you've heard of them if you choose to go forward with your studies. These are different um, advertisements, and I, I mentioned earlier that OSPF uses it advertises the state of the links rather than um, the networks. So uh, type one LSA advertises links to routers in the same area. A network L LSA is generated by the uh, type two is generated by the uh, DR. Type three is the network summary generated by an ABR. And don't worry if you don't remember these, it's just for your information. ASBR summary is type four. An external link state advertisement used by an ASBR router. This is for an external prefix. Type 6 is a multicast LSA. It's not used by Cisco, so don't worry about it. A not so stubby area, type 7. I don't think I'm going to go into um, details about areas. That's a, a, just a, a, a brief reference to them here. A regular area is normal OSPF. A stub prevents two types of LSA from entering. Totally stubby prevents three, four, and five from entering. This again is for design and bandwidth issues. Not so stubby area blocks four and five. And this is really CCMP stuff, by the way, so don't worry too much about it. <coughs> All right, just a diagram. Don't let it put you off or intimidate you. I just wanted to illustrate the different types of areas really and, and updates. So it's not a complete shot when you do come to read about it. ISIS is not in the CCNA or CCMP syllabus. I think it might be in the CCIE. I would have to check. Intermediate system to intermediate system. It's a pure link state protocol. A lot of engineers really favor it in fact. Classless and very scalable. Not widely used by engineers, but there are some engineers that really do uh, favor using it, as I said. And uh, BGP. This is an exterior gateway protocol, so it's more concerned with autonomous systems rather than individual networks. There's multiple attributes. Uh, again, you're going to come to this in the CCMP, not the CCNA, and you can tune these attributes to affect the path. Scales to hundreds of thousands of routes, and currently there's 300,000 routes available on the internet. Alright, so I hope you enjoyed that. Just as I said, it's just to give you a little overview and a taste of some of the concepts that you're going to experience in the CCNA, and what I've covered, a lot of it is actually in the CCMP. configuring the router. So let's look at a few configuration steps and concepts. Obviously it will make far more sense when we do a, a lab together, but I just wanted you to give some theory to work on. We'll look at router modes and passwords, show commands, the configuration register, different interface configuration settings, modes. So there's different levels of access or privilege levels you could uh, say for Cisco routers and different uh, levels and different um, parameters will allow you to configure different parts of the router for example just issue show commands or actually configure IP addresses and routing protocols so the most basic mode really is called user mode you'll see the router if you're on a router or a switch if you're on a switch it will say and then it will have the greater than arrow and then it will say um, well it won't say anything you'll type enable to try and get into privilege mode as long as there's no passwords on there you'll drop into privilege mode and you'll recognize it because you'll have the pound key showing at the end of the uh, name of the device router or switch if you want to configure something you type the word config or configure you can type config for short space and then t or terminal config t or configure terminal two words that drops you into config mode and then there's different modes there for example if you want to configure an interface or you want to configure some routing protocols 
you'll go into the relevant uh, configuration prompts. If you're not at the right prompt, then you won't be able to configure these parameters. You can drop back to uh, the, the previous mode you were at by typing the word exit. You can drop back to privilege mode completely wherever you are by holding down the control and Z key or by typing end. Passwords, uh, secure privilege mode with an enable secret password. The reason we do this is we don't want people to just plug into the console port and then start configuring the router or even telnetting in. So the, the uh, enable secret password is called such call because it won't uh, be visible. If you issue a show run command, which is the show running configuration, uh, you won't be able to see the enable secret. So I've typed enable secret and then Cisco here just to keep it easy. Issued a show run and it says enable secret 5, which means it's been encrypted with level uh, 5, MD5 encryption. And you can see there's a hash there. Now obviously the password Cisco, which this person can't see when they've logged into the router. Console access, I'll come into more security stuff later. If somebody plugs into the console port on the router, it's a very vulnerable uh, place to be as a for you as a network admin because they've got a, a lot of access. So the uh, ports on the routers are called lines when you're in configuration mode. You can also add a timeout value. So if somebody doesn't type any commands in for a certain period of time, it will uh, throw them out. So here's to how to put a password on the or one way to put a password on the console uh, port. Line console zero, password, and then the name of the password. This is how you add a timeout, exec dash timeout in line configuration mode. And I've just put five for five minutes. You can do a space and then add seconds if you want to add seconds. Protect Talnet access. Talnet is disabled by default. Talnet lines are called VTY lines in the configuration. Now, depending on the device you have, you're going to have five lines, 0 to 4, or 16, which is 0 to 15 inclusive. If you're on GNS3, you actually have hundreds. So line VTY, uh, 0, space, and I've put a question mark. The question mark will tell you what's available in any command parameter, and I can see I've got 903 here. So this is actually on GNS3. Now, uh, I added password Cisco and then type login. What that means is just to check for the password underneath the VTY lines. On the next example on the right, I've typed a login local. That tells the router to interrogate the username and password you've put in under configuration mode. Service password encryption really is quite a poor way to encrypt your passwords. It offers a weak method to encrypt them. It's known as level seven. Which and there's free programs on the internet you can download to crack passwords at a level seven. So in the output there, I've put username, pull, password, Cisco. Then I've typed service password encryption, issued a show run, and it showed me my level seven password. What I'm trying to say is don't use them. Show commands you will use a heck of a lot as a Cisco engineer, showing you all the different configuration types. Show run is the entire configuration you have running in DRAM on the router. Show uh, version is a common command. It shows you all the installed memory, your operating systems, and how the router reloaded last time. Show IP interface brief is a summary of attached interfaces. Show IP protocols is a summary of routing configurations. Show memory is a, uh, used to view memory statistics. Show history is for commands previously entered. The configuration register is a really handy to know about. It tells the router what to do during a, a, a boot up sequence. It's a hexadecimal value. If the value is 0x2102, it's telling the router to boot normally and load the configuration for the router from memory. If it's 2142, it's saying boot, but skip the configuration. You would do this if you've just bought a router off eBay and somebody's put IP addresses and stuff on it, or if you've forgotten the passwords, and I did a lot of these when I worked at Cisco with customers. You can check the configuration register value with the show version command. Type show version, you'll probably have to press the space bar to show the rest of the screen, and at the bottom it will show you the configuration register. If you change it with the command at the top, config-register, 0x2142, 
Then as you show version, it will tell you what it is going to be at the next reload. Interfaces, get a whole bunch of these in your routers and you can buy modules that have extra interfaces. Uh, show IP interface brief gives you a summary of your interface name, the IP address and if it's up or down. There's two parts of it, it's going to be up, up, uh, up, down, administratively down, down. The first value, so for example down, down, means it's physically down, it can't see a cable on there. The second one is protocol, means it can't see any keeper lives. So layer one and then layer two. So show IP interface brief to find out which interfaces you have and it's layer one and layer two. Common interfaces, uh, image from Cisco Systems website. This is quite an old model of router, maybe 3640. I can't, can't quite see there because of the shine on it. But um, a whole bunch of interfaces here, serial, T interfaces, gigabit, fast ethernet and voice interfaces and you've got a module card on the top right as well so some examples of interfaces you can have numbering um, differs depending on the interface types and slots and modules you can check Cisco's website for um, interface numbering if you type that into Google but um, slots have got their own numbers and then if you put in different modules into slots that will affect how the numbering works. It can be a bit confusing at times, but that's why we've got the, the show IP interface brief command will tell us what we do have. And it also is numbered on the back of the routers as well. Common configurations. Uh, so here's an example of a fast ethernet. I've typed in the speed. I could have left it to auto, but I've put the speed 100, the duplex is full, the IP address, I've issued the no shutdown command. The no shutdown is basically telling it to come up. So it's the opposite of being shut. And you can see there's a informational uh, report coming in saying the link is up. Okay, interface status. Show IP interface brief. I've already mentioned it gives you the IP address and the current situation. I've mentioned these before. All right, WAN interfaces. So this is your wide area network interfaces. The default encapsulation on Cisco devices is HDLC, unless you've bought a different type of um, card, like an ADSL card or something like that. Show interface. Mine is serial 0 slash 0 slash 0 on this router. Pretty large range and you've got different cards and cables and, and stuff. Uh, here's an output of a show interface serial. I could have typed serial, but I typed desk for short. Zero slash zero slash zero. Loopback interfaces are really handy for doing testing and home labs. Uh, you can have as many as you wish. Well, within reason, you have to type interface loopback space question mark to see how many. But you can add IP addresses to them. They never go down because they're logical. So they, they can't be broken, basically. They don't physically exist on the router. They exist in software. But you can ping them and do testing with them. All right. So I hope you enjoyed that. And I hope it's given you a, a good grounding to move on to the continuing lectures. Static routing. I realise I we did discuss this earlier, but I think there's just a few other things I wanted to cover because it's used so often. A writing table. We've seen an output from a writing table before, but basically we know it's a directory of networks that are known by the router. It can be a directly connected subnet, so it's on your interface connected to your router. You could have manually entered it as the administrator. Or, as we already know, it could have been learned via a routing protocol. Now, the important thing to remember is if there's no route in the routing table, by default, the router will drop the packet. You can configure something called a default route to send traffic somewhere if there's no route in the table. So here's a show IP route. And you can see there's a key at the top. I recommend you issue this command on any router or on GNS3 if you're using it, just so you can see 
the, uh, the, the available outputs connected static rip mobile BGP and so on underneath we've got our various routes ones learned by rip ones twos connected another rip route and then there's a static route the 0 .0 .0 0.0.0.0 network is basically saying any traffic for any network send to 192.168.10.1 and you do that if uh, you don't want to drop packets on your router or if for example you're installing a router at a customer site and um, that you're connected to an ISP and you want the ISP to do all of the routing for you and you would just send traffic uh, out to that next hop. Static routing added by you, the administrator. In the administrative distances it's, it's preferred over any routing protocol. The reason is you as the administrator should know the best way to get anywhere so you override the protocols. You need to specify the network that you want to go to, the exit interface to send the traffic to, or the next hop. So here we've got a router with a few different subnets connected, or three routers, one, two, and three. I'm configuring a router one in order to get to the uh, networks that aren't connected. So they're the ones off router three, 172.16.1, 172.16.2 and off router 2, 192.168.4, 192.168.3 and I'll do two different ways of achieving this so in order to get to 192.168.4.0 and with the correct subnet mask I've put a next hop address in 192.168.2.2 you, your router must know how to get to that next hop and in this case we do because it's a connected network to get to the 3.0 network it's the same thing this time I've chosen an exit interface uh, you'll do you do that if you're not sure what the next hop is or for other administrative reasons to get to the 16.1.0 um, network we were going out via our serial 0 slash 0 and to get to the 16.2.0 network make sure you put the correct mask in also it's the same interface so that we've covered all of these four subnets off the two different routers with static routes I've issued a show IP route on my router here and you can see all of the connected interfaces on all of the static networks I've configured. If you ever get this wrong it's normally because you your router doesn't know what the next hop is or the exit interface is wrong or you've put the wrong subnet in. Here's a little thing though that I see loads of students getting caught out. They configure router 1 uh, to get to whatever the remote network is but the remote network needs to know how to get back so you're okay here because all of the routes are connected to router 3 and router 2 but if there was another router say router 5 connected off router 3 that router 5 would need to have the routes in order to get back to all of the non-connected networks so you would need to configure more static routes so router 2 has done a ping for 172.16.1.1 it has no clue how to get to that network it's not in the routing table and there's no static route and there's no default route if I'd issued the IP route 0 slash 0 slash 0 as I showed you earlier then it would just send all of the traffic out uh, to that next network so checklist make sure IP routing is enabled it is by default actually with the IP routing command on routers because that's what they're, they're there for Make sure the next hop address if used is reachable and up. The exit interface must be up and correctly addressed, so point-to-point -point links must be in the same subnet. An exit interface will negate the need for an ARP lookup, so there's no ARP packet sent out for every single um, packet. Uh, IP version 6, a real simple uh, example of put a simple network address on the point-to-point -point and a loopback uh, network on loopback 0 on the right hand router and here's the configuration what I suggest you do is get a couple of routers on GNS3 connected with a, a, an Ethernet cable and just add these IP addresses exactly as I've put them here and um, just have a bit of fun and do an IP version 6 ping I've, I've, oh yeah it's down on the bottom of uh, the last command ping IP version 6 you can't just issue the ping command you have to say ping IP version 6 and then the IP address. So I hope you've enjoyed that and I'll see you on the next lecture.
So here's our topology. We've got 192.168.1 network in the middle. Be dot one on this side, dot two this side. And I'm gonna I've created two loopback networks, or I'm going to a loopback interface on this side on a 10 network and a loopback zero on this side so we can do our testing really handy to use loopbacks 172.16.1.1 with a slash 20 mask so I've start. I've pressed the start button this is obviously GNS3 and we'll do some configurations so maximize that window maximize that window Change some preferences here. All right, so I've got a bit of a bigger interface. So I'm going to go to router one first. Comp T interface serial zero slash zero. The slash 30 mask, I know because I've done this lots of times, is 252, no shut. The other thing I wanted to do was add the loop back, LO0 I'm going to put for short, IP address, he says 10.1.1.1, all right. 10.1.1.1 space okay so we've got our loop back interface uh, I think that's right slash 26 is 192 yeah so we'll go over to router 2 now comp t Interface serial zero slash zero IP address one nine two dot one six eight dot one dot two No shit Interface loop back zero IP address one seven two dot sixteen dot one dot one What was the mass sorry? Twenty two four zero dot zero. All right, so let's go back to router one here. Show IP interface brief, and we can see our, our serial interface is up, our loopback is up, and I'm just going to ping across the Serial six eight dot one dot two. So that's all up and working. So what I'm going to do is ping the one seven two address, which won't work because the router doesn't know where that is. We haven't added any routing yet. So if I issue the show IP route command, all we've got here is a connected network for our ten and our one nine two. All right, so we need a static route to get us from here over to our 172 network. So comp T, so IP route, the network is 172.16. Yeah, 172.16 network. 0 .0, 240.0. Now we've got a couple of choices here. We can say exit interface or next top address. So forward in router's IP address, or we can choose an interface. On this side, we're going to do a next top. And the router must know where this next top is. And because it's connected to network, it, it does know. All right. 
So let's ping 172.16.1.1. Huzzah! Worked! And if I issue the show IP route, we've got a static route here for the 172 network. We'll go to router 2 and ping 10.1.1.1. No good because there is no route to that network. So we need to fix that. If I just check the mask slash 26. Okay. So conf t ip route 10.1.1.0192. So it's the 10.1.1.0 network with that mask. And I'm going to specify an exit interface. I'm going to end here and then I'm going to ping 10.1.1.1 and that's worked. Show IP route and we can see we've got a static route here directly connected serial 0 slash 0. So there's two different ways to do our static routes. I'm copying these same topologies before, so the 192.168.1 network here, and we've got the 10 network on router 1, and the 172 network off router 2. So I haven't reloaded the routers from the last lab because I wanted to show you just a quick way. I could just reload the router here if I wanted, but GNS3, well a GNS3 is a little bit funny doing that, you'd be okay with live equipment. But I just wanted to show you a quicker way of just moving on to another lab without doing all that. So we've got all the configuration here. What I want to do though is copy this. So highlight it and copy. Go to Conf T, type no, and then paste. And I'm going to do the same with router 2. Show run. And my IP route is here. Copy. Conf T. No. And this just wipes the command basically. Press enter. Now if you issue a show IP route here, you can see it, my static route has gone. So my IP address is here, you already know how to do that. And my loopback is here. So what I want to do is add my routing protocols. So we're going to do RIP. It's not in the CCNA, but it's easy to configure. Router, and if I just put question mark, you'll see our available protocols, BGP, ERGRP, ISIS, on-demand routing. So RIP. So we've dropped into config router mode now, so we can do our router configuration commands. Network 10, network, there we go, so there's our two uh, networks, and this won't work properly until we get over to router 2. Conf T, router rip, network, we'll add our, we have to add our network in the middle, otherwise they won't communicate, and for short, 172.16.0.0, end. Alright, so it should take a few seconds for this to work, because it's a pretty small network. Show IP route, alright. So our connected network won't show as a RIP network because it's connected, this one here. Our RIP network, you can see the key here is pretty handy actually to have. R is for RIP. And we can see we've got our 10 network and it's 
the administrative distance is 120 and it's one hop away this is the met metric used by rip show IP protocols is a very useful command our protocol is rip it gives you your uh, timers tells you what version of rip is sent been sent and received what networks you are routing for but you can see there's a slight problem here in that this is slash 26 and this is slash 20 so if I issue a show IP route here it's showing our slash 16 rip doesn't rip version 1 doesn't recognize a variable in subnet masking I think it's debug IP rip is it yeah all right so we'll see yes okay un all that stands for undebug all rip is sending an update it's broadcasting it and it's sending the network with a metric so you can't see any subnet mask information here so that's a problem we have so conf t router rip and all we need to do is turn on version 2 which does recognize I should just type it end there conf t router rip whoops router rip version 2 and now this might have dated the table as well show IP route all right There's something else I need to do but um, debug IP rip I'll just wait for a debug to be sent okay and um, it's just what I wanted to show you is our subnet mask is now being sent before it was just the network but now RIP version 2 sends a subnet mask information show IP protocols and you can see it's sending and receiving version 2 so there's one other thing we need to do RIP automatically summarizes networks at major network boundaries so once the TED network gets as far as the 192 network major network boundary will reduce it back down to a slash 8 so show IP protocols Oops, sorry show IP route is what I want and we can see we've got our 10 network here so uh, our 8 network sorry our 10 network with an 8 mask so we need to do something to change that so conf t router rip and this is the command no auto summary don't have to have that on but you do if you want to see the uh, variable length subnet mask if I issue the show IP protocols now, automatic summarization is not in effect on router one. It is in effect because I haven't added the command yet. Comp T router rip no auto end. Let's go back to router two. Show IP route. And there we go. We can see it has it hasn't cleared the old entry here. We can see our slash twenty cent six network is now showing. Show IP route and our one seven two sixteen slash twenty network is showing. That's the end of the lab. Okay, we have the same topology as our last couple of labs. I want to go on to our routers and just remove our last lab configuration. No router rip. No router rip, depending on where you live. 
you can leave it on there if you wish, it's just going to make it more confusing. So if I type end and then show IP protocols, there's nothing running. So this lab is EIGRP. So router e EIGRP. Now press question mark here because we have to have an autonomous system number and it has to match other routers that we wish to communicate using EIGRP. So I'm just going to choose a number here and then all I need to do is add our networks. one nine two dot one six eight dot one dot zero I can add I can add the no auto summary but I just I don't particularly want to go into that for this lab so router EIGRP has to be the same number so I'm going to add 10 network 192 and then network 172 you see we've got an EIGRP message here which tell us, tells us that there's an adjacency formed with the neighbour router. Show IP route. Alright so D indicated here is EIGRP. We've got our 172 network. It's going to null zero. Null zero means it's been trash or in the trash can it's in the attached network got a 172 our, our 10 network has been advertised and we can see uh, the 192 network again this is our connected network so the one we're more most interested in is looking at the 10 network the administrative distance is 90 the metric here as shown highlighted I'll go over to router 1 show IP route we should see the 172 network here all right so it's been uh, ERGRP summarizes the major network boundary so it's been summarized to slash 20 uh, slash 16 sorry we can add the no auto summary command if we wish I'm not going to do that at the moment show IP prot for protocols I'm just going to show you now ERGRP RG power 10. The network we are routing for is 10 and the 192 network. Actually, RGRP will work over a maximum path value. The uh, default is 4. You can issue um, a maximum path and then question mark command to see how many you can get up to. Alright, so that's all I wanted to show for ERGRP was the show IP protocols and the show IP route. Using the same topology, we probably stick to for most of the labs. I'm just going to get rid of the last part of the configuration I don't want. Now router E I G R P ten. So we're going to do OSPF for this lab. So router OSPF now we've got a number here although it doesn't really matter it's a lo locally significant number to indicate the OSPF process running on the router. One thing we do need to do differently is to add a wildcard mask and it has to match the, the network we're advertising so Uh, 192.168.1.0 Oops, and then we have to designate the area. I'm going to put everything in area 0 to keep it simple. Uh, what's the 26? So 192. So 
63 area 0 there's a whole bunch more you can do with OSPF but I'm not going to cover that today it could be the same number or a different number Okay, so we can see our SPFs loading. Network 172.16.1. Let me have a look again. 1.0. This is the wildcard mass, which I'll cover in a, another lecture. Area 0. Oops, sorry, it should have been 15, area 0. Okay, so the routes will have to load for the loopbacks, but we'll do a show IP route to see what we have already. Alright, so we can see the 10 network has been advertised. It's come via 192.168.1.1, that's how all the route is. And it's attached by a serial zero. Router one, show IP route. We see the 172 network has been advertised. We can see our administrative distance and our cost, and the same details as on the other router. I'll just issue the show IP protocols command, so you can see that. OSPF 10 networks we are routing for to here. You can see other information, the gateway, the distance, reference bandwidth. Now that's all I really wanted to show. Very basic RSPF lab. You know, there's a whole swathe of information that you can cover, but just for the primer course, that's enough for us to be going on with. Access lists, quite a tough subject if you add access list, subnetting and NAT together, they're probably the three toughest for any Cisco engineer. So we're going to have a high level overview and I'll show you some configuration examples. ACLs, they're used by routers and some switches and firewalls to restrict traffic. Now depending on which device you have, they can filter traffic based upon the source or destination MAC address, IP address, port number or service, for example ICMP, and even time of the day. We'll stick to access lists on Cisco routers because of the uh, the format of the course really, I don't want to make it too dif difficult or intensive. Order of operation, just so you know, a router will check traffic against an access list it will then make a routing decision, which kind of makes sense. If there's an access list blocking the actual traffic for whatever reason, you wouldn't route it first and then hit the access list because it's just a waste of processing power and a waste of time. Types of access list available, you've got the standard access list, an extended access list, and then a named access list, which can do either standard or extended commands. So here's a standard access list. The good news is it's pretty uh, basic, it's easy to configure. The only problem is it's got limited functionality because there's only uh, a few short parameters you can use and not a huge amount you can do with it. The router knows it's a standard access list because it has a number in front of it and the number is 1 to 99. There is an expanded range available if you need them, although it's very unlikely that you'd have more than 99 access lists. The only or the biggest drawback is it can only filter based upon the source address of the packet. This is the source IP address or the source network address. It can't filter on destination and it can't filter on ports or protocols. So this is why you're a little bit limited. Extended access list, a lot more functionality, but they can be quite 
uh, tricky to configure for beginners because there's so many different parameters and the more things you can configure obviously there's more you can get wrong the numbers are 100 to 199 there's an expanded range if you need to use them filters on source or destination port or protocol so pretty much anything you need to do a named access list is just handy for you as an administrator to remember what the access list does especially if you've got several on your uh, router so easy to manage you can configure a named access list standard or extended a few rules you need to be familiar with the router reads access list lines from the top all the way to the bottom so the more specific and if it's more likely to be captured say it's a massive network you would put that closer to the top to save the router having to configure it only one access list allowed per interface per direction one coming in and one going out there's an implicit or an invisible deny all at the bottom what this means is if you if your router gets to the bottom of the access list and it hasn't found a match it will automatically deny that traffic and this is how a lot of junior engineers get caught because it's invisible they can't see why the traffic's being blocked the router can't filter self-generated traffic so if you're trying to test it you can't use your router to test an access list that it's got on its own interface you can reuse the access list many times over as many as you like um, and the other thing is it must be applied somewhere in order for it to work people write out access lists and then they don't add it onto an interface and then wonder why it's not working you actually have to put it somewhere when you configure an access list we use wildcard masks and a wildcard mask is the inverse of a subnet mask and it tells the router what to match so here's an example 172.20.10.0 with a subnet mask the wildcard mask is the quickest way to work it out whatever whatever number you add to it has to come up to 255 in total so you can see 224 you add 31 to get 255 and obviously if it's zero you have to add 255 so here's an example of an access list a standard access list access dash list one I'm permitting a network and the network I'm permitting is 172.20.10 and then I'm putting the wildcard mask not the subnet mask the wildcard mask configure a standard access list there's an example there it's an access list number and then the address to be permitted or denied only a source address I've already told you that always refer to the question mark if you're stuck just type the question mark key press enter and the router will tell you what your available commands are at that particular phase of the um, command line extended access list these are your options here here's an example of an access list we're permitting a protocol TCP and it's always from and to so from host 172.16.1.1 to host 172.20.1.1 EQ is equals and SMTP is simple mail transfer protocol the next line is a TCP from a network to a host and then the next line is from a host to a host equals web traffic I don't expect you to understand all this uh, I just wanted it again just to give you an introduction and show you what the syntax looks like uh, access is 102 I've got the established keyword on here what that says is there has to be uh, it has to be a previously established connection so do you remember the SYN and SYNAC bits well this is what the router is looking for it's looking for the ACK bit i.e. you uh, I'm, ag I'm ag acknowledging that a, a session has already been instigated named access list slightly different syntax you type instead of access list you type the, the command IP access dash list and then it, you can see you can type standard or extended there there's other um, options which we won't look into so here's a um, example config access list and then the name block web press enter question mark here I've put so you can see the um, permutations and I've just written two simple lines here you can issue the do if you're not at the privilege command you can issue do and then uh, a show command in order to avoid you dropping back so you can see the access list is here it's also given it a sequence number uh, 30 20 15 10 
this is a you'll get these if you've got version iOS 12.4 or later you have to apply an access list I've told you this you have to apply to an interface or a port the command is IP access group if it's an interface or IP access class to a port don't know why they, they specify do two different commands to be honest but that's the way they want it here's an example for an interface in or out and here's an example for a port access class sequence numbers I mentioned 12.4 it this allows you to edit an access list you never used to be able to which was a real pain so now you can edit an access list you can add or remove lines so here's my access list and then I've issued a show IP access list and you could go in and delete lines and add them later on if you wish so a real basic overview please don't be intimidated by it I just want to do give you just a little bit of an understanding of, of how they work and what the rules are user authentication so authentication methods there's, there's quite a few available actually you got PKI which we're going to discuss Kerberos AAA 802.1x for wireless wireless has actually gone out of the CCNA exam now there is a little bit in the CCMP switch multi-factor single sign-on so authenticating users for this certainly for the CCNA you only really need a little bit of an overview of this but I just I just wanted to fill in some of the gaps uh, various methods you obviously got username and password a, something called a token generator you get these a lot now for um, online banking where you put your card in and it generates a code fingerprint readers or a combination So the authentication process, it, it always seems simple to the user, it normally does, but the process behind it can obviously be complicated. Add to this the fact that credentials must be sent securely, they can be hashed. Uh, you've got MD5, which we mentioned earlier, secure hash algorithm. Uh, case in point, hashing, there's no actual password sent. What, what is sent is a hashed value, such as the one in this example here. And in the diagram at the bottom the server holds the credentials and compares the credentials to the received hash and it authenticates or doesn't authenticate you may have heard of pki before i'm not really sure it's covered it's, well it's certainly not covered in the ccna i've never heard of any questions on this but it's um, to do with digital certificates so be can be a fairly complicated process it uses a concept of a certificate authority the CA confirms the identity of every user and every user in the organization trusts the CA. Uses um, symmetric encryption, so it's the same key for encryption. Asymmetric, which uses different keys to encrypt and decrypt. Uh, certificates do expire and then a fresh one is issued. Kerberos is a one-time network authentication protocol. What happens is you authenticate one time and you get access to all network resources, servers and whatever else. It consists of the key distribution center, the authentication service, which does the actual authentication, and the ticket granting service, which provides the user with tickets. A, a AAA you may well have heard of. In your travels, it verifies the user identity, which is the authentication provides access to resources which is the authorization and logs user access which is the accounting part this is the AAA uh, allows authentication via a single username and password to whatever resources uh, you've got radius and tacax that can be used with this AAA with radius and tacax uh, radius stands for remote dialing user service this receives and verifies user credentials TAC Access Terminal Access Controller, Access Control System. You can see why people uh, reduce this now just to the first letters. It's a remote authentication protocol. Just to compare and contrast, if you're ever asked, I, I doubt if 
we go into this detail in the CCLA. Eto two dot one X. I mentioned before it addresses wireless security threats, so you won't you won't be looking at this for the CCNA. For example, a rogue, a rogue wireless access point threats and uh, MAC address spoofing also. 802.1x offers port-based authentication to whatever port you're eventually connecting to on your switch. It allows users and devices to authenticate using EAP or RADIUS. The, authentic the authentication process, 802.1x authenticates users before they're receiving the network accident um, access. You just got a few terms you need to be familiar with just for your own smoking like I said rather than any examinations is supplicant the authenticator and the authentication server PAP and CHAP use prim primarily on point-to-point -point connections with PPP they it uses usernames and passwords for authentication and both have to match in order for the link to come up Password authentication protocol sends passwords in clear text. Uh, it's a common exam question that is actually. And then CHAP uses encryption and a three-way handshake. For CHAP, the server sends a challenge, the client responds with a password hash, and then the server checks the hash and then grants access, obviously if they match. Uh, Multi-factor multi authentication uses more than one method. Often it's something you know, so it's just username and password, something you have like a smart card or a token and something you are like a voice recognition or biometrics. Different types of token available obviously. The single sign on, an example is um, a user just has to authenticate one time to get access to all the resources. We've got a Kerberos or a third party solution. Works very well with cloud solutions, software as a service. And an example is obviously Google Documents, Calendar, Email and all the other resources. Alright, so that's the end. Thanks for listening. Firewalls and DMZs. So firewall functionality, I'm sure you've heard of firewalls before. Basically it's a security device that will filter traffic that is not permitted, usually coming into the network. We normally position a firewall at the network entry point or between critical modules, just depending on your needs. I've actually seen instances where you have a firewall outside your main network router and then another one behind. So you've got like two, two levels of protection. Most operate at layer 4 but some up to layer 7 uh, which is the application layer. Many create su secure tunnels between other firewalls. You can have a routed mode uh, so it runs routing protocols and IP addresses or transparent mode. This is where it's operated as a layer 2 device and it's actually transparent to users. Software firewalls normally these are installed on the user's PC. So you've got protection for your operating system rather than a network layer protection. It doesn't protect your network. Um, you get a free firewall with a lot of um, operating systems available on the market. Hardware firewalls normally installed in your rack along with your switches and routers. Increase security because the device is purpose built to provide security. Cost can be significant, very significant in fact. You can have a virtual firewall. This partitions a hardwall, uh, hardware firewall into multiple logical devices. Each device can have its own configuration. Each context has its own or configuration has its own or can have its own security policy, interfaces, access lists, administrators. And it doesn't usually support IPsec, VPNs or routing protocols. So these are your virtual private networks. Stateful inspection. So stateless is packet filtering, is data going uh, in and out, has no relationship. Stateful means it's tracking a data flow, and I mentioned earlier on, your data flow is tracking everything, your source of destination IP and port number, and it's a flow of traffic that's going backwards and forwards. Responses associated with the connection are automatically permitted. 
There's no return traffic rules required as the firewall automatically creates the rules. Uh, firewall rules, all traffic is blocked by default. Rules are created in order to permit, permit traffic. Same as access list, it starts at the top and works its way down with an implicit deny at the bottom. Looks at source or destination, port number, application, even packet size and time of the day. Zone based firewalls, I'm sure you've heard of DM, DMZs before. It's an evolution from a traditional interface based firewall and it creates zones. These are called security zones. Each interface then is placed into a certain zone. Zones can be trusted, untrusted or a DMZ, a demilitarized zone. They then create unidirectional zone pairs as you can see in the diagram. These zone pairs enforce whatever policies you've put into place that could be modular, flexible or granular. So your DMZ is not actually on the inside of your network so that gives you another level of security if you like. Uh, accessible by both people on the inside and outside of your network. Uh, the inside of your network is still protected by strict security policies and on your DMZ you could have things like your corporate email that um, customers can visit and that kind of thing. Alright so that's the end of the presentation, thanks for listening. Tunneling, encryption and remote access. So tunneling and encryption, it basically allows secure external access to an internal network. I've mentioned uh, before that you can have remote workers and home workers. Often they're connecting over the internet using a broadband network rather than a dedicated line from a, a service provider which tends to be more expensive. Often used with VPNs, virtual private networks and a VPN concentrator. These are used with SSL for security, PPTP, L2TP and IPsec which we'll discuss. So secure sockets layer a VPN. It's a common way to set up a secure connection. It uses TCP port 443. You can set up a VPN tunnel between two points. Not likely to be blocked uh, along the way by firewalls and it allows the users to authenticate and also the data to be encrypted. A few different modes available, clientless access which uses a web browser supporting SSL, a thin client which is a little Java applet so performing port forwarding, full tunnel access where you have to download a SSL VPN client. PPTP point to point tunneling protocol it creates a tunnel only, it doesn't perform any encryption or decryption so you actually have to bundle with it or use with it a, an encryption protocol of some sort. It uses authentication methods such as MSCHAP, EAP TLS, PPTP, uh, sorry PPTP clients, they're integrated into most operating systems. Here's an example of one. A layer 2 tunneling, tunneling protocol, which is usually referred to as L2TP, succeeded PPTP. This uses UDP port 1701 and it uses other protocols for encryption, for example IPsec. Again, it's built into many operating systems. IPsec, I'm sure you've heard of, is basically not one protocol, it's actually a whole suite of protocols that work together. VPNs connect their devices which do not share a physical cable, which I mentioned earlier. IPsec protects the data passing along the connection. Two types of VPN you can use, common exam question actually this, site to site, it's a permanent secured connection, and a remote access, and this is created as and when you need to get the access. IPsec gives you data origin authentication, data integrity, data confidentiality, and anti-reply. This protect, protects against denial of service attacks. The IPsec VPN tunnel is built in two phases. ISA KMP, IKE negotiation, which is a mouthful. Data transmission. 
The entire process will have a limited uh, lifetime before rerun. Just looking at remote access now briefly, remote access is a transparent access to the network for the home or the mobile workforce. They connect as if they're actually at the office, so it's transparent to the user usually. Typically requires uh, voice support, uh, VPN, uh, you can have to support high or low traffic volume depending if you're doing voice and video and that kind of stuff. It's a permanent connection uh, and you normally have to support type of flows. I've covered flows earlier also. Security issues, obviously connecting over the public internet has got us a whole bunch of issues. Risk of spoofing which is another device pretending to be something, another device it isn't. Risk to secure and confidential data and company secrets. Common remote access protocols include RAS, Remote Access Server, PPP, PPP over Ethernet, RDP, ICA, SSH. Just look at some of these. Remote Access Server is actually a legacy technology. Uh, uses dial-up over the public switch telephone network, which is your phone line. Created by Microsoft, but it actually became generic. PPP is a layer 2 protocol you'll be using a lot as a Cisco engineer or certainly preparing for your exams. You've got authentication, compression, error detection, multi-links. So a pretty robust protocol and it's very popular. Uh, over Ethernet it's used over DSL lines. It can set up a connection, authenticate it and build a circuit. So you can see why it's so popular. Uh, no need for a router because it's layer 2. RDP, you may well have heard of, you certainly will do if you do help desk stuff, gives you remote access to control an enterprise system. It allows desktop sharing over TCP port 3389, built into Windows, works with other operating systems also. And we've got ICA, Independent Computing Architecture. This is actually from Citrix Systems. Allows users to access the server or services, used by non-Citrix systems also actually. With it, you get increased administration, centralized management, reduced client footprint. Secure Shell, very handy to use and know about, offers communication services to a remote device. Uh, so pretty much a replacement for Telnet or a secure replacement. Basic way to give remote access and it's normally command line access you get. Data is encrypted and I've mentioned you get a command line. Download Putty. Have a search on Google for Putty. Uh, I think it's putty.org and you can download Putty. So that's the end. Thanks for listening. Security appliances. Some different types of security appliance. We're just going to have a little look at these so you're familiar with the terminology if you have a conversation with other network engineers or in an interview. IDS, IPS, vulnerability scanners, honey pots, and honey nets. Quite a short presentation, this. So, intrusion detection and intrusion prevention systems, they perform traffic inspection, detect and authorize traffic. They can be hardware, software or virtualized. The intrusion detection system receives a copy of the traffic to analyze. The IPS is actually placed inside the flow of traffic and the packets uh, progress through the device. Uh, firewalls block traffic that do not look inside the network for actual issues. So hopefully you'll have an appreciation of the differences between those devices. The categories you can have are behavior based, so it looks at uh, traffic and compares it to the baseline and looks for discrepancies. Signature based, it inspects the packets for malicious signatures. Network based, monitors the entire network for suspicious activities. Host based is installed on host, uh, obviously. The intrusion detection system is an older technology now, so phased out by a lot of mainstream providers. You can have promiscuous mode. This sends all the traffic to a CPU to analyze. Logs, alarms, alerts, or SNMP traps. 
can be used in the DMZ or subnet where firewalls are located. Placing the sensor outside the firewall, inside the firewall, it could be on the same VLAN as the DMZ or the server farm. Promiscuous mode has no effect on the network. Span basically means a, every, a copy of every frame that comes into a switch is sent out on another port. And on that port you can connect your device to, uh, de to analyse the traffic. Vulnerability scanners, they're non-intrusive tests to detect uh, security or privacy breaches. Normally if you hire a security consultant they will do some intrusion uh, detection and uh, detect for vulnerabilities and open ports on your network. So identify network devices, uh, network topology, scan for open ports, you can normally uh, download software that will do all that for you. Perform tests from the inside and outside, checking for vulnerabilities and then all all the results you give, you're given in a final report. Uh, an example is Nessus, a free and commercial vulnerability scanner. I actually went to the website, I couldn't see a free version. I think there's, there's a free trial, uh, but not, not, not an actual free version. But yeah, you can check for yourself. Honey pots and honey nets. Honey pots allow you to attract possible attackers. Attacks are restricted to an isolated environment. Analyze the attacker's behavior and gather information. Most modern attacks use automated scripts. And a honey net is purely a series of honey pots. All right, so hope you hopefully that's given you a little bit of an overview of the common devices and the differences. I will see you on the next presentation. Securing the switch. So switch security, we'll look at physical access, remotely accessing it, securing the switch configuration, securing switch ports, physical access, a lot of this actually applies, and a few of these slides actually apply to Cisco routers as well, because switches run iOS, the same as routers run iOS. This is all common sense to be honest. However, I've attended many uh, businesses, especially the smaller businesses where they just put their networking equipment on the top of somebody's desk or under somebody's desk or in a spare little alcove with no door on. And uh, these businesses, like most other businesses, their entire business runs on servers and configuration files. And um, if they lost this data, they'd probably go bust. It's all the financial data and the transactions and invoicing. So, yeah, I say it's a no-brainer, but a lot of people don't do it. So, sh at the very least, the equipment should be accessed via lock and key or a key code in a suitably cooled room or air-conditioned room. Access restricted to IT staff only. Ideally, some sort of closed-circuit cameras. I know, obviously, every business is different. Ideally with a personalised swipe card and access with logging. Again, it depends on the scale of the business and what their needs are. So remote access, Telnet access is actually disabled. You can't turn it to a device until somebody actually enables it, which is obviously a good step for security. Ideally, just enable secure shell access only, which requires a security image on your device. Uh, logins, you can actually give individual logins uh, on devices. Here's an example of uh, how to permit only SSH into a switch, same for routers as well. Transport input, you can have all known SSH or Telnet and the correct answer is SSH if you just want to permit SSH. And here's an example, and well just underneath that, it's uh, my PC, I'm trying to Telnet to a device and it uh, is closed because um, Telnet isn't allowed. Telnet access, you just need to set a username and password or put a password under the Telnet line, the VTY lines. Here's an example of me putting a password directly under the VTY lines.
here's an example of me adding a username and a password and then I add the login local command which tells the router to inspect the username and password properties to authenticate people. To enable SSH you have to add a host name, a domain name, the actual configuration files you can easily get off the Cisco website if you search as well. Set a time out and retries if you wish and a crypto key. Here's an example of the configuration commands. There's others available. This is the most basic configuration you can put in to enable SSH. All right, secure switch configuration. This is basically to stop somebody going into config mode. Uh, we've covered this earlier, but I've put enable secret Cisco. Then I've logged in underneath to the switch, typed enable, and I've been prompted for the password and I've had to enter that in order to get in. Individual username and passwords. You can have different username and passwords for different people. You can actually allocate different uh, levels of uh, login access uh, to these um, accounts as well. It's a little bit tricky unless you start using uh, different servers. If you just stick to Cisco iOS commands, it can be a bit fiddly and a, a bit of a pain. Access levels per users. This username security, privilege level four, and I'm assigning some privilege level commands here, ping and show run are the allowed commands for level 4. Securing the console ports, line console 0 and then you can add a password to the console port. An alternative way is to do the login local and have a username and password. I've added exec timeout which basically means after 2 minutes 30 seconds it locks out, it locks out the connection and you'd have to reconnect. Updating the iOS, it does fix bugs and closes security vulnerabilities, upgrades and enhances iOS features, you can issue a show run which is some of the output underneath here which shows you, which will show you iOS. If you're in a large enterprise network you normally have to, you normally have a support contract with Cisco because sometimes updating the iOS can introduce new problems dependent on your hardware and configuration commands so larger companies generally get an, um, an assessment done before they update the iOS. Changing the native VLAN, I've mentioned earlier the native VLAN is used to carry default traffic types such as your VTP and DTP traffic, dynamic trunking protocol, VLAN trunking protocol and um, it should say CDP actually, I wonder what that DCP meant. CDP traffic. Default native VLAN is always VLAN 1 and hackers can easily gain access to VLAN 1 and thus any device on it. So don't use VLAN 1 for hosts. I've issued a show VLAN brief on a switch and it's shown that all ports are in VLAN 1. Uh, default management VLAN, so this is connecting to the switch remotely to do some configuration. I've created uh, an interface VLAN 10 it's called a switch virtual interface and added an IP address to VLAN 10. So this is this has set the IP address for from us to turn it into the switch 2192.168.1.1. Shutting down unused ports. Normally if you attach a cable to a switch port, it will come up and attempt to start passing traffic. Well, it's not a good idea, so you want to shut down any unused ports. You can use the interface range command if it's available on your version of iOS. I've put interface range fast ethernet 0 slash 10 to 20 and issue the shutdown command. Turn off CDP, Cisco Discovery Protocol. I think we, we do cover this in the lecture, I think it's later on if I haven't covered it already. So CDP lets you get information from attached devices, anything that's attached to a serial or Ethernet interface and it shows your iOS and a lot of other features. So if you want to turn it off, normally on an edge device that's going outside of your network, no CDP run. If you want to turn it off the interface, you type no CDP enable. Add a banner message, doesn't do much for security but it just flags up a message of your choice when somebody logs into the device. I've gone into config mode and issued banner MOTD 
then you have to issue a delimiting character and what that means is the next time you type that character it means your message is ended so I've chosen the close brackets put the message in and then issued the close brackets com um, command there and you can see I've logged in at the bottom and it says keep out secure network VTP is VLAN trunking protocol used for trunking on a switch network you you're best served to add a password to VTP so it confirms all the updates are actually legitimate so VTP password and I've added a password called Cisco switchboard security is a real big topic for CCNA you must know this in pretty good detail ports can filter based upon MAC address or you can limit the number of MAC addresses that are connecting through a particular port you can also tell the port to dynamically learn whichever device is attached and secure the MAC address. The actions the port can take place if there's a violation are protect, that means discard frames with, a, with an unknown MAC address, shut down, put the port into an error disabled state and the administra administrator has to recover it, or restrict, which means drop frames when the number of MAC addresses is reached. Configuration example, uh, you've started off at the top, you have to issue switch port mode access, you have to tell the switch what type of port it is, so this is layer 2, command, switch port port security, and then I've added MAC address hard coded, so only that MAC address will be allowed through that switch. Another configuration man command underneath is switch port port security maximum 5, that means only allow 5 MAC addresses to be learned on this interface. The show port dash security command will show you an overview of all of the port security settings. If you want to drill down to the interface, it's show port dash security and then the interface and name and number. Sticky MAC address means the MAC addresses learned are saved into the running configuration. Once you reboot the switch, they will be forgotten, so it would have to relearn 10 MAC, up to 10 MAC addresses. And you can see the maximum here is 10. I've issued a new set of commands underneath here. Learn a maximum number of 10. Sticky, make them sticky and put them in the running config. And I've put hard-coded two MAC addresses here also. All right, so that's the end of Switch Security. Thanks for listening. But the same topology as before, uh, I've taken off all the routing. So what I need to do is, you can add the IP addresses. What I need to do is have some way for the loopback networks to be reached from either side. So the easiest way to do this is with the static default route. And all you do is add all the zeros, all the zeros, and then specify an exit interface. So that's saying all traffic for all networks go out via serial zero slash zero. And I'm just going to add the same. So the next thing I'll do is just test a ping. Ping uh, 10.1.1.1. So that's worked. So I'm happy now I can reach, and I'll, I'll do the same this side actually. Ping 172.16.1.1. And that's working. I'm going to, going to add an IP access list now, standard access list, to stop traffic from this loopback host address here from reaching the serial interface. So, comp t access dash list. Question mark, I've got all these numbers. I'm going to choose number one because that's in the standard group, uh, standard range. And then if I hit question mark, I can permit or deny. I'm going to deny and then hit question mark. I can have a host name, a host or anything. I'm going to deny host 172.16.1.1. Next thing, I have to permit everything else because of the implicit deny. 
and you do that with permit any. So any anything else can go through the router. The other step is to apply it to an interface of some sort or a port. I want to add it to interface serial 0 slash 0 and I, I use the IP access group 1 and then I can choose in or out. I'm going to choose in. So let's go over to router 2 now. Let me ping across the loopback. In fact, I'll ping 10.1.1.1. Okay, that's worked. In order to test the access list, I need to do an extended ping. So I'm going to hit ping, press enter. The target IP address is 10.1.1.1 again. And then I want to get to extended commands and click yes. I want to source it from the blocked IP address 172.16.1.1. Just press enter a few times and I'm getting a U message here, unreachable. That's exactly what I want. And then if I go back to router 1, show IP access, access lists. I can see I've got a deny here. There are matches. Some packets have been permitted, but there are matches on the access list, uh, and you can see it's being blocked. If it issue a show run interface serial zero slash zero, you can see that my IP access group has been added to that interface, and that's what's blocking the traffic. That's the end of the lab. Same network as before, uh, I've got an access list on from the last lab, so I need to remove that and I'm going to leave the static route on. No access list 1, int serial 0 slash 0, no IP 1 in. Alright, so I'm going to add a, an access list and I want to prevent Talnet from our loop uh, from our router 2. First thing I need to enable Talnet, so comp t, in fact, line vty 0 space 933, which is what I've got on the 903, sorry. Password Cisco login, so that's Talnet enabled. Next thing is start my extended access list. Access list, if I do question mark, you can see the range is available. 100 is the first number available for extended. So what are we going to do? I'm going to deny. Next, our options are a whole bunch of stuff. I'm going to deny a TCP protocol. Okay, from the source address 192.168.1.2. Oops, sorry, it needs to be host because it's not a network. 192.168.1.2. So deny TCP from host 192.168.1.2 to uh, anywhere. I'm going to deny it to, yeah, I'm going to deny it to anywhere. You play you play with the different options when you do this lab a few times. Deny anywhere. And my choices are, well, all these choices here, but I'm going to do a match given a port number. So any equals, if I hit question mark again, you can see all the options. I can stick the port number in, or I can just write Telnet. So access list 100 deny TCP from host 192168 to anywhere if it's coming in using the Talnet port. The other thing I must do is permit all other IP traffic. P permit IP 
from anywhere to anywhere. That's how you do it for an extended access list. I need to apply it to an interface. Interface serial zero slash zero, zero slash zero. IP access 100 in. All right, so what I'm going to do now, I should have really tested Talnet before I um, added the access list. The remiss of me, Talnet 192.168.1.1. All right, destination and reachable, but we still need some way of testing Talnet. There's a couple of ways actually. I could Talnet, let's see if this works, 10.1.1.1. It won't have that, okay. Tal, if I do a slash and then Talnet um, 192.168.1.1. There we go. I'm looking for this source interface source interface but question mark and it's going to be loop loop back zero this isn't blocked it's sourcing the talnet from uh, 172.16.1.1 and there we go that's worked i'm going to put in the password of cisco and i'm in on router one so that's just proved off the access list. If we go back to router one, show IP access lists, and you can see we've got matches here and we've got permits here. Same topology as usual, we're going to be testing a named access list. I've actually left our access list on from the last lab, so I'm going to remove that. No access list 100, whoops. And you have to take it off the interface as well. Alright, so we're going to have another access list on here. This time the syntax is slightly different. IP access list, and then you have to say extended or standard. Uh, I'll have an extended one, please. IP access list is extended, and then give it a name if you want. Block ICMP. You have to get the case right if you're going to reference this access list later. You can't have gaps, but you can have dashes or underscores for names. Now you see the syntax has changed, config, extended, named access list, but the, the rest of the syntax now will be familiar to you. I can permit or deny, I'm going to deny something, and I'm going to deny ICMP, which uh, our ping uses, I'm going to deny ICMP from um, host 192.168.1.2 and I'm going to deny it to host 10.1.1.1 so I'm going to deny RCMP if it's coming from 192.168.1.2 and if the destination is 1.1.1.1 10.1.1.1 sorry I need to permit all of the traffic, so I'm going to permit ICMP any any, and I'm going to permit IP any any. So that'll allow any other ping traffic to work and any other IP traffic to work. From here, I can go to interface serial zero slash zero, IP access group. Uh, what was the name? Block ICMP. In. All right, so 
the theory now is we should be able to go into router 2 and I should be able to ping 192.168.1.1 yeah but I should not be able to ping and there we go it's blocked by the access list real simple lab show IP access lists and you can see the matches if you wish all right, Simple Lab, thanks for watching. Network Address Translation. So we're going to look at NAT. Basically, it's a means of conver conserving IP addresses. I talked about earlier with the IP addressing section how we were basically running out, rapidly running out of IP addresses. So with VLSM, public and private IP addressing and NAT, um, we just found ways to conserve IP addresses. It enables private hosts to access the internet or public networks. I'll give you the range of private addresses before. You could actually NAT with public to public address if you needed to for any reason, but it's nearly always used for private addresses, for example 172.16, to get out to the internet. It masks your internal IP addresses as well, so it does offer some security protection. You do require a translation from the private to the public address, so you're going to need a router or a firewall to do that. Uh, there's a few RFCs. Have a look at RFC 2663 if you wish. All right, so you have to tell the router what are the inside interfaces and the outside interfaces. There's a few ways to configure that depending on your requirements. Three main ways, really. The router or the firewall converts the packet headers and tracks the session so it knows which are the best, the destination and replies, the insides and outsides. A few bits from that terminology you need to be aware of because they can be tested. The inside interface is the border of the domain you control. The inside local address is the IP address of the host inside your network. It's normally a private address. The inside global address is the internal address as it appears to the outside world. The outside interface is the border of the domain you control. You don't control, sorry. So that's going out to your ISP normally. The outside local address is the IP of the outside host as it, as it appears to the inside. The outside global address is the legal and routable IP address. Configuring that in four steps usually, designate the inside and outside interfaces, Add an access list to, to tell the router or firewall which traffic you want to be natted. You create a pool of global addresses that you can use and then you configure NAT with the IP NAT inside source list and then reference the access list number. So here's an example. I've got my IP NAT inside and outside interfaces, fast ethernet and serial. I've added an access list remark. That's just a a remark that uh, tells the administrator what's going on. It doesn't actually constitute part of the configuration. I'm permitting 10.5.5.0 and added a wildcard mask. That's designated the subnet. And I've issued the pool. It's 150.1.1.3 and it ends at .6. So I've only got three usable addresses by the looks of it for that pool. And then uh, the last command is IP NAT inside source list 100 pool and then the pool name. Showing the translations that are going on and you can see my internal address has been uh, natted to an outside address. Not sure where I got that actual configuration from because it's uh, natting to a 200 address. So I'd have to um, do, a, do a lab and check that up. Check that up. But the main thing is look at the show IP NAT translations command when you come to do your own labs. There you go, that's where I've got the 200 address from. I think I've used a configuration from another lab. 
So static NAT, the one address is swapped for another address. Useful if you've got a web server or a file transfer server, FTP server, and you need to have a static address. Here's the configuration, IP NAT inside source, static, and then my internal address for my external address. Dynamic NAT is for a group or pool of addresses. Obviously handy if you've got a large number of addresses on the inside that needs to get outside. My pool here has got 100, sorry 200, ended in 1, and the last usable address is ended in 16. The access list tells the router what um, IP addresses to NAT. NAT overload or port address translation or PAT saves the cost to buy multiple public addresses. It swaps IP addresses for port numbers. So you can see it saves a lot of money. It's the same configuration, however, at the end of the pool name, you add the word overload. All right, so that's just an overview on NAT. I recommend you do a few NAT labs to become familiar with all of the commands and show commands. So this is our usual network. We've got a fast ethernet connection between the two devices here. I just want to issue the CDP commands. So I'll just get up router one. You, the IP address is already configured. So show CDP neighbor, neighbors. Notice it's the USA spelling, so there's no U. So I can see I've got router 2 connected over fast ethernet. It's got a hold time for the CDP packet. Uh, capability is router switch. I'll have to check what the I stands for actually. The platform, the port ID. So you've got some basic information. Oh, it's tidy here actually. It runs, IG, uh, runs IGMP. The next thing you can issue the show CDP neighbor detail. This gives you a lot more information. This is why it's a little bit of a security risk if it's on the edge of your network. So it tells you the IP address, again the capabilities, which version of software it's running. A duplex is half for some reason. I'd have to check that. So you get a lot more information. So you need to know how to turn it off. If I go over to router 2, uh, we're going to tea, interface fast 0 slash 0. No CDP, whoops, no CDP. Enable if you want to do it on the interface. If you want to turn it off the entire device, it's no CDP run. Now, if I go back to router 1, now I'm not sure how long it stores the. Um, CDP information, show CDP neighbor, and if I can, can I clear CDP, yeah, clear CDP counters, clear CDP to table, and then show CDP neighbors, see if it works, yeah, you can't see any CDP neighbors, because it's been turned off on the other device. I think the um, last command is maybe show CDP, just general CDP information, and then you can dig into the other subcommands if you so wish. But um, the lab was just to show you how to check CDP and then turn it off. Logging and NTP network time protocol. So syslogging is actually a standard for computer message logging. It's not just a, a Cisco facility. It runs on common devices. Can also run on printers and obviously Cisco routers. 
daemon or a service which listens for messages. It can't actually be used to poll devices, so it's not. It doesn't actively scan or poll for messages. That would be something like S S N S N M P that does that. Carried over UDP, so you could lose packets if it's a busy network. It doesn't offer any authentication either, so possible security loophole flaw if that's uh, of concern to your network. There's different severity levels. Um, you need to be aware of them. For the Cisco CCNA exam, you actually need to be able to name every one of them. I've listed them here. It goes from emergencies uh, all the way down to just general debugging information, which is the, the lowest level. Cisco, you use the command logging on to enable login, and it's actually on by default, so you don't have to turn it on. You can obviously turn it off with the logging off command. You can specify the severity level with the logging trap and then the severity message. You can also issue a show logging command to see uh, the level that's configured. Specify the destination for the log messages. It could be another router or a server. And add the origin address if you wish. So here's a sample configuration. Logging on is actually already on. Logging trap informational, and then I've, just, I've specified where the logs need to be sent. Here's the show logging output. The router clock is quite important to have actually because it gives us an accurate timestamp for when the logging messages occur or when the incidents occur on the router or switch. You can use a clock set command. I keep using the question mark with this because it's quite easy then to fill in all the different requirements for the hours, minutes, seconds and days and year. If you know the command off the top of your head you can just write it out in full without hitting the question mark. And then a show clock will show you the clock and the whatever time zone you're, you've set the clock for. NTP, it's been on operation for quite a while now. It's basically used to synchronize device clocks over the internet so all the devices that have the exact same time accurate to it within a few milliseconds. It works on your UDP and you designate strata. This tells you how far away you are from the master source. Stratum Zero is the most accurate. It's an atomic or GPS clock known as a reference clock. And then different servers poll those. You can have a server poll in that and a server poll in the server that polls that and so on. So on Cisco devices, you can issue the NTP server command and then the IP address. You can also back you can also back it up with a secondary NTP clock if you want. Uh, show NTP associations will show you the association with your clock when it's polled, and you can show the NTP status to see your current configuration and reference times. Set the time zone. I've put the commands here in case you do want to set the time zone manually. Uh, again, use the question mark, so clock time zone, and then just check to see which time zones is um, suitable for your device, wherever you are. Alright, so that's just an introduction. It's a small topic, but it's still quite an important one. So um, do, please do test the commands out when you get access to live equipment. SNMP, Simple Network Management Protocol, which we've alluded to in earlier lectures, works at the application layer, uses UD port, UDP ports 161 and 162. It's there to facilitate the exchange of information between network devices. A network that's run in SNMP consists of a management system or systems, agents and managed devices. SNMP agents, the, the little bits of software that reside on each managed device and every device that you want to manage needs to have this little piece of code on it. Uh, vendors often release, they've got their own programming team that release the codes that you can download and install on the devices. Not all devices are manageable, 
some um, manufacturers, really small ones, don't release the software that can uh, work with SNMP. It translates performance information into events or traps. This could be any number of things such as high CPU, a certain amount of memory being used on a server, uh, a problem with a port or interface, a whole bunch of things. The agents translate the traps into a readable format for the management station. The SNMP agents use GET requests that transport the data and uh, agents capture the data from management information bases. These are referred to as MIBs usually, just for brevity. So MIBs describe the structure of the management of data of a device subsystem. Normally in large companies you actually have an entire team that deals with SNMP for their devices. That's certainly the case for Cisco because I used to uh, support and be part of the SNMP support. Here's a sample uh, GUI interface, graphical user interface for a SNMP piece, uh, piece of software or service from SolarWinds. Worth checking out if you're interested in learning about SNMP and adding it to your network. But it gives you a real handy dashboard. You can see CPU load, memory use, packet loss and that kind of thing. And you get um, reports in different formats that you can track over time. The agent process. Managed device such as the router or switch or server is accessed via the agent. The managed device collects and stores this management information. Sends it to in a readable format to the NMS, the network management station, normally a PC or server. Here's uh, an output uh, from a Cisco device running the Cisco SNMP software actually. You can, uh, what it does quite handily is give you a graphical uh, output representation of the entire device, also the ports on the device, and it can colour them as to whether or not they're up or down. At the bottom you've got two power systems there, redundant power supply and a, uh, the main power supply which has got the green lights on. And you can actually go, using SNMP, you can go to the devices and you can actually configure individual ports, which is really handy. You can look at the port statistics, you can open the port, shut the port, um, do a whole bunch of stuff. So, very powerful. SNMP commands, the monitored with the read, write and trap commands. You probably won't be issuing these if you're using a graphical SNMP management station. It will do that for you with your um, menus and, command, and, and menu systems and point and click. Read command used to monitor devices, the write command controls the devices, the trap command is used for reporting. Alright, example is an interface going down. Traps are unacknowledged. Remember we're using UDP here. SNMP informs is something slightly different. It's a trap that includes a confirmation of receipt from the manager. So the problem is it does consume more memory and bandwidth because it's waiting for an acknowledgement. Three versions of SNMP. Version 1 is still actually the currently used version. Version 2 is an improvement. And version 3 provides authentication, encryption and message integrity. Alright, so I hope that's given you a good overview of SNMP. Thanks for listening. DHCP 101 Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol Basically it saves us as network administrators manually configuring IP information on tens, hundreds or thousands of hosts on our network. Considerations How many end, end systems do you have? Uh, obviously your personal choice but if you've got less than 50 you could consider just static addressing if they're keeping the same address regularly. If you've got more than that, obviously consider DHCP, but it's your call. You could use DHCP for five systems if you like. Security considerations. Can a user plug into the network and obtain an IP address? That's a choice for part of your security evaluation. What's the likelihood of devices having to obtain another IP address at any point, a different IP address? 
uh, do you have high availability demands on the network? So static, static addressing normally used on your corporate servers, they basically have to keep the same address. They're never going to request um, a different address. Network management workstations where the SNMP uh, devices report to. Network printers, public access servers, your wide area network devices, especially your routers, firewalls, whatever else you choose obviously. Static versus uh, dynamic. Manual entry for IP, subnet mask, gateway, DNS servers and NTP servers. So there's a lot to put in. Bootstrap protocol was actually uh, created in 1993 which helped, partly helped the issue of having to assign all this information to devices. However, it didn't do everything uh, you needed and it couldn't tell when the device left the network. There was no sign off. Uh, BootP, as I said, couldn't configure all of the parameters that we needed. So it was replaced by DHCP. It's a four step process, which you can see in the diagram a discover an offer, a request, and then an, an acknowledgement. DHCP discoveries when the device boots are broadcast for an, uh, an address. This is where you've normally on the PC, if it's Windows, clicked on Obtain Advice by DHCP. An offer, the server broadcasts the offer on UDP port 68. The request, the device has to officially uh, request the IP information that it's been offered by the server and then the, it has to wait for the acknowledgement from the DHCP server. So this is the four steps. Reservations. These are usually addresses allocated from a pool of addresses which are expirable. You can configure them not to expire, it's your choice. Automatic. This tracks the previous IP addresses and attempts to reallocate the same IP address if possible. And static is where you manually allocate IP addresses based upon the device MAC address. DHCP scopes. Scopes are a range of IP addresses within normally within a certain subnet. DHCP scope, uh, I've already said scope, sorry. A group of IP addresses you can allocate to hosts. Each subnet has its own scope. You can have multiple scopes. Certain static addresses will be excluded, and I've already mentioned the static addresses for your uh, router interfaces, your firewalls, uh, web servers, email servers, that kind of thing. Scopes can include IP address range and subnet mask, lease duration, default gateway, DNS and Win servers, DHCP lease. So you can, if you choose, is the administrator allocate the address to a device based upon a temporary basis. It could be minutes, hours, days, as long as you wish really. It's usually reclaimed by the server when the client leaves the network and signs off. The lease defines how long the host can use the IP address. It will normally request the ad another address upon reboot. Timers are associated with the lease of the addresses, so it starts when it uh, is allocated the address. You do have a timers associated with DHCP so you don't suddenly lose an address. There's a T1 renewal timer, so when 50% of your lease time, uh, lease time has expired, the client will try and renew its lease. T2 rebinding timer, the default is 87.5% of the lease time. The client will try again, um, and if it can't get a reply from the DHCP server, it will try and contact another DHCP server. DHCP options, 254 usable options values. So we're sort of drifting more towards the server configuration rather than knowledge of networking from Cisco point of view. You'd go into more detail if you did a Linux course or a Microsoft. Subnet mask obviously is something that we need to allocate, DNS server address, the domain name, options, 129 and 135. These are specific for your network. Just have a look at the DHCP packet. You can see here discover, offer, ACK and request caught by a Wireshark capture. You can see the discover packet here. 
have a look for the uh, source and destination address and you can see it's a broadcast address here DHCP offer DHCP request and then finally the DHCP ACK worth uh, pausing the video and or looking at the slides if you have access to those to uh, look at it in more detail. But I hope that's given you a good grounding for DHCP, it's certainly something you're going to be dealing with on a regular basis as a network engineer, so it's well worth learning. Thanks for listening. Got our usual topology, he says. Let's get the address right here 192.168.1.0. Dot one this side and dot two that side. I can add that actually. Dot one and uh, over this side. I'm sure you know anyway. Dot two. So this is static NAT, this particular lab. What I'm going to do is swap this internal address here as if it's a host on a network, although I'm using a loopback address. I'm going to swap it for a routable address, then it's going to hit router 2. The only thing we need to bear in mind here on router 2 is it won't know how to get to this routable address. It doesn't exist anywhere really. So what we'll do is we need to add a static route on router 2 to send all traffic back out of the fast ethernet interface. That's the only thing we need to worry about on router 2. On router 1 we need to tell the router uh, which is the inside and which is the outside NAT interfaces. If you do use GNS3, you need to make sure there's enough memory on the router. Uh, it's covered in another video, but you need to configure the device and add more virtual memory, which is covered in, um, if you check on Google, for GNS3 uh, and adding more memory to routers, or the virtual routers. So, router 2, I've actually added the command already. You've already done it earlier as well. IP route 0000. zero, zero, zero. 0000 and it's going out to F0. So that's all you need to worry about on router uh, 2. Obviously you've got to add the IP addresses. Make sure you can ping um, the loopback on router 1, which I can here. And then on, on router 1 we need to designate the NAT inside and outside interfaces. So interface loopback 0 IP NAT. This is going to be inside interface fast ethernet 0 slash 0 will be your IP NAT outside. So you must have that command there and you must have a static route and router 2. So the next thing is we need to do our NAT configuration. We're going to do a static NAT so translating one address for another address. So the configuration and you can do the question mark as you go along IP NAT and then hit the question mark you've got a few choices here and um, for doing static NAT is IP NAT inside taking an inside address if you hit question mark source hit the question mark and we're going to do a static mapping here so IP NAT inside source static uh, yeah. the question mark works in the exam not as well as, as live iOS, but it should give you a few different outputs. All right, so what's the inside address? This is the bit we're looking for. So IP NAT inside source static. Well, let's do the 10.1.1.1, and we need to swap it for a, a global address. So I'm going to choose a routable address. Never use this on a live network, because this address belongs to somebody. Uh, I'll choose one. In fact, I'll choose 20. IP NAT inside source static. That's all we need to worry about. There's some of the commands there, but we don't need to worry about those. So that's the command there. We're going to swap our 10 address for a 20 address. Now the next thing we need to do is somehow test it. So um, I'll just do a debug actually. Debug 
Oh no, it, in fact you won't see a debug because it's static, but what, I'll show you something else. So, so ping uh, IP, the target IP address will be 192.168.1.2. So we're pinging our fast ethernet on router 2. We get to the extended commands, we want to hit a Y. Source address, loop back zero. You could put the IP address in if you wish. Just keep pressing enter, that's worked. And it's given us our NAT of um, 10.1.1.1, translating it to 20.1.1.1, that's the source. D for destination 192.168.1.2. Show IP NAT tram relations. Now, because um, it's static, this should, should actually be here all the time. So you can see our um, inside global, inside local, and the outside local and global is the same address. So that's our static NAT. Same topology as before, the only thing we're going to do is add a secondary IP address to this loopback zero. The reason is we're uh, doing a pool of NAT addresses and we want to check allocation of more than one address from this pool. So if we go, we've got the static router on router 2 and we've still got the NAT inside and outside commands. So if we do a show run a pipe to a straight line which you may need to hit the shift key to get that ink nat which means include nat i've already got the ip nat inside and outside addresses allocated to the loopback for the inside and fast ethernet for the outside the other thing i added is if i do a show run interface loopback zero i've added another command which you can see here IP address, you just go into interface loopback 0 and then you type IP address 10.1.1.2, same subnet mask and then space secondary and you can add as many secondary addresses as you wish. So this is just for testing but sometimes you can, um, if you want to, you can add an address from a different network. You don't do that sort of thing very often but sometimes you can do it for testing or to do some troubleshooting. All right, so make sure you can ping across the link, 1.2. All right, so the ping's working, and we need to go into our NAT configuration. So this is for a NAT pool. So comp t, IP NAT, and if you hit the question mark, you can see all your different choices. The one we're looking for is pool. Then we need to give it a name. I'm going to call it just Paul for my first name. IP NAT pool, Paul. And then if you hit a question mark, it's saying, what's your start IP address? So I'm going to say 20.1.1.1. And then, as you probably guessed, they want to know the end IP address next. So 20.1.1.10. I'm going to use a pool of 10 addresses. Then, if you're using Packet Tracer, you only get one option here. But I'm using Cisco IOS. So I get to do a prefix length, which is how many, sub, how many bits in the subnet mask or net mask. I'm just going to do net mask and then 255.255.255.0. So we've configured a pool of IP addresses to be used as our NAT pool. That's not many for a live network, but we're just doing a, a test of a home lab. The next thing we'll need to do is add a access list. So access, access list, it's going to be a standard access list. Access list one. Permit, and then we're going to permit the entire 10 uh, network. And we need to have the wildcard mask that will match. So all traffic on the 10 network that's attached to our loopback will be matched. And then the last thing we need to do is tie up the access list with the NAT pool. So they both work together. Is IP NAT inside 
and then if I hit the question mark, we've got a couple of different choices. Source, and then the next thing we need to do is the list. You see there's different ways to do this. Source, list, one. And then you can see we've got the option of pool. And then we just have the pool name, pool. So I pin that inside, the inside traffic, reference the uh, access list one to match it and then use the pool port enter so this is a uh, for our nat pool exit debug ip nat now the next bit you have to do fairly quickly because then um, entries in the nat pool expire if i do a show ip nat tran there's nothing in there i've got the debug on so we're going to do an extended ping we're going to target across our link to the other router extended command yes sources 10.1.1.1 so we use the first loopback address hit enter a few times and you can see that is working I'm going to do it again quickly 1.2 yes extended commands sources 10.1.1.2 enter you can see NAT is happening again. I have a um, shorter memory on this router here. Uh, oh, I didn't um, translate for some reason. Show, it, show IP NAT translation. So I don't know why that second ping didn't work actually. But the main thing is I wanted to show you the NAT taking place. So the 10 address here has been translated from the first um, host in the pool and then the second uh, host address is being used for the second host on the um, on the inside so you can see two NAT translations have taken place I'll troubleshoot why that ping didn't uh, work later but the main thing is I wanted to show you why and um, show you that the NAT pool uh, works and you can see why we have to do it quick is because it basically expires the translations you can go in and change the NAT timings which is a bit more of an advanced thing, so I don't really want to go into it at the moment. But um, as you can see, the NAT, this first ping worked. Why the second ping worked? Not sure. Source 1.1.2. Destination 1.2.168.1.2. Yeah, I'll look at that another time, but I don't want to distract of uh, the reasons why we did the lab. So that's um, how to configure a NAT pull. frame relay. Just a little dip of the toes into this layer 2 MAN protocol. It wasn't, it, yeah, it used to be in the CCNA in a fair amount of detail and then seemed to drop out and now it's come back in again annoyingly because it is actually not used that often to be honest. It's com been completely dropped from the Cisco CCIE exam but is hanging around in the CCNA and CCMP. So let's have a look at it. Expect some theory on it at least. You could possibly have some labs on it also in the actual CCNA exam or look, look at it, maybe some outputs or configurations. So it's a non-broadcast multi-access technology. So no broadcast and multiple devices can access over the link. The layer two address is referred to as a DALC, a data link connection identifier. This number is purely there to identify your device your interface to the frame relay service provider that's all it does so the number can actually change as your as your connection crosses through different service providers and switches the lmi local management interface it permits your router to communicate with the frame relay switch think of it as a keep alive it sends a keep alive frame every 10 seconds so you get six every minute every six one is a full status report reporting on the state of the link itself the keep alive will report back is the link active is it inactive or is it deleted 
There's actually a protocol type for LMI. There are three available are Cisco, ANSI and Q933A. A Cisco router will attempt to communicate on all three until it finds uh, gets a reply and it will do it in the that order, Cisco, ANSI and Q933A. You can hard configure it if you so wish. I've never bothered personally. Here's a output of a debug frame relay LMI and I just wanted to show you the status there in red. I've highlighted it. 0x2 is what you're looking for. It means the status is active. You can uh, look at the Cisco documentation for debug frame relay LMI if you want or troubleshooting frame relay. Frame relay permanent virtual circuit. This gives your, uh, you, you your connection between two end devices. So you can't actually see what's going on between the frame relay service provider cloud in the middle, but what you can see is whether or not your circuit is up between the two endpoints. Different ways of setting up frame relay depending on your budget and network requirements. A multipoint interface is where more than one frame relay connection terminates. So you could have a headquarters in the middle and then different field offices. Um, as your hubs. There has to be a way to resolve your layer 3 address, your IP address to your layer 2 address which is your Del C. It can be done dynamically using inverse ARP. Statically using the frame relay map command is the other way to do it. And it can get confusing because it works in different ways depending on how you've got it set up and then you also have to deal with the tricky configuration commands for EIGRP and OSPF which all have um, act differently on frame relay networks. There is a congestion finding uh, mechanism built into frame relay. It will report any congestion to or from the destination. The two types are FECNs, FECNs and BECNs, BECNs and you can see in the diagram which way they travel and how they report. Alright, so that was just a taste. Uh, frame Relay is quite a meaty subject actually and it does take up a chapter or two in most CCMP and CCIE guides, but I just wanted us to have a, an appreciation of it for now. Wide Area Networks and VPNs, Virtual Private Networks. Wide Area Networks, I'm sure you're familiar with this already, they span across large geo geographical distances and because of the distances mainly we can't use the same technology that we use for our local area networks. They can't um, carry multiple signals and they don't have the technology we need to span the distances. So generally we have to get the support of an internet service provider or a telecoms company who will support whatever services we need such as streaming voice and video. One equipment we can actually buy and just plug into a, an interface that's provided by the service provider or they can provide, provide us with all of the wide area network and equipment. We can lease it and get the support for it and just plug our network switch directly into that. You normally pay ongoing fees, monthly fee, as well as for bandwidth used. Now it obviously depends, we've got a whole bunch of services available. It depends on our traffic, our budget, and a lot of the time it can actually defend, depend on geographically where we are because some services uh, are available in some countries and some aren't in remote areas. Connection type is a uh, circuit switch, for example. This is turned on and off as and when you need it and you will just pay for it as and when you use it. Lease line is fully dedicated. It will cost more but it's, uh, it's always available to you. There's a packet switch network is where you share the bandwidth with other users and an example of this is Frame Relay where you can just buy increments of 64k. Cell switching uh, uses a fixed packet si uh, size uh, normally uh, it'd be something like ATM, which isn't uh, isn't as prevalent anymore. You have broadband, which can use DSL. I'm sure you've heard of cable networking. Example of circuit switching and packet switching. Circuit switching, it uses the same path all of the time. 
packet switching, you don't actually know which path it's going to take as long as it gets there as your main priority. All right, we've mentioned uh, NBMA when I talked about frame relay. Special technology used in one connections. It doesn't support broadcast traffic. Uh, so you do have issues with some routing protocols and ARP. Frame Relay, ISDN and ATM use non-broadcast multi-access. So Inverse ARP allows Frame Relay to map an IP address to a MAC address. It's, it works like ARP but in the reverse way, Inverse ARP. Interface types I already mentioned earlier in Frame Relay. You've got multi-point and a point-to-point. Multi-point has multiple devices or endpoints connected into it, one interface, a point-to-point -point is simply one to one connection. Still requires a layer 3 to layer 2 resolution method. You can use the inverse ARP or the static commands which I, I mentioned earlier. If it's a point-to-point -point connection you've got no issues with layer 3 to layer 2 addressing. Here's a image from Cisco website of a T1 card which is used for our WAN connections. Older technology, T1 stands for T Carrier Level 1. Generally was used in North America, Japan, South Korea. You had two 64K channels uh, and some signaling going on in there but the cumulative amount of bandwidth available was 1.544 meg. The European standard of T1 is called E1. You've got 3264K channels plus some other signalling going on. Gives you just over 2 meg. Upgrade to this was T3 and E3. Same deal really, but with higher bandwidth. More circuits. Metro Ethernet and Long Reach Ethernet is a rapidly emerging solution based on Ethernet standards. Infrastructure is actually transparent to the end user. All, all services are connected to the Metro Ethernet that uses gigabit connection speeds. Something you might want to look into uh, in your own time, some more information on uh, Metro Ethernet. All right, satellites, wireless connectivity, Used in remote locations, used a lot on cruise ships, oil, oil digging, oil and digging platforms, oil wells and stuff like that, where it's just not feasible to run a cable. Uh, it could be a temporary office somewhere. Uses a dish, a satellite dish to reach a satellite. Averages five meg download, one meg upload. You do or you can experience severe latency, and you are affected by the weather if it's cloudy or rainy. You do need line of sight to the satellite as well. So not ideal and it can be quite expensive. ISDN, it's kind of legacy technology now really. It allows communication over a traditional telephone line. You've got ISDN BRI, basic rate interface, which gives you 264B channels, which are bearer channels, and the D channels data. And you've got PRI, which is 2364B channels and 164D. DSL, I'm sure you've heard of, is pretty popular. It's an alternative to ISDN, works a lot faster, it's a lot cheaper. Uh, down, download speeds of around 24 meg, obviously depends where you live, and up to 3.5. Upload speeds, high connection speeds for DSL. Uh, you've got different types of DSL available. VDSL, HDSL, symmetric DSL, which means same up and download speeds. Cable gives you internet access over your home cable system, which is really handy because you don't have to install any new equipment or lines. Gives you 100 meg, which is really fast. VPNs I've uh, mentioned and alluded to in various presentations. It gives you a secure connection between two unsecure locations. Generally, you'll be, you'll be going over the internet with this connection. Site-to-site -site VPN is one type of VPN, a remote access is another and an extra net. It's a common exam question that is, the types of VPN available. Traffic is tuddled over whatever the infrastructure is. In order to get the IP security, IPsec is used. IPsec is used in conjunction with AAA. 
quite a few benefits including cost, flexibility, scalability, you can have hundreds of users using VPN access. You've got site to site, remote access VPN and extranet which is what I mentioned before and there's just a, a bit more of a description here. Alright, thanks for listening, I hope you've enjoyed that. Got a simple topology router 1 to router 2, 192, 1.2 uh, on the right, and we're going to be doing a PPP lab. So, important things to note here for this lab are the host name in each router, uh, router uh, R1 and R2. And then, if I issue, if I, I'm going to ping 1.2. So our serial link's working. If we do a show interface serial zero slash zero, by default it's a HDLC. So high level data link control, Cisco standard serial encapsulation. So that will work fine. What we want to do is change to PPP and add uh, some authentication. So the first thing to do is add a username. I'm going to add the username of the opposite device. Username R2, password Cisco, and on uh, router 2, same thing that reversed. Username R1, password Cisco. Next thing I want to do is set the uh, PPP. Encap, short for encapsulation, PPP. All right, a few different options here. PPP authentication is what we're going to be using. So, authentication, two choices. Oh, normally got two, chap and pap. I don't want to cover anything else actually. I'm not worried about Microsoft here. PPP authentication chap which uh, sends a hashed value of the password PPP authentication chap show interface serial zero slash zero all right you can see it's up physically up line protocol is down so it's a layer two problem and you can see encapsulation is PPP it's not going to be up until the other side agrees Exit and debug p. Oops. Debug ppp packet. Debug ppp authentication. You're going to get a lot of information there, but I just wanted to have the debug on for you to see. If you ever want to turn debugs off, it's un all for undebug all. Com t uh, interface zero zero slash zero. Encap pp. See, there's a lot of things stuff happening there. PPP authentication chap, and you can see it's going to try and authenticate now. I've turned all debugging off because you get a lot, but basically, you see, in there's a a response and a challenge, and it's passed, and it's from. Yeah, login request response sent is r1 this is my username so the interface should have come up show interface serial zero slash zero i can see it's up up which is good the physically up line protocol is up and the encapsulation is ppp so a real simple lab i just wanted to show you some ppp encapsulation and also the authentication using chap
Router and switch troubleshooting. Obviously I can't go over every single scenario, but I just wanted to cover a few different facets of troubleshooting. Switching loops, I've covered earlier the cause of them, and really it's a no-brainer to use spanning tree on your switch network. If you don't use it, you're almost guaranteed to get a switching loop if you've got any redundant ways of connecting over your switched and um, switched into network. So as you know, layer two frames have no time to live built in. So broadcasts are forwarded as far as the router so they could go around the switch network infinitely in theory until eventually your whole network's flooded with broadcasts. Never never plug a U switch into your network. Reason is if it's got a configuration on there, there's a pretty good chance it will wipe off every other configuration on all of your other switches. I mean, certain things have to happen to precede that, which I don't have time to go into here, but you basically need to wipe your entire configuration off uh, the switch and depending on the model you have, make sure it's uh, configured as a client and not a server. Cable issues, pretty easy to fix and this is your bread and butter as a network engineer. If there's no connection on the actual interface, you can't see traffic passing, the quickest and cheapest way to do the troubleshooting, apart from to shut and no shut the interface is to swap up, swap, out, swap out the cable with a cable you know is working well. A flap is known as uh, an interface going up and down rapidly. This can normally or often happen before a cable actually completely fails. Check the link light as well. You need to look at the documentation for your switch to see to read the errors. Uh, check the pins if it's a well, it can happen on Ethernet as well, I suppose, but especially on serial cables, sometimes people can force it in or it can be um, a cheap cable and it can bend the pins and then your network won't work. Make sure you use vendor approved cables. I use cheap ones for my home network uh, for, for price, for just for saving money. But on a corporate network, you should always use the vendor manufactured cables. Here's a DB60 interface, a serial interface and sometimes the pins on these I've seen get bent out of place just because cables have been plugged in and out too many times so and that could be a cause of your issue also here's your link lights on your switch I'm not sure what model of switch this is actually but it says Cisco switch and the link lights will give an indication of what's going wrong you show interface fast ethernet 0 slash 0 have a look, uh, check the Cisco documentation also, and it will tell you what the different errors mean. If you're receiving input errors, collisions, interface resets, resets it's an indication that something could be going on wrong with your interface or with your cable connected to your interface. The show controllers is a really handy command and it tells you if there's a serial cable attached. Because you can physically have a cable attached, but if there's a bent pin or a problem, for some reason with the cable and you see that it says no serial cable attached then you know you've got a problem with the cable or with the actual interface. Another command you can look at is the show interface and then whatever the interface number is which I showed you on the last slide. At the very bottom you can see the most important one is DCD which is your carrier detect. Can, can the interface detect a signal on it? Port configuration issues, uh, you can manifest by a poor throughput or a lack of connectivity. You've swapped the cable out and you've still got the problem. You just need to check both sides have got the same speed, duplex settings, encapsulation settings, and they're on the same VLAN. Auto configuration can cause issues, especially if you've got different vendors' equipment. So, for example, a HP switch connecting to a Cisco switch. And sometimes ports just go bad. They look fine and sometimes they test okay, but they're just not working correctly. So you use a different port instead and it all works fine. VLAN assignment. Show VLAN brief will show you which ports are connected to which VLANs. So uh, remember that all ports default to VLAN 1. Link lights won't tell you because the port could be tra passing traffic, but it's still not actually in the correct VLAN. So check the network documentation, maybe somebody's plugged the wrong cable in or just assigned the wrong port to the wrong VLAN, it can happen. MTU, I haven't come across this very often myself, a problem with the maximum transmission unit. But this is the maximum size an IP packet can be, 
without being fragmented. This will change depending on the uh, technology type, for example, a frame relay or an Ethernet connection or ATM or whatever, and also the technology being used. If a device cannot pass the entire frame, it will fragment it. Fragmenting takes up time and network resources. If even a part of a large packet, if, if one fragment gets lost, then the entire packet it has to be retransmitted. Packets can have a do not fragment bit set, DF bit. If this DF bit is actually set inside the packet, then it will be dropped if it's too big to be sent, so you still have a problem. Uh, an Ethernet frame component, which is something that can be um, part of the issue, starts with the data field, so that's maximum 1500 bytes. Then you've got TCP and IP headers, layer 2 headers and trailers. This can cause an issue if a device can't process a frame that's this size. So I've issued a, uh, part of the troubleshooting process is issuing what's known as an extended ping. You type ping, press enter, and then you go through different options. You go through to extended commands, and you can see it says set to, set to DF bit in IP header, which I mentioned earlier, do not fragment, and I've clicked on Y. I can also uh, type in manually the maximum size of the packet to be sent and the minimum size. This is a good way of doing testing if ping traffic is permitted through your network. Tunneling also adds additional uh, IP header making the packet larger than 1500 bytes. Here's a ping test on a Windows command line interface. I've added the switches uh, minus F minus L and then the size of the packet to be sent. Routing issues. Enterprise router requires careful planning and testing which is why all testing is normally done in a lab environment before it's switched to the live environment. It can often be a configuration issue especially if there's a large amount of configuration present. Start by using the trace route command. Test both directions. This is a mistake a lot of people make. They test routing in one direction which may well work, but if routing is coming back the other direction, it may not work. You may be taking a different path for any number of reasons. Check all your routing tables. Also check from layer one up, if appropriate. It obviously depends on what the problem is. Subnet mask and gateway issues are part of your daily bread and butter as a network engineer, and you can regularly have a, a server team, for example, configure an IP address and get the subnet mask wrong or get the wrong gateway and all of a sudden it's escalated to you because they're saying there's an issue on the network when really it's subnet mask. Okay, so harder to solve if you can only reach certain host addresses. Quite easy to check. You can do a print route on servers and show IP route and show IP interface and show interface on routers. Check the configuration of the DHCP Check the address hasn't been used or allocated elsewhere in the network also. Sometimes I've even seen people manually add an IP address to their device thinking it's free when, when it's already been allocated by DHCP. Show IP interface and show interface. I've mentioned that and here's this output which you've seen a few times already. DNS issues. Can you ping the IP address but not the host name? That's a dead giveaway. If the host name isn't working but you can ping the IP address, then it's telling you there's some sort of issue with the name lookup. Are you connecting to the correct IP address for the DNS server? You need to check with the network admin. Check with the NS look lookup command on your Windows command line if you're using Windows. You can also temporarily use a public DNS server if you wish. Alright, so I hope that's given you a few things to go on. It's a few of those I've come across on a regular basis when I've been troubleshooting networks for customers.